Hello, everyone. It's just a very warm welcome uh, to all of you for coming to the NHSR conference. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I help out with the conference. Um, so I want to kick the time. That's really why I've kicked off on time as well. Um, just to say, this is the first time we're holding a hybrid conference. Um, so please be gentle with us. Uh, we're trying our best. Um, I'll just move on to my slides, please. Thank you. Um, couple of announcements. So we're not expecting any fire alarms. So if the fire alarm does go, the sports venue has its own um, system. You'll hear uh, instructions on the, um, on the speakers that are on the walls. So just, and the fire exits are shown uh, on either side of the main doors, and you go down the stairs and follow the fire exit signs. Um, but you, so we're not expecting any, uh, any fire alarms. Just a reminder, if you've got your phone, obviously put it on silent or whatever kind of works for you. Um, okay. So uh, I'd like to begin by um, kind of acknowledging our sponsors, really. Um, the, the NHSL community has had support right from day one from the Health Foundation, uh, and then lots of other uh, stakeholders have supported us in many different ways, really. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge them. So uh, that's just a quick look at the, the various sponsors that we've had. So I love, I love the NHS and I love our, um, and so a lot of you do as well. So there's kind of, it's a, it's a nice kind of uh, thing to get engaged with, um, but I thought it would just be interesting to contrast. So the NHS was born here in 1948, and I was born down under. They couldn't be further apart, really. Um, the NHS was a top-down initiative to some extent, or to a large extent, and ours a bottom-up initiative. One had the force of government, and the other had the force of the network and, and people just engaged and interested. Um, and so how are two characters worlds apart ever going to, going to meet really? Uh, there's only one way, it has to be a kind of forced arranged marriage really. Um, and, and I'm of that culture where I can kind of get away with forced arranged marriages. Uh, so, so, so uh, and with the funding support from the Health Foundation, we were actually able to, to start to create the NHSR community. Um, we have an academy, so just a, it's a virtual academy. The things that we do in the academy, uh, lots of training and development. We also have academy titles, in case some people are not sure about that, where you can apply for a, to be a fellow, a senior fellow, a friend, a champion, uh, and we develop solutions. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the conference. So in 2018, we had our first conference. Everything that an organizer could do wrong, I did wrong. Um, and what was, but still what was really amazing was the contribution of the people that came. It was a very small conference. We had about 100 or so people. Uh, we had a one-day program. It was quite packed. Uh, the internet went down. Imagine in a tech conference, uh, we're doing training workshops. Um, but we also had some pictures from there. And, and there's a couple of things I want to take from that, which I'll, I'll come back to. Um, so we had very humble beginnings, but it was very clear that we've touched a nerve. We've kind of found a spot which resonates with people in terms of uh, the NHSR community and the kind of general uh, open source data science movement. Here are the quotes for, for some of the blogs that were written after the, after the conference. I'll just let you eyeball whichever one your eye take, takes you to. Um, and I think those comments that you see on the, uh, on the slide actually have resonated with us right from day one. Um, and perhaps the thing that's being underscored more and more now it's the community bit which is unique. And actually, it's colleagues like you, people who've joined from online, uh, the entire universe of the NHSR community is what is, the, what is the, the real kind of jewel in the crown, really. One way to track the progress of the community is through the conferences. So you can see each year the conference has got bigger and, and better. And in some ways, um, it's hard to kind of give an answer now. You know, you get that question, uh, how many people came to your conference? They just want one version of the truth. But actually, it's very difficult to give a single number for that, especially when your conference is now spread out through a, through a month. Uh, we've got, we had about 18 workshops. Uh, five webinars, 26 online speakers, um, and now we've got the, the two days here and tomorrow's a Python track. 
So, so it's not easy to give a straightforward answer to that question of how many people come, uh, but the scale of it is just getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and I would like to just acknowledge, uh, we have two very special guests today at the conference, sitting at the back, colleagues from, they, they say posit, but I'm gonna say our studio, is that all right? Uh, our studio colleagues, Ryan and Lauren, who've been helping us, Lauren especially, right from day one, have flown all the way from the US to be at Edgebasting Cricket Ground and not watch a cricket match. Can you believe that? Um, but anyways, welcome so much. And by the way, do say hello to them. Um, so we do attract international attention, international interest, speakers from all over the world contribute. And that's one of the great pleasures of being involved with the community. I want to talk a little bit about this, this ripple effect uh, so the, there are things that we planned, most of them kind of didn't go according to plan, but there are so many things we didn't plan but happened spontaneously through the initiative and energy of, of people in the community. So I'll just give you a sense of what some of those things look like. Um, so we've now got a distributed model of leadership. Uh, communities are very flat, in fact it's a servant model of leadership, which I think is actually a very appealing model of leadership. Um, uh, we have podcasts, which uh, colleagues, uh, Chris Beale particularly, has been uh, instrumental with. We have a Slack group, uh, which was set up, uh, and it's got over 1,500 people on it chatting about uh, our related things. We have a book club, mentoring. People donate packages to the community. Um, there's a help desk, and we also had a small hand in helping the Our Girls project. My point about it is that none of that was planned. All of that happened spontaneously through the initiative of people in the community. And that is one of the great excitements and pleasures of being involved in the community. You kind of have no, what's going to come next is, is, is kind of often driven by the passion and enthusiasm of some people who've got an idea that they want to, want to take further. Uh, and you'll see in the grey uh, at the lower end of this slide, it cost peanuts. That was my way to remind myself to say that. Um, and we didn't ask permission. There was no need to ask anybody's permission to do any of this, it just happened. So, so for those of you that uh, like the world of business cases, the NHSR community doesn't work with business cases. Here's this, just a quick shot of the help desk. Uh, I, I, I don't post, I, I do post on it occasionally. I, I try and track how long it takes for the question and the answer. And it's usually just minutes. It is absolutely astonishing that you can post a technical question, and this is one where the end, the end line says um, Google zero, NHSR Slack one. So, so they've obviously tried to look online and not found it, and, and colleagues helping each other in this spontaneous way is absolutely just, just phenomenal. And, and it's cost, cost zero in terms of infrastructure funding and support from the centre. Uh, but the initiative actually obviously benefits from the, uh, the time and expertise of, of the community. Uh, and one of my favourite stories, the NHSL plot the dots package, spontaneously decided by colleagues in the, in the community to develop this during lockdown mostly, and I could see people working in their own locations, writing code, developing ideas, pushing it to GitHub, and kind of working together in that way. Uh, and I can't do any of that myself, but I can appear with delight when I see it. And today we have a very popular NHSR plot, the dots package, which has been used. It's downloaded over 1,500 times, I think maybe more now. Um, and some of the people who help with that are, are in the room, but none of them asked permission. None of them wrote a business case. They just got together different organizations, but the enthusiasm and the unity uh, for a common purpose was just, just astonishing, really. One of the exercises that we did um, was a pre-mortem. So if the NHSR community was to die, uh, what would be the kind of causes of, of death really? So, so you, can, you can see on the list there, if we're not too, we, we, we could be too reliant on volunteers, uh, we've lost our core values, we became preoccupied with the centre and we've lost uh, touch with our, our frontline grassroots analysts, um, we lost out to Python, um, we're not attractive enough to analysts, there isn't enough pull, we don't have the funds, um, and the central team, which, is, which has a little bit of core funding, kind of disappears. So, so it's quite a useful thing to do a pre-mortem, uh, uh, and um, here's some of the things that came up. So in actual fact, we've always said from day one, the NHSR community has two invisible pluses, 
One on the NHS to make it clear that we're not isolated, but we are broadly public sector, so social care, public health, government has always been part of our vision, but we didn't have a snappy um, way to summarize that in the title. And R has always had a plus on it for lots of other open source tools and solutions that exist. And in fact, we see Python as being a key part of our, our kind of broader common purpose, really. In fact, tomorrow there is a Python track, uh, and lots of you may have the opportunity to actually join that. Here is some of the feedback we've had from stakeholders uh, about what the community means to them. So for analysts, it's safe, trusted, it's supportive. It's a kind of badge of honor, which is, which is remarkable, actually. Um, for leaders, it's a place they can sign post for a, for a trusted brand with, 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 with people who would support uh, and kind of help out, not a, not a place which has kind of uh, contracts and commercial relationships and performance management and all that kind of stuff. And for the wider system, I think we've contributed a little bit to the thinking around what the NHS should do for the 21st century in terms of data science. One of the reasons I think that the NHSR community has succeeded is on the left hand, uh, on, on, on my right, you'll see um, what are called the old power values, which are based on hierarchical structures, um, competition, exclusivity, uh, pr uh, confidentiality, separation of roles, um, and a focus on kind of, um, kind of not being open, really. Uh, those are the, the, the old models. Uh, and on the, on the right hand side, uh, the kind of new model that people have talked about in terms of power. So informal networking, open collaboration, crowd wisdom, radical transparency, and do it ourselves. And, and those are the things that, that the NHSF community has been doing. Um, and not, not necessarily we've got everything right, but those are the underlying values that, that underpin the community. And so when you do a, a two by two grid, and you look at the kind of neighbors that the NHSF community occupy, it actually kind of feels like it's a kind of pretty cool place, really. Um, it's, it's, not, it's definitely not in the old power model at all. And one of the reasons people have struggled with it uh, in terms of uh, existing structures and, and processes is, uh, is because it sits in a very different uh, dynamic in a different set of values and a different uh, uh, um, space, really, to the, to the traditional models. So I want just to say a little bit about the ripple effect. Um, so this is a picture from the first conference. Um, I'll start with the mug. So I, I used to have lots, lots of mugs uh, and I used to give them away. Um, and there used to be a price for the mug. The price was you have to write a blog. I think I gave away lots of mugs and lots of people have still yet to write a blog. Um, but somebody did write a blog. They wrote a blog on, on their experience with SBC. Um, uh, statistical process control, and they wrote that blog up, and that became the seed, or at least one of the threads that fed into the NHSR plot, the dots package. And that package is now widely used. Just another ripple effect, you'll see in the, one, in the middle panel, uh, you, you'll see Chris Beale, he'll come later. Uh, um, so Chris and I met there for the very first time. Uh, Chris is now a tour de force in the NHSR community. Um, he's he's a, a chair of the tech, technical advisory group. Uh, he's led so, so many initiatives. In fact, the mentoring and the podcast are all down to him. And so many people are able to benefit now from Chris's experience uh, in a way that was just not foreseeable uh, beforehand. And then one other individual in that is someone who I know very well. He's a trainee, a, a voluntary data scientist, learning the trade, learning a little bit about R in 2018. And just recently, he got promoted for writing Shiny apps in, in, in his team because he attended Chris Beely's workshop on Shiny. And these, these stories for me are the ones that are kind of most inspiring, really, how the NHSR community touches the lives of people and how it touches, their, um, how it touches them personally and what the difference it makes to them. And everything else to me kind of flows from that really. So I really genuinely hope that you find your experience with NHSR community, one in which you're touched by someone or someone else is touched by what you contribute and that it makes a difference in the, in the kind of way I've outlined. So a big, big thank you, not just to speakers, organizers, and kind of everybody in the community. And what are we thanking you for? Primarily we're thanking you for the gift that you give of your time and your attention. 
And for that, that is just priceless. There is no way to put a pound sign or a dollar sign on what people do with their, with their presence of time uh, and their uh, uh, attention. So on that note, I'll thank you all. I hope you have a, a great conference. Uh, and I will, we won't have too many time for questions, but you can contact speakers as, as we mingle. And in the, so I will now hand over to our next speaker, if I may, please. Can, uh, Charles Talek uh, is from the Health Foundation. He will introduce himself, but please give him a round of applause. Here he comes, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's really um, great to be with you all and very inspired by what Mohammed is, has been telling us. Um, I think and lots of those things that he's mentioned, I think, are going to come out in what I've got to say. So I just want to kind of, I've got a kind of personal perspective on this, I guess. Um, so I've been an analyst for all of my career. So I started off as a programmer, I programmed in Fortran and did mathematical modeling, and then um, joined the civil service, worked in the Department of Health in the 90s, worked across different bits of government all the time working at in analysis or at the interface of analysis and policy. And I think one of the things that reflecting on my time in the civil service was that we actually didn't have very much data. Lots of the time, because people just couldn't store the kind of vast amounts of data we have nowadays, there weren't the, t the kind of tools to analyze it. So lots of our the analysis we did was, you know, I guess starting from modeling and theoretical conceptions of how things could work. But lots of the time we weren't able to test those things empirically with data. And that's been an enormous change. Um, I joined the NHS, joined the NHS England in 2013. And that was very, very interesting insight into um, NHS culture and the way that analysis, analysis was used there. And what I saw was lots of dashboards, lots of um, kind of traffic lighted indicators, red, um, amber, green, and then a massive use of Excel. And people who were not necessarily, I don't think analysts there were, give, had the, were valued in the same way as I would have expected them to be. And certainly in the civil service, I think analysts were very, very valued very much as, as partners. Um, but now I kind of fast forward to 2022 and I see this conference and I see the way that um, there is just so much energy, creativity, use of tools like R and it's kind of like, it seems like a massive transformation in in actually quite a short amount of time. So I'm, that's my kind of personal perspective. And, you know, I find this a very exciting kind of stage in, in the development of NHS analysis. So I just want to say a bit about the Health Foundation and why we are interested and keen to support this initiative. So you probably have all heard of the Health Foundation. We are one of, you probably think of us as one of the three health think tanks. That's true. Um, I don't think we always like to be thought of as a think tank. I think that's got connotations, but that is probably a convenient way of thinking of us. Um, but we are a bit different, I would say, from the King's Fund and Nuffield Trust. And maybe that's the thing that we see, because if you're working inside, you see the differences. But one difference is that we are, um, we've got a huge endowment. In fact, we're the second largest endowed foundation in the UK. Um, operating in the health field. Um, and therefore, as a result of that, we fund a lot of research, analysis and improvement work in, in the NHS. The Health Foundation starts off as really funding improvement in the NHS. So, and we, we still do a lot of that. So for example, um, we fund over the last few years, we've been funding the Flow Coaching Academy at Sheffield um, University Hospital Trust, which is all about um, coaching people, giving them the technical skills and relationship skills to help get sustainable improvement. We also fund lots of academic research um, and analysis. Um, the other thing I would say about the Health Foundation compared to the other think tanks is that we have by far the largest investment in analysis. So we have, in my team, we have about two dozen analysts working across um, what we do in the Health Foundation, so helping improve healthcare, helping um, improve health and reducing inequalities, and also policy analysis. Um, so we've got a lot of t people within the Health Foundation doing analysis, um, but we also fund development and su support analysis 
in the NHS. And this is really where this initiative came from. Um, so to, in, since 2018, we've funded over 50 projects in the NHS. So we had a program called um, Advancing Applied Analytics, and we funded 43 different projects, different areas there. Um, and the R community came out of one of those, I believe. We've also funded, we've also had a program called Social, Strengthening Social Care Analytics. Um, five of those, those projects, um, including one with the Royal Mencap Society, which was analysis of their, the people who use their services, um, an, an analytics engine to look at that. Um, we've also funded work around AI and racial inequalities with um, University Hospital Birmingham, and also funded AFA, the Association of Pro Professional Healthcare Analysts, Welsh Modelling Collaborative, and the Royal Statistical Society. So we've, we've operating across a very broad area. Really, all that work is trying to, you know, recognising that the best way of improving an the analytical capability of the NHS is really by, you know, helping fund that capability building. Um, so why did we see that it was worth funding R? Like, why would the Health Foundation fund basically what a lot of people think of as a, a programming language? Well, firstly, I guess it's because we think it's a good tool for analysis and good tools can have, be, have a transformative effect. So I'm thinking back to like the 80s and 90s when Excel starts to be used. And I know we all might laugh at Excel now, but actually, if you're an analyst working in, in any area in the 80s or 90s, Excel was incredibly powerful, it enabled people to quickly do analysis with data, it enabled them to produce um, charts, and people I mean, got quite creative with what was essentially a, an accounting tool but could actually use, do, use it to do all kinds of analysis, including, you know, simulation model. It's not really designed for that, but people were very creative about those things. So I think what that shows really is that even though that might not be a great tool, um, now we might not think of it as a great tool, it actually had a transformative effect and brought so many poor, more people into actually ana analyzing data. Um, but obviously it's not a tool which is very fit for lots of the purposes which we want the tools for nowadays. So, I mean, you know the problems with Excel, it's very poor at um, kind of like cleaning analysis of big data sets. Um, anyone who's tried to update a spreadsheet when there's new data coming in knows how difficult that is. Like, we've got the next month's data, how do we analyze that? Well, we'll try and copy and paste it into this spreadsheet. It's a, it's a nightmare, basically. Um, it can't do lots of things. So even though I have seen people, you know, writing Excel spreadsheets that so solve Sudoku puzzles or do simulation modeling, it's not, you really have to work hard to get it to do those things. It's like using a Swiss army knife to, um, you know, do some fancy carving. It's, it's just not the right tool. Very, very poor at transparency. So it's not at all obvious what, um, other people's what, what they, people have done um, it's all buried buried lots of the kind of code within cells um, it's obviously very error prone so we probably all know the story about the track and trace public health england where they lost 16,000 positive covid cases and there's estimates of that that, that actually led to the deaths of 1500 people so there are Actually, it is very error prone. It's very difficult to, because every cell has got a formula in it. There is so much in there and it only takes one formula cell to be wrong and it's impossible to find that. And then of course, Mohammed was talking about some of the collaborative benefits. It's an extremely poor tool for collaboration. So R obviously is a way, it addresses all these issues um, and it is a far better tool for the kind of analysis that we want to do nowadays in the NHS. So that's the first reason. So we think it's a very good tool. It's, it's very much in line with the kind of values we want, openness, transparency, collaboration. There's another reason, which is that we started off investing in this in 2018. So we funded the NHS, our community, and I think we see this has probably been a huge success. Like it's grown, the fact that there were, back in 2018, there were 120 people at this conference, which actually was quite a pretty good turnout for that first conference. 
now understand it's over a thousand we've got 80 talks and 15 workshops so and i can sort of feel just coming into the room this morning and i'm going into the, the uh, coffee area there's a tremendous amount of buzz so it's it's just a very exciting development i think um and i'm really really looking forward to all the talks that i see on the on the agenda today so thank you very much Last beauty, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, I need this slide because uh, I struggle to remember who I am at times. So, uh, so I'm Peter Spilsbury. I'm director of the strategy unit. Um, just hearing Charles talk about his history. Um, so I'm, I'm just about to hit my 40th year in the NHS, which as you will recognize, shows that I, I began as a child uh, in the system. Um, but in those early days, I was responsible for commissioning specialized services for the West Midlands. So deciding how to, how to invest in cardiac surgery, renal dialysis, neurosurgery, you name it. Um, and I'd been doing that job for three years when we got our first computer in the office. And I remember excitedly recruiting a member of staff who knew how to switch it on. And I remember um, building a dynamic model of renal dialysis on paper using calculators. So, and I haven't really advanced since, as, as members from my team who are here will, will confirm. So I'm not an analyst, but I've spent a career trying to find the space and the opportunity for skilled analysts to make the contribution that I know they can. So, um, so I'm director of this thing called the Strategy Unit. Um, we're an anachronism. We're a team that's grown in the Midlands, an NHS team that specializes in, in analysis, research, evaluation. We work on a pay for project basis and we have done for the last 10 years. Um, and we've been reasonably successful at that if, uh, if you measure it in terms of scale. So we're now about 65 people um, working as a team based in the Midlands. And we um, are now the host for the NHSR community. So I just wanted to explain what that means and, and why we are. Um, and this is something we volunteered to do, by the way, and we've done to an extent at risk. So the first thing is um, that we employ and are now developing a core team that supports the energy of this network. Um, I mean, we've, as, as Mohammed was describing, this network's got a huge amount of self-motivation and self-generation, but, but it will only really thrive and events like this will only happen if there's a core group of people who are supporting that to happen. So, so Mohammed is a long-standing member of our team, but I'm pleased to say that we've now just recruited, um, in fact, two names you'll know well, Chris Beely and Zoe Turner, to join our team um, with a substantial amount of their time dedicated to supporting the development of this network uh, and, and to grow the education programmes and so on that go with it as well. So that's a really exciting development for us um, and we're doing this because we believe in it as a team we've adopted our we we, we see some absolutely uh, fundamental core principles in the notion that um, analysis needs to be open source this kind of reproducible analytical pipelines um, concept that um, that Ben Goldacre made such a feature of his recent report our second responsibility in, in hosting NHSR is to raise, further raise its profile and to make sure that as the NHS locally and nationally thinks about how it develops um, analysis, that it doesn't forget that this community is there and that it doesn't uh, fail, that, and make sure it doesn't, fail, it doesn't fail to appreciate the contribution that this network makes and, and the subtle differences about the way it operates to the way the NHS typically organises things. For me, it's a beautiful feature that this is a 
self-generated horizontal thing that it isn't something that's been dropped on the world from on high through a, through a hierarchy. The third thing, having recruited these people and having taken on responsibility for doing the conference and so on, um, we actually do need to raise the funds to do it. Um, and uh, just to pay tribute, the Health Foundation were critical in getting this thing going. They've also stepped straight in to offer to continue providing um, some funding for NHSR into the future. So um, just thanks again to the Health Foundation for, for the leadership and the, and the vision in continuing to support this. Um, NHS England and Improvement haven't leapt yet to support it, but we're in conversation and, um, and we're hopeful that that will lead to them also choosing to make a contribution in this network. Given the significance of what it does to make, for example, a number of the recommendations in Ben Goldacre's report come to life. It's no use creating code libraries if we haven't got an analytical community who knows what to do with them. And then we're hoping that others too will see the value of continuing to support, support this network. And I'll, I'll, I'll give an indication of who those others may be uh, next. So I just wanted to tell you very briefly um, about this thing called the Midlands Decision Support Network. Um, and I want to tell you about it because it's a model that we're trying to encourage all parts of the country to adopt. Um, so the challenge that we saw in the Midlands was that um, ICSs have got a very specific challenge. Um, and they need to be supported uh, to make high quality strategic decisions. And high quality strategic decisions depend on insight from analysis, access to knowledge and evidence, translating those into action. There's an ambition that they be learning systems, that when they do things, they try to understand whether they've actually had the effect they intended, and that the knowledge that's derived from that leads to self-improvement, course correction, but also is shared so others can learn from it. And we, as a region, wanted to think about how do we build the capacity, capability, and culture for that. Now, now the MDSN is also a horizontal initiative. The members decided they wanted to create it, and they fund it through a subscription. They weren't told to do it. So the idea is that each of our ICSs is going to be, is in the process of creating its own intelligence team or a decision support unit was the language we originally used. And each of those is part of an active network. So we have 11 ICSs and the regional office as the 12th member. They're, they're all peers in this network and they govern it. Um, and that network is supported by a development center and that role has been given to my team, the strategy unit. And they fund that through paying subscriptions. The development centre does a few things. So we, we run a regional analytical programme where we, we do sort of large scale analytical projects on, on around about three priority questions that the network members select. So if you look on the website, you'll see recent reports we've been doing on um, inequities in access to planned care, for example. We also have a substantial education and development offer. And I'll just show you a little bit about that uh, in a second. And we have an active knowledge exchange. So we now have a network for analysts. I think there's about 700 people now, members of that network. We have fortnightly huddles that anyone can join with that group. And we have similar networks for leads for each of our systems for evaluation and for knowledge exchange. The education program tries to cover off these four interconnected areas. Critically, we see the development of an intelligence-led NHS as being about both the demand side, the, the quality of the questions that are asked, and the creation of decision-making process that actually use the analysis, and then also and developing the skills of leaders in that area 
but then also developing the technical and the craft skills of the analysts. So you can see on there at the moment, we've, it's a huge program, you can, you can see online what it covers, but there's a set of things that are around strengthening analytical capability. So we're putting in place training at the moment. We have the intention that, ev that every ICS in the Midlands should have a core group of analysts by the end of 23, 24, who are fully competent in the skills necessary to operate RAP, for example. Um, but we've got decision quality programs for system leaders. We've got programs around raising leaders' appreciation of analytical concepts or, or system science concepts, for example. And we've got a set of craft skills for analysts. So we've run the first programs, I think, nationally in leadership skills for analysts. Um, as one example. We also run this annual festival of learning and I'll just put that up because it starts next week. It's free. Anyone in this room can enroll to go in that. We've got an incredible range of speakers um, participating. It's online. It's high quality personal development for NHS staff organised by the NHS for free. Not sure what the current registration is, Rachel, but a couple of thousand people across the NHS are, are registered for this already. Join in if you can. Southwest region have recently decided they want to replicate this model for their region. They're just starting on that journey. We're already talking about how we can collaborate around some aspects of those, the training program I just mentioned. I've been in discussions recently with at least two other regions that are starting to see whether this might work for them. R sits fundamentally behind the concept for the MDSN, Midland Decision Support Network, because one of our kind of visions is a future where the analysts in Coventry can do a fantastic piece of work around demand and supply in eye care can do it with a set of analytical disciplines, documentation, open source code that mean that it sits there in the knowledge exchange for our network so that when the people in Staffordshire are interested to address the same question, they can draw on and adapt from that analysis. So, we, so having R uh, is, is a fundamental part of this. If you like the sound of what you just heard about the Midlands Decision Support Network and think that it might be of relevance in your region, then advocate for it, because this, this, this could happen in any region in this country if the participants decide to make it happen. So advocate within your ICS, point them at this as an example. We're happy to talk to anyone about how we did it in the, re in the Midlands. We're not looking to run it elsewhere, we're not looking to take over the world, but we think this is a model that's got huge power. Because if we had seven of these across the country, collaborating with each other, sharing their analytical programme on key questions, pooling their efforts around education, then, then we would have something really powerful for the NHS. So NHSR and family, it's pluses that Mohammed mentioned, interacting with, in our instance, the Midlands Decision Support Network, but hopefully in the future, a growing family of decision support networks. And then a set of initiatives going off with nationally around analytical professionalization, the key recommendations that came out of the Goldacre report, these things interacting um, seems to me to be a very potent environment. Um, so I'm very pleased that we're, um, that we're in the heart of that and trying to, trying to push it along. And our next adventure in that, um, is that we took advantage of Ben Goldacre's recommendation around where's the national conference for NHS analysts? And we put a proposition and we managed to persuade a few people to give us a budget. So, in 2023, we will have the first major national NHS analysis conference. Um, it'll be, the name's to be confirmed, it will, its purpose will be to celebrate NHS and public sector partners' analysis 
where that analysis has been used for improvement. I, it's focused on insight to action. It will celebrate the work of NHS analysts. It will not be a sales venue for commercial providers of analytical tools. It will be funded by the NHS to be free for NHS participants. In our first year, it will be a two-day conference in the Midlands. We're anticipating pitching it at around 500 participants, um, hopefully embracing colleagues from Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland as well. And it will be very purposefully linked with NHSR, with AFA, and others. And we're starting to think that maybe where we can get it to over the course of the three, the initial three years we've got funding for is to when we can have a data science week. And we want to try to get to the point where we can persuade organisations across the country that releasing their analytical staff to participate in that week as a major contribution to their professional and personal development is a worthwhile investment. So details will emerge shortly. Um, but I just thought I'd share that with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>I know Peter has to dash, but um, colleagues from the strategy unit and the Midlands Decision Support Network will be here. Rachel, if you stand up and just, so we have a stand in the coffee area and Rachel will be looking at, so any questions about the MDSN can go to, can go to Rachel. Um, and also now it's my great pleasure to uh, announce our next keynote speaker. So Jess, please, thank you very much. All right, hi everyone, thanks for having me. So I'm gonna talk about the Goldacre Review, which I did write with Ben. So I apologize that I'm not Ben, but I promise we did write every single word together and we're the same height, so that's the comparison. Um, I am 18 years younger than him though, so that's where the comparison stops. Just don't tell him I said that. So I am gonna to talk to you about how I did, where's the clicker? Yeah. <laughs> um, bye. Thanks. I just wanted to shop. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you about how we put together the review and some of the key recommendations uh, that are in it, in particular the ones that are most prevalent to the people in this room. Oh, there we go. So as a bit of a background, we had a very broad terms of reference that came to us from Matt Hancock, if you can remember that far back in Secretary of State World um, and before he was, you know, famous for being in the jungle. And we did over 300 interviews with a really broad range of people and a number of focus groups with key stakeholder groups across the whole of the NHS, including many people from the NHSR and the NHS Python communities who came to speak to us about the many barriers that you face in terms of NHS analytics and how we can sort of help and support grow that community. And it was out of one of those fo um, focus groups from which my favorite quote came, which was everybody has a secret laptop. That is my uh, remaining favorite quote from the whole of the interviews that we did with the, with the Goldacre Review. And that was in reference to the sort of difficulties that sometimes people face trying to use the tools that we talk about in the review so some modern open computational analytical tools inside an NHS environment. Uh, we also did a bunch of desk research. We talked to a lot of people in terms of emailing and trying to answer questions, particularly when people had said something in interviews that we didn't particularly understand. Uh, so for example, one person told us that if you put your analytical code up in the public domain, you might be at risk of that becoming a medical device if you had then deployed it in a clinical system. So we went and would do some research with the MHRA, for example, to check whether or not that was true. Um, so that's the sort of thing where I say we did also did some desk research. We then came up with about 180 recommendations. That number gets banded around a bit. Um, sometimes it's 185. I'm not gonna lie, the number doesn't stay static, mostly because I can't count. Um, but we talked about a lot of things and a lot of different recommendations in a lot of different areas. 
um, in particular, we spoke about sort of five core areas. We talk about professionalizing the NHS analytical community, um, by which we mostly mean supporting and growing and bigging up the NHS analytical community. We speak a lot about privacy and security issues, in particular, the limitations of, of pseudonymization, so taking off your name and address as a means of re-identification protection, and that leads us to talk about trusted research environments. We then go on to talk about everybody's favourite topic, information governance and patient participation information um, and uh, engagement, and talk about how that is increasingly a bit of a barrier for people and how maybe the use of trusted research environments now rebranded as secure data environments um, is better and could potentially help reduce the information governance burden. And the last bit that we talk about is data curation, um, which is personally my favorite bit, but it's the bit that I think gets lost in the weeds sometimes, mostly because I think some, for some policymakers, it's a little bit too nerdy, um, but we love the nerdy, so we'll, we'll embrace it. Okay, so let's talk first about platforms and security. So the first thing, like I said, is we spend a long time explaining the fact that if you take names and addresses off people's data and then disseminate it out, so send it to researchers um, or analysts across the community and across the system, that is a significant privacy risk, regardless of how much you have done to, to sort of pseudonymize the actual underlying data, it's still reasonably easy to re-identify people within clinical records. That's because clinical records are so dense and they're so rich and they include so many different data points. Um, so the example we give in the review, and that's one we often use, is uh, people who have had children, um, in particular people who have given birth, they, as long as you know roughly when they gave birth and the age of their children, that's probably enough to be able to re-identify them in the record. And that's the type of information that you might know just by talking to somebody in the school gate. So we, it's really not significant, sufficient protection to just disseminate, even if you take names and addresses off. Uh, so the types of recommendations then that we make is we basically say you've got to build trust through taking concrete action. So the system has tried to mitigate the risk associated with this pseudo approach by building in lots and lots of paperwork. So we vet everyone very carefully, we make people sign contracts, etc., which relies very much on assumed trust, or what uh, in sometimes in academic literature is called lazy trust, which I feel is slightly unfair, but it, it's very much a passive thing as opposed to an active thing. And so what we say is you need to build active trust by taking concrete action, which is primarily by relying more heavily on what we refer to in the review as trusted research environments and which the NHS now calls secure data environments. Uh, the reason it's changed its name is for two reasons. One, because you cannot assume that an environment is trusted and trusted is a loaded term. Um, and secondly, because as everybody in this room will know, you don't just do research inside um, in these environments. And with the NHS data, you also might do analysis, um, you might do service evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we then go on to talk about how you can make that reality by saying this should be the default mechanism for accessing NHS data and working with it, that the NHS should embrace this by building a, num a small number of national TREs, or SDEs, by national, we mean the, the places that hold the national data set. So for example, the full GP records of everyone like we may have in Open Safely, which I think some of my colleagues will talk to you about in different parts of today. Um, we then go on to say that once you have reduced the privacy risk, you can reduce the information governance burden and you can make the information governance burden less, and you can use that as a mechanism for incentivizing people to work inside trusted research environments. Because what happens at that point, you don't need to worry so much about vetting for privacy, you need to focus instead solely on vetting for purpose, because people can still do creepy and un unsocially acceptable things with data, even if you have maintained people's privacy. Um, and then we, so that's that last point, make sure you use TREs to standardize the working environment. And the last bit we talk about is the use of TREs to help enhance and encourage the use of modern open collaborative approaches to data science. And that's this next chapter. 
Um, so we talk a lot about the importance of using reproducible and analytical pipe, pipelines or pathways, which acronymizes to RAP, uh, which is my favorite word to say because it makes me sound like a dad trying to make a dad joke. Um, but we're talking about making sure things are written in code with clear documentation shared in the open so that if another person in your same organization wants to run the same analysis, they can do so with a click of a button, but also so that other people across the NHS can reuse your amazing code. Um, we talk about the benefits of that in terms of transparency, reusability and checking, um, but also mostly in terms of efficiency. Now, we do know that there are some barriers to that ways of working um, that might be skills, but it's most likely the people who are in potentially management positions inside the NHS who do not necessarily understand the difference between open code and open data, and that can be sometimes a little bit alarming. We also know that um, sometimes posting your code or putting your code out in the open can be, be a little bit intimidating, particularly for people who feel as though that means that your code needs to be perfect. So we talk about the fact that that's definitely not the case. Um, and I can definitely say that if anybody ever saw any of my code and the people from my team will tell you this, uh, they would have a heart attack and run a mile. Um, nobody wants to be looking at that at all. Um, but we do talk about the fact that what essentially this is, is applying the logics and the best practices of software development to analytics. So that means also doing things like testing your analytical code and making sure it's clearly documented as much as it does about pushing things into the open. Um, and I should say that we are not talking just to the NHS community in this instance, we are also talking to uh, academics who are sometimes worse. We as academics in a traditional way, we like to write papers, publish them in a journal that you have to pay a subscription to read, and then maybe put the analytical code in a PDF that you have to request. So we're, we're by no means um, any better as a rule. So what do we talk about next? Uh, data curation and knowledge management. So this is the nerdy bit. Um, this is where we are saying stop doing data curation differently to variable and unseen standards duplicatively across every team. And what we mean about data curation is things like how did you come up with your variable? What's your code list? So this is just as much about how you did the analysis and how you identified what you were going to do as it is about the actual analytical code that you did. And what we really mean by this is that there's sometimes a little bit of a tendency for two, for two things to happen. One, for people to accuse NHS data of being messy. Um, NHS data is messy because it's not designed for research and analysis. It's designed for use in clinical care and it serves that purpose well. So we have to think about how do I make it ready, readily available and readily usable for research and analysis. And that means really carefully thinking about well, how do you define asthma? How do you define ethnicity? These are not things that are static that I can go off the shelf and take. Um, the example that I've given before is when we did some analysis from Open Safely. At one point in time, we were getting a lot of results that were returning pregnant men in their 70s. Clearly, people are not pregnant when they're men in their 70s. The actual re reality was that the SNOMED code for fetus and the SNOMED code for dodgy knee are very, very similar and they'd got mixed up. Um, so that's really what we mean about data curation. And we talk about this as being the main strategic challenge that the NHS has in terms of making broader use of its data, because many people don't know the complexities of working with this, with this NHS data. And a lot of that knowledge sits in silos and it's not necessarily shared. And this causes many problems for research, but it also causes problems for practical service evaluation. It causes issues for QOF and it causes that type of thing because people are defining those metrics and measures in multiple different ways across the whole of the NHS, um, which we all love to think is this one big family, but it's, it's very federated. So we have to think about how those different things work across different barriers. And that's a real problem for duplicative, duplication and therefore it's a real big problem for um, efficiency. So the things that we talk about in terms of recommendations there is creating an open online library for NHS data curation code. We talk about validity tests and technical documentation. We talk about the importance of having librarians, so people who can help with things like code libraries or uh, variable libraries and making sure that code lists are openly available for other people to use. 
And then you wonderful people, the NHS data analysts. Um, so this, I won't bore on too much about this because this is basically the theme of, of this entire conference. Um, but we talk about the importance and of raising the value and really raising the profile of the NHS analytical community. Um, so it's very important to us in the review. It's very important to me personally that people see an NHS analysts as being a crucial part of the NHS workforce. You aren't just doing things in the back end that have very little impact. You are running the healthcare service, making sure it runs well, making sure it works for people, making sure we evaluate the services. So we are really talking about making sure that that profile is raised and recognised. And so that means thinking, making sure that people have appropriate career paths, making sure salaries are, are equally matched to the level of skill. We also talk about, for example, things like making sure that there is a proper name rather than being in admin and clerical stuff. All of these types of things. Um, and we really, really importantly talk about recognizing the value of knowledge management. So again, this is about talking about making sure people can share their learnings and best practice. And in particular, we finally end on this point about training senior non-analysts and leaders to be good customers of data. So one of the things that we heard very often from, from people in the NHS analytical community during the review was, oh, but I get told to do this thing. And actually sometimes the thing it's impossible to do because because actually I don't have the data or the data isn't capable of telling me that answer. Um, and you get this mismatch between what's being asked of you as analytics analysts in the community versus what managers think is possible. And sometimes this causes a bit of a disconnect. So we talk about making sure senior leaders are better customers of data. That means they know the types of questions they can, they can ask. Um, and hopefully by doing that, you also lower some of the barriers to working in that modern open collaborative way that, that I mentioned. So things we also talk about in this chapter is for example, making an NHS open analytics policy, making it very clear to IT teams across the whole of the country that it's perfectly fine for you to run things like our studio on, on NHS laptops, that type of thing. Um, so where have we got to since? So I won't talk about this because it's exceptionally dry and boring, but basically make sure information governance works well for everyone by relying more heavily on trusted research environments and ensure that patients and public are appropriately engaged in any use of their data. So where have we got to since we published in April? Why is this not going to close? So we published in April, the NHS data strategy came out in June. We were very, very happy that there had been a good recognition of the fact of the importance of developing secure data environments. There was also good recognition of simplifying the IG framework. Um, and there was also this wonderful line around insisting that public services are built with public money and so the code they are based on should be made available across the health and care system. Um, so we were thrilled that we got those areas. The things that didn't pick up on so much was data curation um, and there was less in there as again I'm sure will be discussed across the conference of the next few days about that NHS analytical pipe, um, NHS analytical community and in particular the role of community groups and sort of bottom-up approaches to Im improving that. Um, but by and large we think it was a good start and there has been numerous policy developments since, for example on September the 8th there was the publication of the NHS's guidelines for secure data environments and we are continuing to see developments in that space. And so this was how we concluded. The NHS is a phenomenal resource. We should all regard it as a profound duty to make best use of that resource. We should invest in a coherent approach to data curation. And um, this will reap rewards across the global community, not just in England. And to do this, we must earn public trust. Um, and in particular, we end on this um, because I think this has, again, been a little bit of a complaint I've heard recently that whilst COVID was happening, there was a very positive can-do attitude. And we may have started to see a little bit of a reversion of that now that we are back in sort of non-urgent times. But what we say is COVID-19 brought fresh urgency and shone a harsh light on some of the con the current shortcomings, but future pandemics and waves may be bigger, bigger challenges. And there have always been lives waiting to be saved through better, broader, faster, safer use of NHS data. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Just because we're running a little bit ahead of time. Um, anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to make, please? Yep. 
Yes, we have Sarah, thank you. Can we just try and get a mic to Sarah, please? Just do wait for the mic, please, Sarah. Is that actually on? Yeah, there you go. Hello, Jess. Thank you for that. That was really interesting. What next for Team Goldacre in this space? <laughs> um, well, so there's our work and then that we do in terms of uh, Bennett Institute, which is very much by, uh, I, have, I think our approach is uh, show by doing. So by building things through like open safety, um, which is our own trusted research environment and sort of showing what good practice looks like and spreading that way um, in terms of Policy influence, so we are still quite connected with the teams inside DHSE, for example, who are working on developing those policies for the use of secure data environments, um, things like the technical specifications uh, and how accreditation might look uh, and that type of thing. And then just largely, I suppose, trying to be as useful as we can in, in um, any capacity that we can. Any other questions, please? Yes. Why don't you use my mic? Hello, I'm Sanzida. It was really good to hear from you today. Um, there was one thing you mentioned in your presentation that I was quite keen to hear more about, and it was about um, training senior non-analysts and leaders in how to be good customers of, a da of data teams. Um, so when you say that, what exactly are you referring to? What could be done practically to make that happen? Because it is, it does seem to be a bit of a barrier so that a lot of analysts seem to come across, or analytical teams seem to come across. Yeah. So when we go into quite a lot of detail in the review about the types of practical stuff that could be done um so for example we talk about making and again you've, you've heard from people people like peter about making training very widely available and making it very openly accessible um that would apply to senior leaders uh, as much as it would to analysts but what we are sort of saying is that it's about giving senior analysts the skills to understand and to be able to talk the talk and have a detailed enough knowledge of and understanding of what NHS data physically looks like so that there is enough expertise there, I suppose, in order to ask reasonable questions of, of, of data. Um, and so there are some things that happen, for example, inside, it was inside number 10, I think it's now moving across, uh, but it's associated with the cabinet office, it's called 10DS, for example, and that entire programme is about uh, training senior, senior policy makers and senior leaders in data science. Um, it's actually a really quite good program. Um, they get taught basics in coding. They get taught what does uh, anal what does data look like. Uh, we did some pilots about making it possible for people to come and do like a little test inside Open Safety to see what that felt like. Um, and the hope is that those those uh, types of initiatives will will spread. Um, and then also hopefully over time, uh, as people who have who are more familiar with these skills become senior managers as well, then hopefully that will also also transition. Um, but one of the things we talk about a lot in the review is about finding a balance. So we don't, for example, want to advocate for the fact that if you're an analyst, the only way for you to become promoted is to become a manager where you're further away from the analytical skills. So there's a, there's a bit of finding finding a balance there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. I'll just add a little bit to what Jess has said. So Peter highlighted that there are two key courses in the Midlands Decision Support Network. One is leadership for analysts, and the other is decision quality for leaders. And the common theme between those two courses is actually we are united only on this notion of a high quality decision. And analytics has a huge role to play in that. So supporting leaders and analysts to converge on this notion of decision quality is one of the things that we're we're majoring on in the in the decision support network uh, and anyways now it's my great pleasure now to ask uh, Sue, please thank you uh, 
Okay, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to present from my computer. So I think at the moment, oh, oh that's not showing the, the screen that I see. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's showing my other screen. Um, I don't know. Uh, all right, but we'll, we'll, we'll stick with the uh, we'll stick with the slides there, and I'll, and I'll use those. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Heather Turner. I'm a research software engineering fellow at the University of Warwick, based in the statistics department there. Um, prior to that, I was. Um, a freelance R programmer for about a decade, and I've also worked in the pharmaceutical industry. And today I'm going to share with you um, some good coding practices, uh, thinking in particular uh, about people that are working as data analysts. Um, so in theory, uh, if we're using a, a language like R, we've got the advantage that we're writing a, a script for our, our analysis. And um, as I say, in theory, that, that helps us create those reproducible pipelines that we were just hearing about and our data analysis work is uh, transparent, reproducible and reusable and maintainable. Uh, but in practice, uh, this doesn't work quite so well unless we adopt some good coding and software engineering practices. Uh, and so I'm gonna briefly review some of the practices that we might use to get us closer to these goals. So let's think first of all about transparency. Um, an immediate thing that we can do is to think about how we organize our projects and try and organize them well, uh, organize them as we would like to find them. So we can start by naming our files to reflect the content or function um, of those files and organizing them by type. Uh, for example, putting data files together, putting scripts together, um, so that when we look at a project like this example project here, we can immediately get an idea of what's going on, you know, what the files are, what they do, even before we've looked at any documentation. But of course, we can improve things with a, a little documentation. And a good practice is to put a readme at the top level of our project folder. And this should contain the information that you would tell a colleague if you were passing this project on and you just had a minute to describe the project. The, the project. You know, what, what's the study about? Uh, what data do you have? What are the key um, files that they should know about in order to get started? Of course, you can supplement this with further documentation, but the README should provide a quick starting point. And we should also think about uh, commenting our code. Um, so here's a little chunk of code here. And for each chunk of code, we should just have a short comment at the top that des describes the purpose of that code chunk. So that before people even start looking at the code, they've got a good idea of what this code does. So here it says patient exposure and event rates. Um, so we can guess that, that this, this code is computing uh, the exposure and event rate. And if there's any, anything that's a little complicated, um, like it, uh, we can add an additional comment. So I've got an additional side comment there that says calculate exposure per month. And it's next to a line that says exposure is equal to de-exposure divided by 30.4. So we can see that we can sort of guess then that de-exposure is exposure in number of days. 30.4 is what I've taken as, as the sort of average number of days per month. So that just gives a little bit more explanation for something that's maybe not quite so obvious. And comments like these can help people to understand our code uh, and they might be sufficient, just, just this a comment at the start of each chunk and a little bit of explanation where necessary. Uh, but if we've got a very long script, it may also help to break it up into sections with sort of bigger headings that we um, identify with extra hashes or, or dashes. And our studio has a nice little function uh, that we can uh, uh, run with con command or control shift R, and it will insert this little section header uh, to help break up our, our, our long scripts. And generally, we should aim to create readable code. So here's a few tips on, on how we actually do that in practice. So use meaningful names. Perhaps that de-exposure variable in my previous slide could have been called exposure underscore days, and it would have been even more obvious what's going on. We want to try and keep our lines short, less than 80 characters is a good rule of thumb. And make good use of white space, put spaces after commas, around operators like plus and minus signs, and break up our code as we just saw into chunks with one, one chunk per objective rather than having lines and lines um, that are you know, hard, hard, to, hard to pass. And in, generally, in general, when we're thinking about uh, an, 
analysis code, we should prefer readability over maximum efficiency. So normally we'd be happy to sacrifice a little bit of time if it makes our code easier to understand. So here's a, an example. We've got two different versions of code. They do exactly the same thing. On the left, it's much harder to understand because we've got dollar signs, we've got nested brackets, we've got nested functions. On the right, it's much easier because we've each line is a separate step. We take the data frame, we then group by the group variable, and then we create a new variable lag value, uh, which is created by using the lag function applied to value. So it's much easier to read as we go through. We're keeping it simple with each step. It's only one extra line. It's ever so slightly less efficient, but I, I hope you agree it's more readable. Many ways we can go further. I'm not going to go into detail here, but I just want to flag up some ideas for you to think about. Style guides, where we try and be consistent about things like naming or how we indent and lay out our code. And you can look at the Tidyverse style guide for an example. If you're working in teams, then code review or pair programming can be good techniques to help um, uh, make sure you're following good practice. And if we're writing our own functions, um, then you could think about creating your own documentation help files in R using the doc string package. So there's some things I'm happy to talk about in the breaks if you want to know more about that. Let's move on to reproducibility and reusability and think more about our project oriented workflow. So we've already thought about how we can organize files within a project. It's also good practice when we're working within a project to set the working directory to the project root which we can do, for example, by using our Studio projects, creating our project as an RStudio project, so that when you open that project, it automatically starts with a working directory set to the project root. And then when you define any file paths within your script, you can then make them relative to this root, um, so that we can port our project to another place on our computer or to somebody else's computer, and those file paths will still work. And the here package um, uh, tries to make this easy, um, so in this little code snippet there, I'm defining uh, the, the path to a, a PNG file, and I'm saying it's here in my project within the figs direct, subdirectory, um, and then the name of the file. Um, this works generally pretty well if, if your project can be self-contained. Of course, sometimes we do need to refer to things like data outside the project. In that case, the best thing to do is to define a directory or a file path right at the stop of your start of your script or a markdown file and then refer to that that named um, file path rather than hard coding it all through your script so that it's easy to change if necessary if we've got things like file paths that we want to that we know we're going to want to change in future a good approach is to use something like a parameterized r markdown or quartile file quarto file um, so you might have come across our Markdown quarters, a sort of newer version, uh, where we create these documents that have a YAML header at the top, some text that may include inline R code um, or, or other code in the case of Quarto, like Python code, and uh, chunks of code, which will then get, will get run when we render the file and the output will be shown in the final document. Um, so here we can see the output is going to be an HTML document. What I wanted to illustrate was the idea of parameters, which I'm defining in the YAML header here with the params field. And I can define any parameters I want. For example, I'm defining one here called data, which is going to be the name of the data file that I'm going to analyze. So that separates the things we want to change in the top of the uh, R markdown file or quartile file, and the rest of it is then a template. And if I want to refer to one of those parameters, I can call it by using the params dollar notation. And I can either uh, define those parameters at the top and hard code them in the YAML as I have here, or I can define them when I render those, those files, which is even better. Uh, so on the left, I'm rendering the R markdown script um, with the sleep data. On the right, I'm rendering the, R mark, the quarto script, sorry, with the women data. And as you can see, you know, the title, the text, the output can all be changed just by changing that, that one parameter. If we think we're going to write code where we might be using different data in future, then we need to think uh, even more about defensive programming. So it's a good technique in general, but particularly when we think we're going to reuse code in future. So if we're taking something like a, a file path to an Excel file, we might want to use something like normalized path to check that that path actually exists. 
Or if we're asking the user to define a threshold, we might want to do some basic sanity checks, for example, checking that it is actually a number and that number is bigger than zero. And two packages I'd like to just briefly mention are assert that and validate, which are very useful for this type of data or input validation. It's also a good idea to check the results of your filters and joins. So here's an example, we're taking patient outcomes, filtering to a particular report date and a patient. Um, and on your initial data, this might work fine and create, return a table. On some future data, this might not return any data and then you need to think what to do. Should your R code or R markdown return an error or should it return a warning? If it returns a warning, does the rest of your script still work with an empty table? So you need to think ahead about uh, sort of the unexpected. Also, if somebody wants to run your code in future, they'll need to know what packages you've been using. And there's various ways we can approach this. The most basic is we can just put a text file at the root of our project that lists the packages that we used and then put library calls at the top of our R scripts or our markdown or quarto files so that it's easy for people to see straight away which packages are required. Um, this is fine, but as we know, packages change, bugs are fixed, new features are added. Um, so there's various tools that help us um, um, be more specific and um, help people to restore the working environment that we used. So again, briefly just mentioning a few packages in this space. Uh, the Groundhog package lets you pick a date for your script and it will help people to uh, install and load the libraries that are available on CRAN at that particular date. So it's very good for a one-off analysis where you just want to fix things in time. If you're going to do a repeated analysis and you think you might want to sort of update things over time to keep up with new developments, um, then the automatic package is quite a nice package. Here we define a depths.yaml file, which again we put at the root of our project and it lists the packages we're using, but also the versions that we're using. And that means we have a bit more flexibility to decide which packages we want to update and whether we just want which version we want to update to. If we're writing production code, the sort of thing where perhaps we're making a shiny app available to users, in this situation, we might want to be even more specific and define the R version, the package versions, and the versions of those, the dependencies of those packages. And that's what uh, the RM package will enable you to do. But it does give um, quite a bit of overhead, so maybe not so useful for ad hoc analyses. And finally, maintainability. Uh, one thing we want to do here is to choose our dependencies carefully. So there's many reasons we might want to use an add-on package. For example, it helps to make our code more readable. It provides a faster implementation of something. Um, but on the other hand, um, it, a package update might break our code. If there's a bug, um, we might have to hang around for and wait for the maintainer to fix it. And as we've just seen, there's more setup for us or somebody else to reproduce the analysis if we, if we need to do that later on. So we can ask questions like, how much of the functionality of a package are we using? How mature or well-maintained is the package? Are we using it across multiple projects to help us think about whether it's worth taking on a particular dependency and to try and keep the, rel the dependencies relatively small? Another good practice is to follow the don't repeat yourself principle. So it's tempting when we're writing a script and we want to do something similar to just copy a chunk of code, paste it again and modify it. But of course, this can be error prone and it means that our scripts can end up being very long as we just keep copying these big chunks of code. And a better approach is to use custom functions. So here's a little example where I'm taking a two-way contingency table with row and column totals, and I want to convert the counts to percentages. So the function is just a few lines, but if I wanted to use it lots of times, I'd just have to say, make perk tab applied to the, the table, which would be a lot cleaner and, and clearer. Or I could even um, take a list of tables and use something like lapply to iterate through those tables with my custom function. So again, much shorter and simpler code. Another good practice is to use a version control. I think we've already heard mention of that this morning. And these systems, such as Git, allow us to record changes that we're making to our project over time. So here's a real example, actually, um, just the very beginning of a project. I kicked it off by adding a readme read file to the project. 
Then I added some data and then I pre-processed the data and I stored the, the, the process data. And so it helps us to see the, the path of a project. It also means uh, it helps us avoid the bad practice of, of saving multiple variants of code scripts where we're not quite sure what we want to do, so we try and save everything, or we comment our old code that we don't really want to throw away. Version control has a better way of storing that. And you can go back to particular commits or lines in this history, and uh, you can restore them temporarily just to look around, re remember what you did, or you can restore them permanently to revert your changes. We can do all this locally, just on our laptop, or we can sync with a remote repository host like GitHub, um, which also has the advantage of providing a backup of our work. Final thing I want to mention in this area is testing. Again, we've heard about this this morning. Um, so we can write tests, uh, which are particularly useful if we're writing custom functions, like the one I've got here, where I've defined uh, a special function to compute the log of base two, which is not really worth it because it's such an easy thing to do in R, but just for illustration, I've used a test that uh, function from the test that package um, to test some expectations about that function. For example, I can apply it to a particular value, two to the three, where I know what the answer should be, three, and I can check that's equal. Run the test and it test that will tell me if the test has passed. And we can create a little test suite for our functions, say in the file test.r, and run all the tests in that file with the test file function. And this is really useful if, when we're working on our code, we can run the test suite and just check that everything is still working as it should. Um, again, I've just dropped a few ideas of how we might go further in the area of maintainability. I'm probably, um, <laughs> probably running out of time. So just briefly, um, we could go further and think about package development, or we could use further features of repository hosts like, like GitHub. So I'll, I'll leave those there for, for uh, future reference, along with um, some links to some helpful resources uh, where you can find out more about the things I've, I've mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Can I ask Ian, please? Thank you. Heather's staying for the two days, by the way, if, if you want to kind of follow up with Heather at all. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, it's really nice to be at an in person conference again and see so many nice faces in the audience. I haven't done this for about three years, uh, but here are some logos. More importantly, uh, my name's Ian. I'm from the Bennett Institute of Applied Data Science. I work with Jess and we've got a few other uh, open safety type talks coming up. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, reusable actions in uh, open safely, about code reuse more specifically. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what open safely is, uh, but focus a lot more on why we reuse code uh, code reuse in practice, uh, some challenges associated with trusted research environments and code reuse, and how we address some of those challenges in open safely. I'm going to talk a little bit about this concept of scripted actions and also about reusable actions and how we move from, from the former to the latter in, in, our, in our environment, in our trusted research environment. We'll talk a little bit about why we do this, and uh, this talk is a really sort of a natural progression from the previous one. I'm going to return to the idea of security and then there'll be a few links so you can find out more. So Open Safely uh, is a secure, transparent, open source software platform for analysis of electronic health records data. And you're going to hear probably a little bit more about, about the platform uh, today and tomorrow, so I won't dwell too much on, on, uh, on the definition. Code reuse, however, is what I'm going to be talking about now. Why do we do it? Why do we, um, why do we try to reuse our code? So we want to avoid duplicating identical lines of code in different locations. And the previous speaker talked about you know, wanting to avoid copying and pasting one thing to another place. Uh, don't repeat yourself being a mantra. Uh, instead, we want to use the same lines of code in each location. And over time, we want to do this because we want to improve the underlying functionality that those lines of code implement. And that might mean adding some tests to make sure that the code is doing what we think it's doing. Uh, even after a decade of, of writing software that people are paying me to write, I, I still make silly mistakes that tests, tests help me uncover. 
We might want to add uh, documentation. We might want to fix bugs. Hopefully, we always want to fix our bugs. And we also want to uh, improve features, over, uh, add new features over time too. But importantly, we want to do this within a project we're working on, but we also want a mechanism to do this between the projects we're working on. So something we developed last week or last month or last year, we can use tomorrow or next week or next year. In practice then, when, when we're working within a project, we can factor our code into functions, or classes or methods, depending on the underlying paradigm we're working in. And we can factor these into modules or packages. Uh, if we want to reuse that between projects, then we have to start thinking about uh, software repositories and things like PyPy in the Python world or CRAN in the, uh, in the R world. So some challenges then. TREs and code, re um, and code re re reuse, breaking the teeth in for a friend today. Releasing code requires a different set of skills to writing code. And I think, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that. When we think about uh, releasing code, we have to make some choices. Um, I'm a Python developer. I have done some R, so I've used some Python examples here. In the Python world, we have to think about tooling. We have to think about whether we use a tool called Flit or Poetry or Setup tools to actually package up our code. We also have to think about the versions of the programming language we want to support. Uh, if we push our code to a repository like CRAN or PyPy, then we have to make explicit, we should really make explicit that it only runs on Python 3.8 or 3.9 or 3.10. I'm sure the equivalent is true in the R world too. We have to think about the operating systems we want to support, so Unix-like or Windows-like. And we should really pick a versioning scheme so users of our code know what version they're using. And there are different choices there. We can use semantic version, versioning, we can use calendar-based versioning. All important choices, not necessarily the kind of things you think about or learn about when you're writing code itself. There are also some security challenges associated with code reuse and TREs. Uh, you might be familiar with the two top lines here from the Python world, pip installing a package, conda installing a package, or calling install.packages ggplot in the, in the R world. In each case, we're downloading a package from the internet to a computer. And when we're working on our laptop, that's, that's fine. We've got an internet connection, there's no problem there. But what if that computer is within a TRE, a trusted research environment? Well, we've got to think about whether the environment actually supports that, and arguably it probably shouldn't. We should probably have to ask someone uh, to put the packages inside the environment for us to use. And that's because if packages can be downloaded to a TRE, then, then can data actually be uploaded? They, they probably shouldn't allow that. TREs probably shouldn't allow unrestricted access to the internet. Um, but even if they do allow some sort of access, where are those packages hosted? Uh, which software repository and which mirror? CRAN has a, a wonderful ecosystem of, of mirrors and PyPy is well mirrored too. But mirrors can be uh, compromised. So TREs probably shouldn't have unrestricted, unrestricted access to, to all of those software repositories and all of those mirrors. And then even if it does allow all of those kind of things, We've got to think about whether we, we really got the package we asked for. Like, is, is the matplotlib or the ggplot we wanted the, the one we actually got? Uh, packages can be compromised, and so TREs probably shouldn't have unrestricted access to, to uh, packages. If I had more time now, I'll pick out some amusing examples from the JavaScript world where someone messed up everything because they'd uploaded a, a different package. But there, there, are, there are all sorts of horror stories out there about using the wrong package when you thought you were using the right one. So I think the, the skills and the security challenges can be addressed. They're, they're, um, they're, they're technical, they are addressable, but I think they also distract us as uh, practitioners, as analysts, as software developers from uh, achieving our aims of code reuse. They don't really um, help, you know, learning those skills and addressing those challenges kind of get in the way of avoiding duplication, using the same lines of code in each location, improving the functionality and getting things that we can use within projects as well as between projects. So within the Open Safety platform, we try and solve this problem using scripted and then reusable actions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about both uh, now. Scripted actions then. Well, an Open Safety project is a set of steps. Uh, we call it pipeline. Um, when you run them, those steps in that pipeline produce uh, a summative result with some intermediate results along the way. It's a really familiar concept from the world of data engineering. Uh, we call each step in that pipeline an action, and each action is run with an isolated uh, Docker container, an isolated environment that doesn't have access to the internet. Now, some of those actions address really specific tasks. We have an action called cohort extractor, which not surprisingly allows a researcher to extract a cohort 
writes for files or disk. The researcher then can analyze that cohort by writing one or more scripted actions, and they're much more tailored to the piece of analysis that the researcher is working on. Uh, scripted actions are often highly project specific. As I say, they're really tailored. They might be things like um, rounding numbers, uh, producing a modeling output, that kind of thing. Reusable actions are a progression from that, from scripted actions. Um, they've been decoupled from their projects, if you like, and they help us achieve code reuse was within as well as uh, between projects. And I think whilst you could think of reusable actions as packages, analogous to something needs to compile by or CRAN, it's better to think of them as reusable projects, so projects that you can, can move around. They still have the same restrictions as the underlying projects. To be able to produce them and share them, you still need to be a researcher within this TRE. So there's some kind of um, safeguarding there. It's not just something from PyPy or something from CRAM. So how do we move from the former to the latter? Um, as I mentioned, I'm a, a Python developer, and I sort of snuck in here this morning, perhaps to the, to the wrong track. So there will be some Python code here, but really, really small amount. So typically, project-specific information is hard-coded into one of our scripted actions. It's just a script. So for example, we may hard-code the location of an input file that we use later in that script. There's an example up there. And we may run that script by simply passing it to the Python interpreter. That's all well and good, but it's not very portable. If you want to use that in a different project, chances are that file is going to be in a different location, or perhaps doesn't exist at all. So we have to do a little bit of refactoring to go from scripted to uh, reusable. And what we tend to do is move project-specific information to arguments. We tend to pass that information in and then let the program make use of it. Uh, there's an example on the screen here where we've no longer hard-coded that information. Instead, where we call the program at the bottom, we just, we just pass it in. We say, here is a path to an input file. Uh, get on with whatever you have to get on with. So the first step in moving from the former to the latter is a little bit of refactoring. That refactoring is still within the bounds of learning how to write code. There's still useful skills to have if you just want to get on with writing Python or R code. So making a command line interface is, is a writing code skill, as I've just said. It's not really a releasing code skill. So I think it's kind of complementary to the kind of things you'd want to, want to sort of learn about your environment, your programming language. But importantly, you use the same workflow if you're working on a scripted action or a reusable action for something within a project or something to share between projects with your, with your colleagues and other researchers, it's still the same workflow that underpins both. I'm going to skip through the next steps because they're really tied to the implementation of Open Safely, but we create a new uh, GitHub repository in a particular GitHub organization this is specifically for Open Safely reusable actions. We copy some code over so it's no longer in its original study, it's, it's in this new project. We add a bit of um, metadata, a readme and an action.yaml file and the importance of that we heard, heard about earlier. And then we get to point our uh, old study, our existing study, our brand newly minted reusable action. And the important thing is everyone else does too. Um, and they can do that knowing who produced it, they can interrogate the code on GitHub, and it's there for them in their studies. And I want to re-emphasize that it's just the same workflow. It's just another way of writing a study, but I'm decoupling it from its, from its parent study, if you like. Why do this? Well, by decoupling um, scripts, scripted actions from projects, I think we achieve well, at, least three, at least three things. Firstly, we create a location for making improvements. We've got this new project. We've got somewhere we, where if we wish to engage with other researchers, we, we you know, open up issue or feature requests. Uh, we can also uh, use that location to write tests, to improve the documentation, to add new features, that kind of thing. We can also access a mechanism within the open safety world for sharing our improvements. Uh, and that's called the actions registry. And I'll show you a screenshot a, a little bit uh, later. It's analogous to, to PyPy or CRAM, but is, is much more bounded within this open safety world. And hopefully we can also access a mechanism for receiving uh, credit for our work. That might come in the form of uh, lav lavish citations or maybe just you know, QDOS on uh, Stack Overflow or GitHub or, or something like that. It's uh, almost certainly not going to come in the form of money, unfortunately. Going back to some of those security questions or security issues I raised earlier, I mentioned that Open Safety, the platform, restricts access to the internet. Uh, those little Docker containers don't have any access to the internet, but the platform that surrounds it can only access two GitHub organizations, the core Open Safety GitHub org and the Open Safety Actions org. 
it's really pared down. You only get access to the things that we've looked at and people are allowed to uh, open up repos then. Uh, and they're accessible by proxy. And we've got loads more control over these organizations than we do over, over other software repositories, PyPy like CRAN and their mirrors. So in many respects, reusable actions have a very similar security profile to uh, scripted actions. So we get a little bit of what we want without many of the downsides of, of other approaches. Where can I find out more? Last slide. Well, um, on the right-hand side of this uh, screen, you can see, see the Actions Registry. It's a simple website we've set up just to showcase the reusable actions we have. There's no um, information about the code there, but there are links back to the GitHub um, organization where all the code, as you'd expect, is uh, in the open for interrogation. We've also got some documentation about how you can write your own reusable actions within this, and we're looking to support others. We have, I think, one reusable action from outside the Open Safely uh, team, and there are several that have come from within the team, and we're always looking to expand upon them. Uh, I'm not sure if there is time for questions now or what my timing is, but if there isn't, then I'm more than happy to uh, speak to anyone who's interested about nerdy subjects like this well after. I feel like I'm in good company. Thanks all very much for your time and speak to you later, hopefully. Sure. Just I'm curious, is anybody using Open Safely at the moment who's not an academic? Oh yeah, great. Uh, two, three people. Okay, that's great. So that's good to know. And I think we're looking for more NHS analysts to use Open Safely more and more. So, so that's one of the kind of uh, um, cunning plans really is to expose the, uh, the trusted a research environment that the Bennett Institute colleagues have built. Okay, thanks very much. Can I ask our next speaker to come join me, please? Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Uh, only six slides left until coffee. You'll be pleased to know. Um, I am uh, Johnny Pearson. I'm the lead data scientist at the uh, we'll just change our name to the Digital Analytics and Research Team in NHS England. Um, we're formerly the Analytics Unit at NHS X, uh, which maybe is how some of you would know us. Uh, my job this morning is to talk about sharing in the open and generally to just infuse about why is, hello fly, um, about why is not the entire NHS constantly sharing in the open? Um, why is there not more code that I can access um, immediately from all these different people working, not just on R, but on different coding languages all across. Um, so we're going to have a look at that a bit today. Now, I was a bit worried over the past three presentations because uh, they're hitting on similar topics. Uh, I think you've left me enough room to uh, talk about this, but there may be some overlap. However, I think we're okay. Um, <clears throat> the reason that I'm interested in this is that as part of uh, the NHSX innovation Team, which is now this new one, DART, um, we were quite interested in setting up ways of working not just within the national teams, but also with trusts, ICSs, uh, and anyone else that we could. So we wanted to really focus on transparency and making reusable tools and supporting the system in building the analytics function. So I'm quite interested in transparency and open code. We've gone from the whole process of starting off with um, the first time that I was using GitHub was just to store some SQL code, and now we use it, um, not quite coding in the open completely, but we now put our projects up there as soon as we can um, for everyone to see and use, and we've got quite a few up there now. Uh, we've also gone from, yes, making the code open at the end, which is frankly quite a burdensome process, to now making it open as you go through. It's just much faster, much cleaner. Anyway, let's have a look at uh, these slides. First of all, what I'm talking about is not new. Um, let me point you to uh, Anna Shipman's work in 2018. So if you take one thing from this talk, take this link down at the bottom. Um, Anna and her team, uh, so Anna was the um, open source leader at GDS at the time, they've put a whole load of blogs out which talk about how to be sharing in the open. And in the middle there, there's a couple of things about uh, how you actually do it and the licensing. Uh, on the far right, you've got the benefits of doing it, and on this side, you've got some examples as well. And this is something which I really recommend reading through at some point. So, let's talk about why. You've already heard lots about why we should be doing good coding practice, why we should be sharing our code, and how great the community is. 
Uh, that fly is going to be really annoying. Um, however, if you need more of a mandate, um, then here are some documents. Firstly, Goldacre Review, we've already heard about from Jess. Um, but we've also got the service standard from gov.uk um, and the NHS service standard, which basically mirrors it. So in chapter 12 of both of those, you get the quotes that Jess brought up. Um, this one here, public services are built with public money. So unless there's a good reason not to, the code they're based on should be made available for other people to reuse and build on. And I think that's an excellent thing to be aware of uh, in all of our work. If you really want wider mandates, have a look at those last two links. The Open News Open Source from Gov UK is for entirety of Gov and public sector, or even bigger than that, the Open Data Charter, which um, international uh, various countries signed up to. Um, it was around COVID data sharing, really. But if you look at it, there's quite a strong push for sharing openly. Uh, in terms of all the different benefits, you're going to be well aware of these because you wouldn't be at this sort of event if you weren't. But let me just pick up uh, three of them. Better code, we've already heard a bit about that, but as soon as you start sharing your code, not only do you start to put in a bit more effort to uh, make it uh, structured and readable, but you also get some comments back. And trust me, this is a nice community to get comments back from. They are constructive. They are not people tearing down your code. They're people helping you uh, to give you some ideas of how to improve it. Um, less duplication. This, how many people in here, uh, rhetorical question, um, have a piece of code which applies NHS um, branding to uh, their charts? Or how many people have some SQL code which uh, calculates a very common metric? And these are just stored away somewhere. And yet, obviously, these sorts of things... Oh, another one, R markdown files. Automated R markdown files to create a set of slides for a stakeholder with some graphs in them. This is all across the NHS, and it's just massive amounts of duplication which just isn't needed. So, by sharing the code, less duplication. And then the other one which I really like is it attracts talent. So over the past two years, we as a team, as we've started to put our work out, we've been getting lots more interest from people who have all sorts of uh, experience in coding uh, analysis, who have seen our work and have come to us actually interested in trying to get a job. Or at interviews, you often hear that uh, the reason they've applied is because they've seen our work openly. Okay, so what stops us? Um, I'm going to go through some common things which I think stop people from sharing their code in the open. What I'd like is, if I don't pick up on something that stops you from coding, come and talk to me in the chat afterwards, and we'll see if we can actually address it and then get it out on the, um, our, on the our Slack group in terms of how we can address it. But I was thinking through a few different areas. The first one is uh, no one will be interested. Um, no, it's not. I must have skipped one. There we go. First one is my code isn't good enough. Um, most of us think this. Most of us think that um, we've made inefficient code, messy code. We've made code which um, is just all scrappy and it's got lots of duplications in. Frankly, that doesn't matter. Um, if you're getting your code out there, if you're starting to share it with people, your code will improve. Your code will slowly start to improve. And frankly, it's nonsense to think that our code isn't good enough, unless it is literally just masses of pieces of chunks of code with random comments that don't mean anything. Um, and you can't run the file at all, it just breaks. Okay, maybe keep that to yourself. But anything else, um, it's useful to see. It's useful to see someone's approach. I'll give you an example. Uh, it was about three years ago at this conference. Um, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning, but uh, there was uh, Tom Lawton put forward an RSIMA presentation and he put his code on GitHub for that. I was able to take that and it wasn't the cleanest code, um, but it was amazing for me to be able to have that example of how to approach the problem. And since then we've used RSIMA two or three times in our project and it's a, it's a powerful tool. And it's just because someone had the guts to put their code up online, even though it wasn't absolutely perfect. So let's remove that off the list. But the next one will be, no one will be interested. Um, most of this slide is based on a talk from Terence Eden uh, that he did a few years ago. And he made a good point where he said, it's not for us to decide if it's going to be, who's going to be interested in your work. I put out lots of work that I expect people to be interested in and get absolutely no response. So it might be vice versa. I might put the stuff that I don't put out is actually the stuff that might be interesting to people. There's, why not put it out? Why not see what uh, feedback you get if you put out just a bit of SQL code, uh, which has some metrics, or if you put out uh, your R code, which just creates 
a nice simple graph, you think that may be not be useful for people, that might really save someone half a day's work. So. And plus, most of the benefits are actually on the submitter. So the person who's putting the code up, you're the one that's getting the benefits in terms of making your code uh, uh, look better. You can come back to it in a month's time and it's perfectly ready for you rather than having that awkward situation that most of us will have had where we get asked what exact parameter do you use in that code and you're not quite sure which version was used. Having your code up and available, it just makes that all much easier. Okay, but then once you've decided, okay, maybe there is a reason for putting this code out, then you start to worry about your security. Uh, you start to work about, worry about hostile intentions in terms of hacking. Well, we're going to talk about security in a bit. Uh, I've put there most hacks are on vulnerabilities of closed software. That is debatable, um, but certainly it's not. Open software is not hacked more than closed software. Um, we, we don't see that. Usually, if there is an issue with open source software, it is addressed in the open um, quickly, uh, whereas closed software can be hidden for quite a long time um, until the problem is sorted. So in some ways, it's that security. This is one of the points that uh, Jess Moore makes. Security by just hiding what you're doing is not real security. OK, we'll come back to security again, though. What about abuse by external users with good intentions? So people who come in and mess up your code, or more worryingly, people who use your code um, for the wrong reasons. They take a piece of regression analysis, and they decide to apply it to a multivariate problem when it wasn't made for that. Wow. Um, well, firstly, in terms of people messing with your code, a good, get, a, a good branching strategy is um, something that's very useful, and that allows you to control how people um, add parts to your code. Uh, and then having clear licenses, having clear intention of use, uh, having clear documentation, uh, and having things such as model cards is a, another idea. These can all stop people using your code uh, in a poor way. Accidental publication of sensitive information. So obviously the big worry for lots of us, well firstly we heard from uh, Jess that um, open code is different from open data. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting you put data and share it out openly, not at all. Share the code, share the methods, share the techniques, as long as there's no policy in there, but don't share the code. However, we need to assume that there will be uh, a sensitivity leak at some point. You should be assuming this about your work anyway. Anyone that works with data should already assume that it will be leaked by leaving a laptop on a train, by sending stuff over email by mistake, whatever it might be. So you should already have policies in place to have an IG escalation for leaked data, and it's just the same thing. What we need to do is address the level of risk. So the level of risk should be relative to the likelihood and the impact, as we all know. So apply that to the same when you're sharing code in the open. If you've got code which is working on personal identifiable information and you think there's a high risk, fine, don't share it, keep it. But if you're working on essentially aggregate data and you're just uh, visualizing it, then why not? It could be very useful. Uh, it'll take too long. No, it won't. Uh, the benefits are higher than uh, the cost and uh, the more you do it, the faster it gets. As I said before, our, our progress has gone from opening it at the end which is quite intensive because you have to go back through everything and you start thinking about now we're talking about opening from the beginning it's much easier you're doing it from the off um, and it's much faster current it infrastructure doesn't allow me to share you, you may be in a situation where you don't have uh, ability to push pull you don't have ability to version control fair point that is a blocker i'll come back to it okay next slide what do I need to know? What do I need to have in place? Um, so these are the things which I think are required and are useful when you are coming to code in the open. Um, one of my colleagues likes to say, why should I care or when should I care, more to the point, about applying different best practice, about um, really sort of reading up on a subject. When should I care? Well, I'm saying that we need to have at least an awareness of all of the required sections. You don't have to be an expert in it but you need awareness of all of those um, in order to do this. So the first one, right, so understanding of sensitive data. This is not just secret, top secret information. Um, it's also the credentials, it's the keys, it's the connection strings. Um, so you're not just looking for, have I got any data in there? You're also looking for, have I got any IDs, any SQL database connections, any uh, Azure tokens stashed in there as well. 
as I said, ideally you don't have any data stored in there, but if you did for some reason have some data, you will need written permission alongside that data. Just to state that there, I don't know why I've put it there. Um, where do you need to look? Well, don't just look in your code. You also need to be looking in your Git messages and you need to be looking in uh, your Jupyter Notebook outputs, sorry, your Markdown um, outputs. Uh, you need to be looking in your graphs. I have made a mistake and I've been picked up on it that I put some information out where literally in the graph title uh, was not sensitive, but just slightly provocative uh, information. So we had to withdraw that. So do look at the outputs as well as your code. Um, version control, um, it's already been uh, mentioned in terms of, um, Heather mentioned organizing your repos. Um, I would say consider looking at this link, link for the government uh, cookie cutter because this is a nice way of structuring your code. And uh, Ian already mentioned uh, versioning. I quite like semantic versioning. Do consider using that. But this whole area, what you need to be aware of is how can I start to have people interact with my code in clear ways? How can I have a branching strategy, version control, ways of setting up my projects that make it clear for anyone using it? As we go on to peer review, this isn't just about quality assurance and accountability, it's also about knowledge sharing. And the, the only thing that I really want to point out here is don't just be ready to put quality assurance in your, your code in terms of when am I going to do it in the project. Be ready to do quality assurance for each other. You need to be ready for people to ask you to do it and give half day, two days, a whole week to quality assuring other people's work. You will get the benefit from learning what they've done with the code, but you need to be ready for that, those sorts of activities to build that knowledge sharing um, activity. It's pointless everyone asking for QA and no one offering it. If you are doing QA, I'd recommend using uh, that quality assurance um, checker. It's a nice list. Uh, it's, it's a good one to, do, to go through and that's endorsed by GSS. Okay, licenses. I'm just going to check the time. I've got four minutes. Excellent. Um, licenses, I would point you to our open um, source policy, which you can find on the NHS X GitHub website at the moment in its draft form. And there it talks about different, policy, uh, different licenses that you can use. Um, MIT license, many people have come across the default, really. It just um, it makes unrestricted use, but it protects you from liability. Um, the Apache license, that second one there, that's the one to use if there is any regulation needed. You will obviously need all the legal statements alongside it, any MHRA stuff, but the Apache ones that, get, that can be used alongside that. Uh, the GNU one, that GPL version 3, um, that's about if you want to prevent it being sold back to the NHS in some way. So if you want to prevent closed um, reuse of the code. Um, and then for documentation, have a look at the uh, open government free license there as well. So you need to be aware of at least that these things exist and when and which ones to apply. You don't need to know every single legal detail in them. Okay, understanding of security considerations. Opening the code early will help because you start doing the best practices from the beginning and you, you don't start putting stuff out which you then have to go back and, and review later. Um, set way of managing your pull requests. There's, there's an article from the GDS that I'm gonna point you to there. But then the keys, the key thing is if you're using third party tools to store or move data for some reason, you need to get it checked off uh, against that NCS, NCSC um, list there. But we don't often do that, so just be aware of that. And the last one is the point that I really want to pick up on here. Ensure that the libraries that you're using are reputable. So this is called CVE checks. Um, this is the idea that if you, um, if, if you're using someone's library for a one-off piece of work, then it's, it's sort of fine. But if you're using it regularly, you need to know, is the library being maintained? Does the development team have support? Or is it one individual in a university that when they finish their PhD, they'll stop supporting it? it are there regular updates um, on that um, repository to show that it is being kept up to date? These are the sorts of things which we need to start thinking about a bit more, rather than just using whatever package seems to work at the time. IG escalation, as I said, you should already have roots for doing this and it's just to be aware of what the IG escalation is. But again, you do need to know who is the contact route for that. And I'm gonna speed through these last bits, um, although I can't because this is the key one. This is your IT. So if you're having problems with your um, IT suppliers in terms of getting the right sort of software, you are not alone. Uh, there is 
There are lots of considerations which are needed in this area. Last year, I worked with a cybersecurity company to try and come up with a solution, something that would say, this is the way that you would structure this and work with an IT provider to create Git, GitHub, R tooling uh, on any NHS infrastructure. Turned out it was impossible, I'm afraid to say. What they were recommending was that you either need a completely separate dev environment with gateways and assurance principles, or you need to go through the process of working with your IT. And the way that that is, is we need to understand that our IT providers um, are not stopping us. They are instead, they're being asked to do something which is odd for them. It would be similar to someone, a policy colleague to come to yourselves and ask for you to do a correlation using not Spearman's or Pearson's, but to use Williamson's something you've never heard of, because I've just made it up. Um, you would not do that because you'd say there's already Pearsons or Spearmans available. These are proven. Why would we ever use Williams? This is the situation we're putting our IT departments in. So what we need to do instead is we need to approach them with the why first, not the what. We need to say, I'm, I want to use Williamson's because it deals with X in a better way. And this is the proof for it. Essentially, think of your IT department as skeptics where the burden of proof is on ourselves. And as we start to address that, we'll, we'll stop agonizing that we can't get the software that we want and we'll start to work with IT departments to, to build it. We have things like the Goldacre Review to help us in terms of the mandate for this. Now we need to start a stepwise approach to get that in place. So start with the basics of why do I want to use it? What's the use case? Has this been requested before and where? And then move on to talk about how am I gonna test it and quality assure it? Don't just assume because it's on CRAN that you can therefore use it. How are we going to test it ourselves? What quality assurance steps? What mark of success are we going to put in it? It's these sorts of wording, these statements that will make your IT departments really start to trust that you can uh, implement a piece of software. So if you are struggling with that, um, I have written a blog um, on it on our internal site and I can point you to that at some point. Okay, I don't have time for these, but I'm going to skip the community ones because you're here, so it's useful to have this community. In terms of projects, um, here are some suggestions of different projects which I think are excellent starter projects for sharing in the open because it's public data and it's um, methods which are well established, so they're not going to be controversial, but they are useful for business. Have a look at those afterwards. And if you need more data sources, there's a whole variety of open data sources that you can use. Um, some are text, some are images, some are structured. Um, and again, use these to do your training, to be sharing methods. Even if it's a method which is built on sensitive data in the trust, use one of these to then make it shareable um, and so that other people can then see your method. Um, and then you just swap in the data in and out, but using the same code. Okay, sorry about that. Yes, okay, in that case, um, here is an open code checklist. This is the this, have a look at that. This summarizes everything that I've just been talking about in a checklist. It's what we use in our team to get things through the door. And let me just advertise Helen Richardson's uh, introduction to Git and GitHub uh, workshop, which is coming up, as well as the Git training materials on the NHSR GitHub. And I don't have time for that, but please look at one of our examples where we have shared some of our code. And here are some different ways of um, making it clear how to use that code. Uh, and hopefully, um, if you're interested in seeing that, Paul Carroll will be talking about that later on today. If you're interested in talking about how we actually shared it appropriately, come and talk to me in the break. That's Thank great. you, Mohammed. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. <laughs> so lots of food for thought and also time for caffeine. Good morning, everybody. If I could encourage you back to your seats, we're gonna start again with the next session. It's good to see so many people here this morning. We've got quite a lot of people online as well. Um, so that's really encouraging. It's nice to see us able to make the hybrid thing work. Uh, and so we're grateful to all of you for either logging on or joining us here today. We've got another session kicking off now. Uh, we'll run until about one o'clock and we've got several speakers and we've got a bit of a focus on uh, things to do with activity, capacity, waiting list, A&E, uh, modeling and simulation work. 
I'd also like to encourage you, just as we're about to kick off again, if you're using social media, let's say if you're on Twitter, uh, I'd encourage you to use the uh, hashtag for uh, hash NHSRConf22. And if you're part of our Slack community, do jump onto Slack and do um, get involved in the conf channel uh, and carry on the conversation there. So I'll uh, introduce our first speaker. Well, I'm going to actually ask the speakers to introduce themselves as they start, but I'll, I'll hand over to our first speaker. Thanks. Good morning. Um, my name is Stephen Wyatt. I work at the Strategy Unit. I'm an analyst. I work with Mohammed and Peter, you met this morning. Um, and I'm going to talk about a project that we've been working on with the new hospitals program team at the Department of Health and Social Care. It's a project that I've been deeply involved in, but it's Tom Jemmett who's here somewhere in the audience. There is Tom. He's our lead analyst, lead developer on the program. So this is the question the model's are seeking to address. Um, how much and what types of activity might a hospital need to support or undertake or accommodate at some point, some agreed point in the future? So it's a difficult question. Um, it's clear why the new hospitals program team are keen to answer this question. They need to be able to design and size hospitals in the future to meet demand at that point without unduly oversizing those hospitals. But it's a question that's routinely asked outside of new hospital build programs as well as part of routine planning processes within the NHS. And so when we're developing the model, we're keen to make sure that the the work we're doing is as usable in those alternative settings, not just within the context of new hospital build programs. It's a planning problem, not a forecasting problem. Health systems hope to be able to influence and the quantity and types of activity they might deliver in the future. They might hope that they can influence demand for care at some points in the future. And it's a complicated question in the sense that it's difficult to get a handle on this in confidence or with confidence at some point in the future. We have to recognize that we, the answers we get from these models should, should recognize the inherent uncertainty at play in this question. So before we did any work on the model, we did a bit of a review of existing models that were out there. Um, there are lots of models. Um, some of those developed by NHS teams within NHS trusts or, or, or CCGs and ICBs. Many of those delivered by consultancy firms. They don't tend to be delivered as products themselves, they're, they're, they're wrapped inside consultancy offers. And most of those models are very similar. Um, but there are sufficient differences between them to make it almost impossible to compare the results of two different models to work out whether the difference we're seeing across two models are to do with the methodological differences or the assumptions that are made in those models. There's lots of repetition and duplication in that process. And it seems to us at least that methodological progress is fairly slow. The models that we see today being deployed for new hospital program build, uh, new hospital build programs are much the same as we saw 20 or 30 years ago. And, and the key problem seems to be there's no base for us to build on. The learning and expertise that a trust gathers when it's, when it's developing these sorts of models is, is contained within that trust. It, the models they build tend to be very bespoke to the trust's particular environment and circumstances, and translation of those model uh, uh, methodologies to other, to other contexts is more difficult. And the private sector models, the consultancy firms that offer these models, obviously there's some sort of commercial disincentive to sharing code for those models. And so we've got no base to build on, and that was another thing we wanted to try and address with this, this piece of work. Just a few things we found when we were looking at models that other people have produced, including models we've produced in the past ourselves for other, for, in other circumstances, when looking at this particular question of um, anticipating activity over the long term. Very few of them explicitly handled the question of uncertainty. Most of them will give you a point estimate of A&E attendances, for example, at some point in the future, but we know we can't predict A&E attendances with confidence at some point in the future. We have to recognize the uncertainty inherent in the question. Most of the models tend to aggregate the, the data before they're brought into the model, maybe by point of delivery or specialty, age group, for example. And that's to make the processing of the data simpler. Um, and you know, 20 or 30 years ago, that might have been fine when processing costs were very high. But these days, that shouldn't be a barrier. 
And then by aggregating data early on in the, the, the modeling process, you limit the amount of flexibility you have to explore the results at a later stage. And we see poor coverage of certain change factors. So most of the models will deal with demographic changes. Uh, they will deal with um, the impact, for example, uh, of changes in occupancy rates or of waiting list initiatives. But very few of the models will deal with a deliberate attempts to, to uh, offset inequities in baseline and service provision. Very few of the models will deal with changes in age-specific health states of the population, for example. So I'm going to describe the sort of conceptual model now to talk you through how we think about the model. It's also the way we describe it and take users through the model when they're using it. And it's also the way the code is structured and organized. So we start by um, ingesting some information about activity that's taking place in the hospital at a baseline year and some information about the capacity that the hospital has to deliver that activity. And we do that with, well, with minimal or in some cases no aggregation to keep open the flexibility to manage the data and to make the results as, 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 uh, as open as possible to interrogation at the end. Then we subject the model to a series of changes, uh, the data to a series of changes, which reflect either uh, imbalances at baseline between need and demand and supply, or to reflect changes we anticipate in, uh, in, in factors that might influence demand over the medium term. So the first set of changes are to do with demand supply imbalances at baseline. So we know that most hospitals at the moment are struggling to keep pace with demand and we don't want to carry forward those imbalances through our model to future years. We want to correct for them at the beginning of the model. So we think about people that might be waiting unnecessarily longly uh, for a necessary duration of time, uh, people who might have to travel further than they might want to, people who might, uh, for example, uh, pay privately for care when they would prefer to receive it on the NHS. And we make corrections to the data to adjust for those, for those imbalances. The next set of changes we think about are need supply imbalances. This is where patients aren't receiving care at all for the, for the conditions they need, when care falls short of nice recommended guidelines, when there are systematic inequities in access to care, for example. Or where, for example, thresholds are introduced to deal with the fact that there may be shortfalls in, in, in funding in a given year for a particular service. Then we think about the changes, the various factors that might be at play over the next few years that might influence demand or need for services. We think about demographic changes, uh, changes in the population size, changes in population age and sex profile, changes in age-specific health status, whether, for example, an 80-year-old in the future might be healthier or less healthy than our average 80-year-old might be today. Then we think about non-demographic factors, the development of new medical technologies and the rollout of those technologies, changes in clinical standards that might take place in the next few years, changes in patient expectations, for example. And then we apply a set, further set of changes to take account of activity mitigators. These are strategies that trusts adopt to, to try and avoid activity coming into hospital in the first place, maybe to deal with it in community settings, uh, or to deal with activity that's coming into, a tr into the trust in a more efficient manner in the future, reducing the length of stay for certain procedures, and maybe dealing with some activity remotely rather than face-to-face. -face. At that, that stage, we have some detailed model future activity in the same level of detail as our, as our input data. Uh, we produce some standard outputs from those that trusts might want to use, uh, cuts of data by specialty or age group or uh, point of delivery, for example. But the detailed data here, record level data here, is, is available for, for individuals to interrogate should they want to. If they want, for example, to look at the age profile of stroke patients in 2025, for example, or to look at, um, I don't know, the, the, the daily distribution of COPD admissions. We do one final set of changes, which takes account of changes in resource use. Uh, so increases in or decreases in occupancy rates or theater utilization rates. And then we're able to estimate um, the future model capacity for the trust. So that's, our, that's the overview of the model. That's how it works in principle. Um, there are two challenges for the model. The first is how to model those individual changes, each of those orange boxes. How do we encode those changes and capture those appropriately? Uh, that's a challenge for us as the, the, the coders. Um, the, the second challenge is how much change to model. How do you parameterize the model? How do you indicate how much of these changes might take place in the next few years? And that's a problem for the user. It's a difficult challenge for the user, but it is the challenge they've got. 
Uh, but we do give some information to guide users through that process. So, for example, if, if, if the trust was trying to estimate what proportion of falls related admissions they might avoid in the future, we were able to provide information about the trend in admissions of that type, how their trust compares with other trusts on, on admissions of that sort. Um, and we also don't expect the user to give us a point estimate of these parameters. We recognize that they won't know the answer to these questions with certainty, so we ask for a, a, an interval that recognizes their uncertainty with, with, with the question at hand, a distribution of possible parameters. So there's two ways in which the model can be used. Um, first of all, in a sort of deterministic mode, uh, we take in the model inputs, the baseline activity uh, and capacity, and we take a set of uh, parameters from the user. I've suggested here there are four, but there aren't. There are many, many more parameters in the model. Uh, they get passed to the model engine, um, and then a series of outputs are produced. These are entirely determined by the input values and the parameter values. And a user might want to change one of those values and see how the model outputs change effectively as a result. Um, there is a second way to use the model, which we think is much more useful, and that's in its stochastic mode. So here, we're not taking point estimates of the parameters from a user. We're asking the user to give us distributions that recognize their uncertainty in predicting how some things might play out in the future. A distribution, for example, for how age-specific health status might change over the next few years. A distribution for, I don't know, how, how length of stay for stroke patients might change in the future. Uh, and we sample from those distributions, pass that to the model, uh, and the model will produce a set of modeled outputs. So that's one potential future, sampling at random from the various distributions the, that the user has given us. And then we sample again from that, those distributions, produce a second modeled future, and again, we sample again. And we would do that roughly 200 times. The, the model will deal, allow us to run as many model runs as we want, but roughly 200 times, each time producing a different perspective on the future for that hospital. And then we bring all those potential futures together to show uh, what the distribution of possible futures might be. So the model might suggest that, on average, the hospital might need 750 beds, but sometimes, under some circumstances, and we can quantify how often, you might need 720 beds or 780 beds. And providing information about the uncertainty with these estimates, I think, is a crucial part of this modeling challenge. So a bit about the data science behind it. This is where, if you want to ask any question, Tom's your man during the breaks. All the code's currently on GitHub. It's in a private repository, but the plan is to make it public in the near future. Uh, the code is written in R, Python, and Transact SQL. It's hosted on Microsoft Azure. The model user interface is delivered via R Studio Connect. And the raw data we're using at the moment, most of the core data about uh, hospital activity is hospital episode statistics, but it could easily be transformed to, so it, it, the, the model would use SUS data instead. And I won't run through these figures on the right, but it's a substantial data handling challenge which Tom has managed to engineer really successfully. So this is the model I taught you through earlier. Um, we've been working through each of those orange boxes, trying to work out how to, uh, how to encode each of those changes. This is the coverage we've managed to get so far. Uh, in some cases, we're really pleased with the way we've managed to encode some of these modeling changes. In other cases, we've got something that's a kind of a holding space, a rough and ready approach that we hope others might build on and develop in future. Uh, and we really would like um, at some point for this model to be something that's owned collaboratively by the NHS community, each people contributing ideas and thoughts about how we might improve the model. Uh, so when there's expertise, for example, in a particular aspect of the modeling process, how we might, for example, model private healthcare dynamics, then somebody with expertise in that area might be able to contribute to the model, contribute code or ideas to the model so that we can incorporate that thinking in the future. So where are we at the moment? Well, we've released two versions of the model to the new hospitals program team. They're using it um, in trial runs with various hospitals that are going through the new hospitals program. And we want to make further releases available, ticking off more of those orange boxes over the next three to six months. Um, we're in discussions with NHS England about whether we might find a way of using the model in more general planning, hospital planning context rather than just within the new hospitals program. And we'd really like to run a further session where Tom might take people, th those who are interested, through the detail of the model, the code and the infrastructure and the architecture of the model. That's everything from me. Um, happy to answer questions now, or if, if you want to find us during the breaks, we're happy to. Tom is your man if you want technical stuff. Paul's the person in the audience somewhere, 
There's Paul, who knows all the, the adjustments we made around demography and age specific health status. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we won't have any time for questions right now, but do uh, find the people who just raise their hands uh, or Stephen in the breaks um, or contact them uh, via Slack or after the session if you've got any, uh, any more questions. If we could ask for our next speaker, please. Right, uh, yep, this is working. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll get straight into it. Um, oh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, what's it called? The slides uh, pointer, is, uh, is that there? Or was it left on the, oh no, is, is this it? Wow, that's really chunky. That's massive. I haven't seen one of these that day. All right, so I'll get straight into it then. So um, um, elective waiting list size. So this is the number on the elective waiting list. You'd probably be familiar with these figures. By the way, I just realized this morning that I'd done this in Excel. Um, so I probably lost all credibility there from the, I didn't even cut, cut, you know, cut, cut it and paste it. I actually had the data and I, I did it in Excel instead of an R. So um, yeah, bad move coming to an R conference with that. Anyway, um, so what we've got, we've seen the problem has been here for a long, long time since the record started um, uh, about 2005, 2006. The waiting list in England, this is, has been slowly getting up, uh, increasing. And about, um, probably around 2015, I think it was, that's when the performance measured in 18 weeks, so the 92% 18-week target for referral to treatment RTT, that started slipping below the well, the 92% constitutional target. So you've got the waiting list size, you've also got performance in terms of that uh, percentage of open pathways waiting, uh, uh, currently waiting within that 18 week standard. So what we've seen then, so the pandemic um, around here, so initial drop, um, that's because both the, uh, the, yes, the capacity was, was reduced, but also the demand reduced. We didn't see as many uh, referrals coming in. Um, then the capacity was constrained over uh, over the last couple of years um, for doing elective work. So the consequence of that being an increase in the waiting list size, up to where we are now, um, uh, where it's just I think um, figures are released second Thursday of every month. So uh, last Thursday it's gone up to 7.1 million. That was on the September data. So a huge increase um, um, uh, from from where we were a couple of years ago. So we can look at these dynamics, um, and I wasn't the first to do this in terms of an, an analogy around a bathtub. So we've got GP referrals kind of coming in. We've got kind of the plug hole diameter, if you like, being the capacity, the treatments flowing through that. The waiting list size is essentially the level of the water. Uh, and something I added to this was thinking about the uh, performance in terms of that waiting time, the 18 week, 92%, in terms of the temperature, you know, the longer it takes to go down, the cooler it will get, uh, the worse the performance. So we can model this. Um, uh, uh, in, Stephen was just saying about this kind of stuff. This is simulation where you're just basically taking multiple different random number drawers from sampling from distributions. You can loop over replications, loop over the time steps. This is a, a discrete time step model. Um, over each of the days, you've got your clock starts, which is the referrals, you've got your clock stops, which is the capacity, the treatments, and then you collect your performance measures, and then you aggregate the results across all of those many replications and derive your summary measures. So we've done lots of this before. We've, this is um, some couple of papers that we did before COVID that we've also done locally in the Bristol North Somerset South Gloucestershire system, which is where I work. Um, so we can look at various scenarios involving demand and capacity and how waiting list size and the RTT 18 week performance will vary on the back of those. And we've also done this at the start of the pandemic to say, well, given various scenarios, again, involving different demand and capacity profiles, what would happen to waiting list size, what would happen to RTT performance uh, as we recover? Um, and this was some more recent work, actually. So we looked here, we extended the bathtub model here. The introduction here is of reneging, or rot as it's sometimes called in NHS. So that's removals other than treatment. So as the waiting time gets prohibitively large, patients will go private, they might die, they might become inoperable, they might even get better. So that's kind of here the overflow, if you like, in the bathtub uh, analogy. So we had some pretty pessimistic scenarios here, actually. If 75% of the missed referrals, the 7 million missed referrals returned uh, uh, during, uh, immediately after the pandemic, then we, we, we estimated that the waiting list could double. Actually, not many of those 7 million seems like they have, it seems like they have returned. So it's, it's very interesting why that's, uh, 
know what's happened. Um, but this kind of simulation model is uh, quite onerous in terms of calibration, in terms of uh, runtime, etc. Um, so we can only use it really one instance at a time. So we've calibrated it for our local system. We've also looked, as I've said, for the England results there. Um, it's not scalable then, really. So a scalable solution, I'd say in this case, would be one that is able to be applied on mass for all hospital trusts, for all specialties on a monthly basis. That would be great because then we've got it scaling up and we reduce the need to duplicate any of this work in other trusts or, or whatever. Um, so that's the aim then, a uh, simple and scalable model for the waiting list problem. So what we've got here then, this is the waiting list, and we can see this basically as, in a very simple case, you've got referrals coming in, you've got treatments coming out, which is, it's, which is modeled by the capacity, um, constrained by the capacity, I should say, and then you've got renegs, which is that rot, so the removals other than treatment, patients who are seeing their waiting time increase and do something else, they leave the waiting list. Um, so yes, we've got a current referral rate, a referral rate growth that we can model there, capacity, capacity growth, and the proportion of patients that would renege, got a little parameter there that we can vary. Um, so essentially, we can construct this as a differential equation at the bottom there, and we can solve that. Uh, next slide. Right, so the solution, you can go for the algebra, basically it comes out as this. So this is the uh, waiting list time at time t as a function of all of those various parameters. Um, so coded that up uh, in, into an R script, and this is just an example for one of our local trusts in, uh, in, in, in North Bristol Trust, NBT, um, which is a, a very large hospital trust. Um, so basically, we can, we, we can scale this up over all of the different specialties within that hospital, so the total there, cardiology, dermatology, and so on. Um, and uh, what have I put here? Um, right, yes, the model fitted to recent data, so that's the gray areas because we don't want to fit too far back, um, and, uh, and producing the future waiting list size at specialty level based upon a variety of various scenarios in terms of annual referral growth, 0%, 1%, 5%, and annual capacity growth, 0%, 5%, and 10%. And as you can see, the ones with the most pessimistic ones, i.e. the ones with the waiting list going up, are the ones solid line, which is 0% capacity growth, red line, which is 5% referral growth, so more referrals and, and stagnant capacity. Um, so the utility of this then is provides a do-nothing assessment of future waiting list size, assuming no changes to capacity uh, and according to various uh, different uh, demand rates. Um, so modeling of additional capacity allows consideration of the resources required to recover waiting lists within given time scales. So for instance, you could see, um, let's just pick one, uh, well the dash line hasn't quite come out here actually, but you can see here that if that's, that dash line represents basically the period before COVID, and you can see here, well, if you had only 1% referral growth and you would need 5% capacity growth in order to recover on that dashed line within about four years. So that's kind of how you can use the outputs of this to explore different scenarios. And of course, you can use the code to configure your own bespoke scenarios involving different rates of demand and capacity. Um, projections are also useful for long-term planning, helping to understand which specialties could be prioritised for additional capacity. Some of the work we're doing at the moment is actually looking at the extra activity utilisation whilst patients are on a waiting list. And there's differences between clinical specialties there. So patients on some waiting lists, as a proxy measure for harm, perhaps could be consuming more activity than patients on other waiting lists. So is there some optimization to be done around uh, which capacities we uh, uh, um, choose to expand for different specialties? Um, so we've got this in a, in a, in a, in a GitHub repository here um, on, on uh, that address. Um, so every month we update this with the latest data for all hospital trusts, for specialties, and as I said, on a, on a monthly basis there around mid, mid of the month. Um, now I must credit um, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Nick Howlett, who's, who's basically the input data for this comes from NHS uh, England, who release this second Thursday of each month. And we've, uh, we've, 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 we've got here a, a scraper that basically scrapes that data, puts into a minimum calculation data set that the model is then kind of run on essentially, and uh, uh, produces then the um, outputs that we put up on GitHub and use locally as well. Um, and he's also, uh, Nick's actually also put together this little, um, these nice GIFs as well that we include on the repository. Again, for each trust in the country where basically we've just got the specialties. You can see here, actually, over time, it's quite interesting. This is the waiting list shape. These are all the waiting list shapes. 
And you can see here, for instance, trauma orthopedics, you can see how each month goes by the shapes kind of the bulge moves down and gets get, these are patients waiting progressively longer and longer um, uh, uh, for their treatment. Um, so that's it. Thanks so much. Um, we got uh, that's the link. That's um, some paper references um, uh, for this for this work. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we do have time for a question. If there's any burning questions, oh, I can see a hand at the back just there. Is there a microphone we can get to that and to the back? Um, hi Richard, That's, uh, thanks for the talk, really interesting. With the model that you've created, have you modelled in the impact of a, say, a future COVID pandemic or sort of people deteriorating or anything like that? Uh, not, not, not in this. This is a, uh, there's a uh, restrictions to the model in terms of to rely on that simple differential equation solution there. We have to assume only demand and capacity in terms of those linear terms. So as in, we've got an initial amount and then we've got a linear growth rate for either. So, um, so you, can, you could kind of use that to, uh, in a bespoke way to kind of um, uh, uh, model some certain scenarios like you mentioned. But at the moment it's constrained and I'd be grateful for any, if, if anyone's keen to kind of collaborate on uh, being able to relax those constraints, make the model a bit more uh, versatile to be able to considering those kind of scenarios, um, that would be a useful next step probably. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, shall we move on to our next speaker now? I now feel a bit small by comparison to Pythia herself, but hello everyone, I'm Chris Redding, I'm an information specialist from Worcestershire Acute uh, at NHS Trust, and I'm here to talk to you about a very similar topic to Richard, who's kind of stolen a bit of my thunder in terms of explaining the context of RTT, that saves me a bit of work. So I'm here to talk about our discrete event simulation model that we've built for RTT waiting list modelling, which is personified by Pythia, who is kind of part our model mascot and part my uh, analytical spirit guide. So in terms of the problem that we've been facing as an acute trust, it's the same problem that every other trust has been facing since COVID. Uh, I don't need to go into detail, thanks to Richard, about what the referral to treatment target standard is. But yes, we need to try and see 92% of our patients within 18 weeks of referral. Um, unfortunately, compared to pre-COVID, where a patient waiting perhaps 52 weeks was an ever event, post-COVID, we've had a situation whereby patients have been waiting sometimes 78 weeks, and in a number of instances, over 104 weeks. So two years from referral and still aren't being had their first definitive treatment. And alongside that, as you can see from the top chart, which fairly accurately reflects the overall national position that Richard showed. As a trust, our waiting list has gone from circa 35, 36,000 patients a month to now well in excess of 60,000 patients, and it's showing no signs of slowing down anytime soon. Um, so part of what we've needed to do both within the trust for managing uh, optimum services for our patients and to support feeding back to our ICS colleagues and uh, the national NHS England teams is to try and accurately predict the behaviour of our waiting lists over time, which means modelling a number of interconnected metrics. So as we've got here, we've got the total waiting list size, the number of long waiter breaches, whether that's 78 or 104, uh, our 18 week performance percentage, and how many people we've got coming into and out of the system. Once upon a time, we attempted to do this using a network of Excel spreadsheets, which Pythia is kindly juggling there. Uh, they produced fixed point forecasts and they were set up to model specific individual aspects of the RTT pathway. So we might have a model for 18 week performance or a model for total waiting list size or a model for 52 week breaches. And they didn't always, or often at all, actually interconnect and reflect the holistic nature of the system. That These are all metrics that are coming out of one waiting list. Um, and they didn't take into account 
that scenarios that you might implement to improve your overall waiting list size are actually going to have an impact on your performance percentage or your long waiters. And seeing that holistic picture was something that we weren't providing. We started trying to do better a couple of years ago. Uh, my initial effort was to try and do some kind of iterative waiting list model in SQL, which I very quickly regretted. It was a more painful experience than listening to my husband sing and he can't carry a tune with a bucket. Um, around the time of which I came to the 2019 NHSR conference, which was a couple of months after I was chosen as the sacrifice for my department to go off and learn R. Uh, and I saw Tom Lawton's fantastic NHSR conference presentation about using SIMA to model an IC unit. And I thought, ah, that's what I've stupidly been trying to do in SQL. Um, so I began reading around SIMA and what could be done with it. Um, and I had a complete nerdy fanboy moment when watching the uh, virtual conference last week, seeing the presentation from uh, Inaki Unkar who'd built the SIMA package. So I properly nerded out then. Um, so we decided to go down the SIMA route. Um, we began to see that in building this kind of model, we've got a lot of elements coming together, which is encapsulated by the flow diagram that sits on the front of Pythia. So we've got a model that has to take into account three things. A, demand, so our forecast clock starts. Our forecast activity, which is derived from our annual plans. We're moving towards linking that directly to capacity, but at the time we initially built Pythia, all we had were our actual activity plans. So assuming that things like underutilization DNAs had already built in, we are currently trying to move away from that. Uh, and the really complicated element is treatment pathways. We don't as a trust have documented on a piece of paper or electronically somewhere, a patient who was referred to trauma and orthopedics needs to go for a new outpatient appointment. They'll then be sent for an x-ray. They'll then go to a follow-up appointment. Then they might go to an inpatient day case and eventually something will happen that stops the clock. So we needed a way to actually derive those treatment pathways from the activity that we've been doing and actual real patient journeys in the past which is where Pythia was kind of born. So we knew that all of those elements needed to come together for effectively what we were building was a modular tool for all of our activity and waiting list modeling and planning for the trust. Um, it's at the moment in its third iteration for the RTT module. We kind of went a bit uh, cart before horse in developing our RTT module before our now overall capacity module that we're working on, but that's the way these things happen organically. Um, but yes, we are on to the third iteration. We've used it in a couple of annual planning rounds so far, which during COVID went from rather than being a 12-month exercise to a six-month exercise because of how frequently things were changing. Um, we've got a shiny developed user interface. At the moment, it's more of our information team using it and being able to access the model without knowing code. But ideally, in the future, we want service users to actually be directly engaging with the model and exploring scenarios and what-if type questions. Um, and as I mentioned, we're currently developing a capacity planning module that will feed into uh, the element of Pythia where we previously relied on activity plans. Why Pythia is the question that everyone inevitably asks me when I start presenting the model. Um, I feel like a lot of my work at the information department involves sitting there with a crystal ball like Mystic Meg being asked to predict the future. Um, and when I sat down and tried to come up with an acronym type name that included RTT, discrete event simulation, waiting list modeling, I realized very quickly I wasn't going to be scoring very highly in Scrabble. So that was when I did some Googling on famous soothsayers and oracles. And that led me to this image of the Pythia, who was the high priestess of the Temple of Apollo in ancient Delphi. So she's kind of become our oracle mascot going forward for predicting things in the information team at Worcester. So in terms of what Pythia is and how it works, it's a stochastic discrete event simulation model and it's built using the fantastic SIMA package. So we model every individual patient, either actual currently on our waiting list or theoretical going to be referred to us during the forecast window at individual patient level through all of the events that we think they should have to go through between a clock start and a clock stop. Um, it combines a number of elements, so forecasting what those clock starts are going to be during the period, deriving treatment pathways from actual historic patient journeys so that we can assess what we think patients will actually need, uh, and then feeding it into the SIMA model itself at specialty level, and within specialty level we go down to urgency granularity, so what will our cancer behaviour be compared to urgent or routine? Is it different if it's a brand new referral of a patient to the trust or a patient we've known previously who might already have gone through some pre-active monitoring type care? 
This is an example of one of those derived treatment pathways. So this is actually looking at, I think it was an ENT routine <laughs> referral. So deriving from our historic actual activity, a sample of patients who are going to have entered the system, they'll then proceed through a series of nodes to either outpatient new or follow-up activity or inpatient elective or day case activity. And they eventually reach one of the red nodes, which is either a treatment clock stop or a rot clock stop, so any reason other than treatment that actually means a patient leaves our waiting list. And through each of those nodes, we then extract what the probability was of a patient going down that route. Um, anyone who's used the SIMA package before should be aware of the fact that it relies on what are called trajectories. Let's say a person entering a system needs to use this resource at this time, they'll hold on to it for so long, and then they'll move on to the next resource that they need or leave the system. Now, with nearly 40 specialties and a granularity of potentially six cohorts per specialty, we were looking at a huge number of those trajectories to hard code into the model, which was why instead we had to come up with a way of extracting that from our actual patient activity and deriving it into a set of instructions using a complex parsing method that SIMA can actually then natively understand. Um, so the model is stochastic, so when each patient enters the model, they go through a series of random dice rolls, which then guides them through the pathway based on what historic patient journeys have been. Um, and we pass these into code that SIMA can then understand on the fly and turn into actual pathway instructions. Um, and one of the great things about that is that the what if type questions that we can ask the Pythia model include things like, well, what if I was to get rid of that third follower? and no patient needed to get to this stage. And instead I distribute those patients across the other branches they might have gone down. So we can actually start to investigate pathway redesign type questions and see the impact that will have on our patient journeys and their waiting times. Um, we also have implemented custom queuing behavior. So by default, um, a discrete event simulation model will always allocate whatever capacity is available to the person who's been waiting the longest. Now we know in practice that's not necessarily how a hospital always works, even if it's how it in theory should be. So even within our cancer, urgent and routine cohorts, when we look at historic activity, there might have been a patient who was on holiday when they were at the front of the queue and therefore we jumped down to the next person. Or there might have been, even within a routine priority status, a patient whose particular um, care requirements meant that they could be expedited uh, or who were more urgent than another routine patient. So being able to model in different types of capped and quota queuing models that say, in this iteration of the model, only allow 30% of our capacity to be used on patients who are under 40 weeks, or limit to 20% the amount of capacity we're gonna use on patients who have already breached 104 weeks. That kind of allows us to calibrate a model that reflects current booking practice and then flip that round to, if you were to move to a purely chronological booking practice, what impact would that have on your length of wait times? We don't just in Pythia, again, run a single um, iteration of the model because it does use stochastic um, elements in those random dice rolls. We currently run 50 iterations of each forecast, which gives us this kind of uh, range of outputs with um, 95th percentile ranges and 85th percent, 80th percentile ranges so that rather than the fixed point forecasts that our Excel models used to provide to our operational colleagues, we can say it's most likely that your performance is going to be between here for your total waiting list size. The most common output was this line here. And we can actually get them thinking rather in those absolute terms in the range of a likely waiting list performance is somewhere at the end of the year between those bars. In terms of what sort of what if questions we've built Pythia to ask and some of the types of questions that we have been asking, there's all sorts of um, service redesign, capacity related demand planning questions that we want our service users to be able to ask Pythia for their specialty. Things like, what happens to my waiting list if I recruit a new consultant? And this is their job plan of how many outpatients they'll do a week, how many day cases they'll do. Um, capacity reallocation, so a key question at the moment is, to reduce the uh, negative impact on our cancer wait times. If we claw capacity away from our routine and urgent pathways, that might improve the situation for our cancer patients, but does it mean that we're back into the realms of potentially having 104 week breaches again? Um, 
Ideally, once we move to our capacity model, we will be implementing more direct measures like DNA rates and utilisation. So we can ask things like the extra capacity that we could buy with a 2% reduction in our DNA rate. Does that actually make the difference between achieving 78 weeks or 52 weeks for our wait times? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we can model the impact of change in treatment pathways. So, for example, reducing the number of follow ups, swapping patients from a day case pathway to an outpatient procedure pathway and the impact that might have on their wait time due to differing capacity and resources. Um, and the impact of changing booking practices across wait bands. So, as I mentioned earlier, if instead of limiting the number of patients that we're seeing within a certain uh, wait time band, if we were to move to a purely chronological ranking system, does that improve our long wait position or do we still just not have enough capacity within the system relative to the demand that's coming in? In terms of how we've been using Pythia so far and kind of our plans for the future, so we've been using it uh, over the last 18 months, as I said, for RTT planning. Um, it predicted, unfortunately, in its previous iteration, the level of growth of waiting lists that we've actually seen in 21-22, which is, you know, good for the model, bad for the patient. Um, it's been used by our operational managers so far in quantifying the risk that they're facing in achieving the national requirement of no 78-week waiters by the end of the year. So if we can feed in their current capacity um, plans and the expected additions to waiting lists they've got between now and the end of the year, we can advise them how realistic it is that they'll achieve zero 78-week waiters or if they need to have conversations about increasing capacity or perhaps reducing um, demand in other areas of their system. Um, it's also sort of helping us to prove um, to our wider ICS colleagues that we're moving beyond limited Excel-based modelling and starting to dip our toe into the realm of data science and it increases their confidence in us as a team thanks to what we've learned from the NHSR community and the work that's been going on. Um, and really valuably, it's actually giving us a single tool that allows us to quantify the benefits of business cases. So quite often as an information team, our finance colleagues will say, we need to justify recruiting this extra consultant. Can you tell us how much activity they'll do, how many day cases they'll see? But really the important questions are, what is the impact on the patient? From a performance perspective, will the patient wait less time as a result of recruiting that consultant? And by running different scenarios through Pythia, we can actually see the, or we can quantify the impact of recruiting that consultant, putting that extra capacity in. In terms of where we're going next, so we've used Pythia for RCT so far. Um, there's a growing demand within our system to start using it for diagnostic waiting list modeling and specifically uh, building a bespoke model for our cancer services, which have got lots of highly complex treatment pathways. So it is going to grow eventually into kind of a modular annual planning and performance tool for our trust. Um, we want to try and improve the UI so that it's more um, tempting for our service users to directly get hands on with the tool rather than feeling sort of the need for an analyst to sit with them and steer them through using it. Um, and ideally peer review, so trying to share the code. It's at the moment quite heavily integrated into our particular SQL warehouse, so there's limitations to sharing it. But if I can make it dependent on sort of standardized CSV type inputs, then I'd be really excited to share the code with people to point out what I've done wrong and how I can fix it. Um, and just uh, hoping I don't get overshadowed at the trust by the mascot that I've foolishly created. That's a, a lightning whiz through because unfortunately if I'd have brought up the actual tool to show we would have been here for about three more hours. If anyone is interested in seeing it they can reach out to me on Slack or by email um, and I'll happily go through in depth all of the individual elements that allow you to create your simulation menu um, and all of the sorts of what-if questions that you can explore with Pythia. Thank you very much, Chris. Fantastic. Uh, could I invite our next speaker, up, please? So, uh, all right. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Zera and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Basel School of Management and today I'm going to talk to you about a simulation model that we did for determining intermediate care capacity requirements along the complex discharge pathway. Uh, this is an HDR UK funded project and this is joint work with the University of Exeter Medical School, Alison Harper and Martin Pitt there and Paul Forte and Richard Wood from the NHS Bristol North Somerset South Gloucestershire Integrated Care Board. So first I will give you some background about the problem and explain you what the IPEX project's vision is. Then I will explain you the simulation model, um, an application of it and just few to some brief information about the next steps. So as you may already know, in the UK health system, there is the acute care on one side with elective and non-elective admissions, and then most of the patients will be discharged without further need. But a portion of them will have complex care needs that need to be taken care of in uh, the adult community and social care. And in this framework, uh, the acute care, the costs in the acute care are managed by the NHS budgets, while the costs in community and social care are managed by local governments and or personal savings. And we know that delays happen in the system because of issues in acute care or community and social care or both. And sometimes it can be due to inefficient processes and so on and so forth. But they can, these delays can also happen because, sorry, because of lack of capacity. And nationally, we have 500,000 acute bed days that are lost each year to discharge delays that are attributable to non-availability of capacity in community and social care. And they can cost um, around 800 million annually. So the delays in acute care well, they can be problems in upstream where you, you have cancelled surgeries, can have cancelled surgeries, A&E overcrowding, ambulances unable to unload patients and so on and so forth. So this needs to be improved some way. So what can we do to improve? That was our main problem. If we look at the statistics, we can see that by 2020, we had around 5,000 uh, daily patients waiting to be discharged, but ready to be discharged. And 3,500 of them were in the acute. And if you look at possible reasons for that, we see that the main reasons are around either waiting for an assessment or waiting for a place in downstream. So what can we do about this? So this project is about improving the patient flow between acute, community, and social care, the IPAX project. On a strategic level, we aim to support decisions on capacity allocation along complex discharge pathways in terms of total costs, patient experience, and patient outcomes. On an operational level, we want to provide easy-to-use open-source software tools for analysts to support process and capacity decision-making. On a cultural level, what we aim is to improve awareness and familiarity for analysts of advanced analytics solutions and for leaders highlight the value of a more sophisticated modeling and demonstrate the importance of system-wide working. So ultimately, we want to investigate through empirically informed modeling the following hypothesis. Is increasing social care capacity, can, can it reduce total system costs? And to validate this hypothesis, what we needed first was to model the patient flow. So the this, this story starts with an unelective admission followed by an acute stay in the hospital. Most of the patients in the acute hospital after their stay, they will be discharged without complex care needs. But some of them will need complex care needs afterwards. And these patients, before they can be discharged really on site from their hospital, they need to have a place secured in community and social care. So we need to check if there is an available capacity there. If there is available capacity, then the patient will, be, uh, will go to one of these discharge to assess pathways. It can be P1, P2, or P3. The P1 pathway 
is when the patients are discharged to their usual place of residence and they will have daily visits in their home. P2, P3 pathways are bedded cares uh, outside the acute hospital. If there isn't enough capacity, then those patients will have to stay in the acute for a certain amount of time until the capacity is freed downstream. So we focus on that part of the system and we know that intermediate care can take up to six weeks. We have a visits model and a bedded model. So in the bedded care, the care is in a bed when community or care home beds and length of stay is variable and each patient consumes one service channel. Whereas in the visit space, the care is provided at home, the length of stay is variable, but also each patient will consume a decreasing amount of daily visits over their length of stay. And our model is adapted for both of those. So why do we use a simulation model for this? So as you may know, for patient flow pathway modeling, health services typically rely on simple spreadsheet tools using average arrival rates or length of stays. And we know that planning by averages can lead to substantial underestimation of required capacity. But stochastic methods can provide much more reliable result, results by capturing the variability within the input parameters of the model. And that's why we decided to build um, our simulation model in an easy to use open source simulation in R. So what kind of input parameters are we talking about in our model? We need information about the time horizon of that projection that you are looking for. We need information about the initial occupancy, the caseload for each pathway or in each locality, the initial queue size in the acute for patients ready to be discharged for those uh, pathways, the capacity for each locality and pathway, the daily demand rate, and some information about the length of stay. That can be the mean, the median, and we have distributions that accommodate with respect to those input parameters. Those input parameters are fed into our simulation tool, which creates a Word document using the R markdown, and where in this document you will have information about the inputs summary information, and then you will have a set of plots that will show for each locality and each pathway the number of patients in service for each pathway, the number of patients waiting in the acute ready to be discharged, but that are still waiting because of uh, not enough capacity, how much they are waiting for, so the bean days delayed for those patients, and the total system cost, which is a combination of acute delay cost and community service cost. So basically we have an Excel spreadsheet where you can enter those input parameters and then this is fed in the R code, which will create that word report. So how did we apply this? We applied this to the NHS PNSSG ICB with, together with the NHS PNSSG ICB. So we are looking at the southwest of England with a population of around 1 million. We had three localities, Bristol, North Somerset, and South Gloucestershire. Uh, there are three acute hospitals and one community service provider. Uh, currently, the D2A pathways have very high occupancy rates. We, we know that the P1 pathway is fully occupied. The P2 beds are at, uh, above 92% of occupancy and all P3 beds are fully occupied. And we have 85 patients waiting uh, for each pathway, waiting in the acute to have a capacity that is freed. So now in very recently, in October, we investigated different scenarios of interest with relevant stakeholders for each pathway and locality pair. And we have come up with different options with respect to the input parameters that we have. So we are considering baseline arrivals, which is based on the last six months arrivals, trends in the last six months arrivals, alongside with a target pathway split that they have determined as being 70% for P1, 10% for P2, and 10% for P3. We have the baseline for length of stay, mean length of stay, together with a target one of 10 days for P1, 21 days for P2, 28 days for P3, and an interim, which is somewhere in between. 
And finally, for the capacity, we look at the baseline capacity, so current capacity, but also we set the capacity as much as possible or as much as needed, if you say, if you think, um, that we label as unrestricted. So the model will tell us how much capacity is needed to be able to minimize the Q in the acute. So here you can see a sample of the outputs that we have for the Bristol locality. Uh, I'm not sure about if you can see right the colors, but this red line, for example, corresponds to the baseline. And you can see, for example, for P2 or P3, if things go like they are, so if we go with business as usual, we see that the Q in the acute will build up over the next six months. By contrast, if we look at the black line, which corresponds to the target one, we see that the capacity is, will be determined as being the one that will minimize the queue. So no queue, no mean days delayed, but the cost may be higher for those. And if you look here, for example, you see that the cost is not higher because the cost of an acute bed as delay is significantly higher than a cost of service in community. So maybe better to increase the capacity in the community to have those patients out of the acute whenever they are ready to be discharged. So what are the main insights of this model? We can say that the increases in demand for hospital care will likely lead to increases in demand for step-down services. And not expanding capacity in intermediate care or not reducing the length of stay can lead to more patients being delayed, poorer patient outcomes, greater inefficiencies for other acute care services, and higher overall costs. So to summarize, we have developed an open source simulation tool that can assess optimal capacity of intermediate care that minimizes patients who do not meet the criteria to reside in an acute hospital. So what's next? So currently, we shared our simulation results within the ICB, and now we are in discussion with them to see how we can come up with new scenarios that will reflect the winter pressures and capacity modeling, capacity planning for next financial year. The tool is being handed over to NHS in-house analysts for routine use, and we are working on further dissemination and engagement with other ICBs, including Somerset and we plan to extend the model scope to further include also social care as insufficient capacity there will cause similar issues for intermediate care. And thanks for listening. Thank you so much. We're, we're running to time, so I'm gonna invite our next speaker up. Thank you. Hello? Is that on? Yeah, it's on. Right, I'm now. Right. How does this work? Oh, that's me there. Uh, yeah, hello there. Uh, my name is Simon Wellison Miller. I am a senior article manager in Southwest PAC team in NGS England. And it says MSG student. I'm now MSc graduate uh, from University of Exeter doing healthcare data science. So, uh, my project was around uh, identifying health inequalities within waiting lists. Um, Dr. Wood's always given us a fantastic visualization of the Excel, uh, in, in an Excel format of the waiting list. But in interpretive dance, it's basically gone do, 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 over the last two years. So, it's, it's gone absolutely crazy. So, obviously, it's a really, really big thing. And health inequalities is a really part, big part of that. I'm not going to go through sort of definitions of that. So a big part of my project was trying to create a tool, something that was going to be automated and reproducible, which is obviously with R is where you are at. Uh, so what does the waiting list look like? So we talk about the waiting list, but you know, it's not one waiting list. Um, looking within the Southwest, we've got about seven and a half thousand different waiting lists by different sites, by different treatment functions etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, an another thing is you know waiting lists are not normally distributed we saw some of those sort of shapes earlier 
Um, using lovely rain cloud plots, we can see that we do see some sort of uh, nice sort of gamma distributions for some sites. And then we get these splodgy messes up at the top where it's all, all over the place uh, for, for whatever reason. So, um, you know, the waiting lists are not normally distributed and a lot of them don't even fit any recognizable distribution. There's sort of lumps where people are obviously chunking bits out and, and trying to do weird things. Um, and the second part of the, the assignment was to see if there was any link between waiting uh, a long time and becoming an emergency admission. But more importantly, to see if there was any sort of demographic features which contributed to that. So, big question, what is a health inequality in a waiting list? So we can do really, really basic descriptive statistics based on the waiting list and, and then, you know, pull out our males, females, our gender splits, our ethnicities. Uh, we can look at things like IMD, which is obviously a really, really horrible thing. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to look at the sort of the IMDs at a local level because your IMD split is going to be completely different to the national split. So I kind of recalculated them to uh, sort of a local level. So I had the 10% most deprived within by specific region. So you could uh, compare them a little bit uh, more interestingly. And obviously, IMD itself contains an element of health. So there's a real danger of you saying, oh, look, we've got sick people on the waiting list. It's like, yeah. So, you know, there's, there's that real danger of sort of self-correlation, which uh, uh, you, you don't want to get into. So the big, big question is, how do you identify a health inequality? So, you know, if we looked at a, a waiting list and we say, oh, look, there's 95% there's of this uh, waiting list are female and only 5% are male. Oh, my goodness me, we've got a health inequality right there. And then you go that little bit deeper and go, that's the gynecology waiting list. And, you know, that's probably how it should be. Um, and to some extent, you know, you get that same emphasis, whether it's, uh, you know, ethnicity or gender or IMD, you're always going to have some sort of split which is just going to be, you know, how it is, especially sort of age. We, you know, we get different age profiles by, by demographics for sort of orthopedics, so we expect to see more older people on that. So it's really, really difficult then to sort of pull out what are you comparing it to in order to make uh, a hypothesis to say, this is unusual, this is uh, an, an inequality right there. So, uh, so I came up with a hypothesis. So irrelevant to how many people were on the waiting list, if that waiting list was equitable, when you look at those different features, the, so if you're comparing men against female, even if we had our 95 to 5% split, the distribution of those patients across the waiting list should still be the same. So how can we discover whether that is the case? So my two mates, Mr. Crossgirl and Mr. Wallace, who I definitely owe uh, a pint to, created a lovely statistical test which uses a sort of a rank sum approach to compare distributions across really, really messy, non-parametric uh, non uh, distributions. So my report runs at scale uh, across a, a waiting list, across a number of features, and basically just returns an exception report where it uh, pulls out a, a significant outlier. Um, and in the background, it's sort of validated by a generalized linear model uh, based on the gamma distribution, just to confirm that. And then it runs some sort of further statistical tests just to identify the outliers. And that can be run by tra uh, treatment function or by a specific uh, site. So let's have a quick look at some of the outputs, what that looks like. Um, so use the lovely stats package, which sort of looks at those. So it spits out, like I said, the, the actual full test does look at the full distribution. But for interpretability, it's just easy to sort of look at the medians and compare that. And so we can see in this uh, waiting list over here on the left, that as you get older, it would appear that you are waiting a shorter amount of time. So there is some sort of inequality there. Uh, uh, within this waiting list, just looking at sort of male to female split, we can see, you know, there's a, you know, on average by the median, there's a four week difference for this waiting list uh, for, for these patients for whatever reason. And, you know, that's a bit more of a conversation that you need to sort of have. Um, so once it's identified across the entire split, it does sort of further sort of pairwise tests to try to work out, uh, you know, what, what, that, uh, what that inequality is and then create some automated text and um, try to do some sort of description uh, that's going to be interpretable for, for users to, to understand. 
So the next part of the project was obviously I had all this lovely um, sort of data on my patients and my waiting list uh, was try to look at what were the risks that might lead up to emergency admission for those patients. So uh, ended up using uh, an XG boost model. Uh, it's very, very flexible. Uh, it works with missing data really, really well. I know it's gonna be a surprise to you, but I definitely did have some, some missing and very, very messy data. Uh, it's quite good performance. But more importantly, it was not necessarily about trying to create a, a patient model to say Mr. X there is likely to become uh, an admission. It was more about trying to pull out the, the feature importance and, uh, and get that across uh, rather than, like I say, a, a full patient predictive model. So uh, XG Boost uh, requires very limited amounts of pre-processing. Uh, there were some sort of hyperparameter sort of tuning within the workflow, which just works in the background. Um, and it creates these beautiful sort of decision trees. I mean, it's harder to see on my screen, absolutely impossible to see there. But what's much, much more interesting is you can convert that lovely, horrible uh, diagram up there into uh, a pretty simple and interpretable graph, which you can then uh, sort of use. So, I mean, basically just to say that within this waiting list, an older deprived patient who's been waiting a long time and has attended ED several times while waiting is at an increased risk of becoming an emergency admission. Um, probably not rocket science, but it's kind of good to, to, to kind of understand that. So, um, the results of, uh, of the project, um, it's all been about sort of automation and reproducibility. So, so I say it can run across systems, it can run across specific sites and across a, a number of treatment functions. Uh, so far, the feedback's been excellent. I think uh, health inequalities has been a bit of a buzzword. Everybody's been sort of told to look at health inequalities, but to actually understand and, and actually have something where people can actually see something and, and potentially do something is, is really good. Uh, obviously, it does identify some health inequalities, um, exactly what they mean. You know, some of those might be clinically appropriate, and that's, you know, that's fine, but obviously it, it starts those conversations. Um, around the machine learning and the risk factors, it does seem to be sort of stating the obvious, but that's kind of good that it's sort of, you know, backing up sort of that, that intuition. Uh, there are definitely some issues with the model and, and, and the process. Unfortunately, sort of data quality around ethnicity is just not fit for purpose, and there's you know I need to need to get some better ethnicity data into the model to make it work. Uh, the code's going to be open and accessible, and hopefully sort of adaptable to people. Um, you know, big caveat around IMD. So, like I say, there's health inequalities. Everybody's looking at IMD. It's a very very crude tool. Um, you know, within one sort of LSAO, you might have sort of 2,000 people. So, you know, you and your next door neighbor are not the same person. You and 2,000 people around you are not the same person. So it is really, really, really crude. Um, so just sort of, you know, bear that in mind if you, you are going to be using that. And also, you know, do, do try to standardize it to your area. Otherwise, you know, you, you're going to be sort of comparing yourself to the entire world and, and the entire country where you know those the, the splits of deciles are completely different. So in conclusion, um, massive amounts of time wrangling the data and, and getting that sorted and trying to understand it. Um, just put, sort of pulling that data set from the, the minimum, uh, the, the data set's been a real challenge and then actually trying to join one data set to another is, is uh, certainly an interesting uh, thing. Um, it does just show a snapshot, so uh, it just works on the latest minimum weight data set and the, the latest position. So unfortunately, at the moment, it doesn't identify trends or change over time. Um, that's something I'm sort of looking into, sort of how to sort of understand that and visualize that and potentially think about, you know, can we, can we see that there's a, a gradual increase? There's definitely more features to be added. I think I had a very limited set of sort of gender, ethnicities, et cetera, at that, at, at that point. Uh, it'd be really good to look at that same sort of analysis, but looking at sort of uh, serious mental illness or coastal communities or some of those other sort of, uh, you know, really, really big um, health inequality potential metrics like learning disabilities, et cetera. And I think as those features get added, um, the actual second bit of the machine learning model where it's actually identifying those 
combinations of patients at risk will become much, much, much cleverer. Um, and the way I've built the report, it can just it, take in new features without, without any problem. Um, it's all going to be moved over to sort of UDAO and hopefully sort of one-click reporting um, and also just trying to decide who this report is for. At the moment, it's sort of based at sort of regional leads, um, but it, again, let's say we've shown it to sort of our local providers and there's a lot of interest to have it down at sort of a, a local provider level. And sort of really proud to say that the work's been sort of picked up and sort of developed at a national level. So I think I've talked really, really fast and I've got to the end. Look at me. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Simon. And yeah, well, I must agree with you. The uh, did speak a little fast there, so that means you've now got space for a question. Oh, so good grief. Should anyone have any? I saw Chris Beatty's hand shoot right up no, there. No, 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 no. Is there a microphone nearby? Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you said about picking up clinical intuition. And I think it's a big problem when we give analyses to people who ask for them. The stuff that agrees with the intuition, they accept. And the stuff that doesn't agree with the intuition, they just say, oh, that's wrong, the data's not correct. So I'm just wondering, did you find anything that wasn't within your intuition? And if you didn't, do you have plans? To, how could you do that? Not as yet. As I said, I had a very limited pool of features at this stage. Um, but I have just got my hands on a, a wonderful patient level data set, which has got got flags for everything. Um, it's a very secret NHSE one, which nobody's allowed to talk about, so I'm probably going to get shot after this. Um, but potentially, if I can get uh, the, the permissions to use that, then yeah, you can add in loads and loads of features, and it'd yeah, be really interesting to see what, you know, how, how that works. So I think the short answer was no. <laughs> there was another question right at the back over there. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Oh, no, I know. I called you out with your Excel, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, confounding. I mean, yeah. you looked at, uh, I guess you took some of the age, ethnicity, and so on. Um, did you look at, think of going down to procedure level and priority level? Because it could be that older patients would be waiting for more uh, yep. serious procedures, in which case the waiting time will be affected by that rather than any didn't make a heck of a lot of difference to be fair I mean it the the, the code is written that you can do that uh, and you can bring it down to sort of inpatient outpatient you can get it down to sort of whatever level you you want to so as I said uh, very much built for a sort of a system perspective to start with but yeah you could hone it down to you know, I want to compare my inpatients to my outpatients. I want to look at my P1s versus my, P well, not P1s, but, you know, all the different priorities. I guess the danger then is you're getting down into sort of quite small groups and really, really small numbers of patients. And then, unfortunately, the analysis then has less and less power as you get into sort of smaller groups. So, yeah, there's, the, the, there's a payoff where it's, you know, you get more and more detailed and then there's a payoff where it just, yeah, the, the analysis is no longer statistically valid. So, it's, yeah, it's a challenge. Thank you. We, we've got time for one more. If there's any more burning questions, we've got one over there. Thank you. It's really interesting. Has there been any consideration to running against patient outcomes as well to look at, I'm um, you're looking at kind of waiting times, but actually looking at reported outcomes etc to see if there's any differences from that perspective not really i mean it was very much just trying to try to identify you know who's on that waiting list and you know that's a big bit obviously it is only looking at who's on the waiting list obviously what i can't measure is who's not on the waiting list and that's probably a really bigger public health question which you know select star from uh, you know there isn't a question of who's not on the waiting list so yeah um but yeah, I mean, linking up to health outcomes would be really interesting I mean, if I there was... The technique would work really well to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank Simon again. Thank you. Fantastic. And I'll just invite our next speaker, Edmund. Good afternoon, my name is Edmund Harker. I am an economic analyst in the economics and strategic analysis team at NHS England. Uh, 
So yeah, I'm here to talk to you about two projects that we did or two kind of packages that we released. The first one is an R package which looks at identifying avoidable emergency department attendances as per the University of Sheffield School of Health and Related Research's definition. And the second is a project uh, which uh, uh, looks at uh, crowding in the ED and specifically what kind of drivers affect it. Just as a background to the team, in case you haven't heard of it, so we're a multidisciplinary team of around 45 people, including economists, data scientists, behavioral scientists, operational researchers, statisticians and analysts, and we pretty much operate as an in-house consultancy working on some of the biggest strategic challenges. Moving on to avoidable attendances. So it's worth clarifying uh, what we kind of mean by that. Uh, so from the literature, there are kind of like these three different domains or areas of avoidable attendances, those which are clinically preventable. Uh, so attendance could have been prevented with earlier intervention uh, or management of the condition. Clinically unnecessary, so those where no clinical care was required from the healthcare system perspective, uh, but they may have required self-care uh, self care or other non-clinical care. And finally, clinically divertible which are those which are uh, where clinical care was required, but not of the specialist um, services provided in the ED. Uh, and these basically are patients which could have been treated better elsewhere. So our package kind of focuses on this last clinically divertible ED attendances, uh, specifically those where a GP appointment may have been a substitute. Uh, and this is based on, as I've mentioned, the University of Sheffield's School of Health and Related Research, this definition. And these are essentially non-urgent attendances for care that could have been reasonably prevented, pro provided elsewhere. So the R package itself, it is uh, well, an R package and it's been developed uh, in C++ using uh, the RCPP package, uh, but completely interfaced uh, in uh, R. Uh, it has multi-threading enabled as well using OpenMP and we support using the hospital episode statistics or the emergency care data set uh, whichever is your preference. Uh, calling the li library is as simple as uh, this uh, command here, and you can just uh, bind the result to whatever your initial source data frame was. The next project is, or package, is the looking at the drivers of crowding in the emergency department. Uh, so uh, basically this project came about from the availability of new and more timely data on emergency departments, specifically faster SUS data, uh, uh, specifically ECDS. Uh, there was also a, a policy shift away from staying times uh, over to crowding. Uh, so this kind of was led by the clinical review of standards. And finally, uh, we do kind of know, we may think we know what is driving crowding, uh, but uh, specifically uh, we're looking at the quantification of that. Uh, and econometric techniques that we use in this are better than correlations because they can help us to isolate the extent to which each individual factor drives crowding. So in this project, we have developed uh, three new ED crowding metrics, uh, and we also tried to take a whole system approach uh, looking at the pre-hospital within uh, ED or A&E, rest of hospital and wider healthcare capacity. Uh, the team's also done some previous work looking at uh, performance against the four hour standard. Uh, you can view that uh, publication in the EMJ. So in terms of how we measure crowding in the ED, so we have actually three metrics here. We look at overall crowding, which is pretty much just the number of patients staying in the ED. Uh, and this is irrespective of uh, kind of what day or slot they're uh, in, if they arrived later or earlier. The second is six hour plus stays, and this is kind of a subset of that first one. And this uh, basically is the number of patients who have been staying over six hours plus uh, at the end of their slot or have been discharged. And finally, we have cubicle crowdings, and this is basically the number of majors and resource patients in the ED uh, over the number of cubicles. We have also split our uh, analyses by acuity. So we specifically look at majors, minors, and resource patients, uh, where we would expect uh, crowding not to really be an issue in resource, since these are the most uh, seriously injured or ill patients. We also did split our analysis uh, into six uh, four hour time slots, uh, which are listed above. Uh, but uh, if uh, we have written this up for uh, academic publication, uh, but that uses uh, just a day level model. So in terms of our econometric model, so as I've said, these can uh, let us look at the impact of uh, individual variables whilst keeping the values of others fixed. Uh, so we do have majors, uh, models for majors minus resource, uh, our two different acute, uh, 
a crowding metrics, overall crowding is six hour plus days, as well as a cubicle model, and those are all for each of the six slots. Uh, I've listed some of the variables that we have uh, included here. Uh, these are derived from a bunch of nationally administrative data, uh, but uh, as I'll come to later, there is the ability to customize this within our package. Uh, our, um, we aren't able to account for all of the factors that we might think affect crowding, for example, uh, uh, some unobserved uh, factors, uh, but our modeling approach basically accounts for those factors uh, which don't really vary much over time. Uh, note that we do use a, a proxy for frailty, specifically those patients who are over, aged over 75 years old, and that's based on clinical uh, feedback. So our package in R, it is a uh, public, publicly available on the NHS England GitHub. Uh, it is a data, database agnostic implementation, uh, so uh, users across the system can uh, implement this using their own data, uh, provided the relevant data points are present. It is hopefully user friendly, so uh, easy to, for non proficient R users to take on, and customizable as well. Uh, so you can customize the number of uh, slots if you want to use slots. Uh, you can use it as a daily level model, uh, and you can run models for different kind of uh, length queues. So, for example, 12 hour plus queues if you so wish. Uh, and we did this with the view that uh, others across uh, the NHS England and across the wider system can basically uh, use our model but also build on the model using their own data. So for example, we lack uh, some uh, sickness absence data, for example, in EDs nationally. Uh, those in more local systems could perhaps uh, include their own if they have so. Uh, just in terms of usage, we have uh, used it over quite a few time periods and we've been able to adapt it very quickly uh, to look at some uh, modeling, looking at ambulance handover delays. Uh, you can find links to uh, a mini huddle that we did on Analyst X, which also talks about some more of the technical implementation. Uh, you, there is also a full work, oh, semi full working example uh, and documentation on the GitHub if you are interested. So, in terms of how we built this um, package, uh, there's not a, we don't have a lot of dependencies. Uh, we use data.tables. Um, I am a big fan of them, and they are a very highly efficient performing uh, improvement on the uh, default data frames. Uh, and they are incredibly fast and can work with a lot of data. Uh, we use R6, uh, which is basically implements uh, object oriented or classical object oriented programming for R. Uh, so it supports private, public members, inheritance, and more. Fixed this is what we use for our actual estimation of our fixed effects regression models. Uh, and again, this supports OLS Poisson uh, negative binomial models. Uh, we have implemented in our pa uh, package both OLS and Poisson. And finally, there's some other more utility-based packages, including ggplot, uh, some things to load data from SQL servers, uh, and gt for HTML tables. This gives a very uh, large diagram of basically the classes that we implement in our package. Uh, so the next slide will actually show how these fit in with some of the national data as well. We do provide some data cleansing facilities within our package implementation, uh, specifically for the ESAED patient level, which uh, corresponds to patient level uh, emergency, dependent, the, the emergency department attendance data uh, and admitted aggregated, which relates to inpatients. Uh, we have these four classes at the bottom, the data flag, acuity, slot, and queue, and these are more used for the parameterization of other methods in uh, other classes. Uh, the patient level ED attendance, or the ED patient level takes in ED attendance data, cleans it, derives some variables as per the user's specification. And again, this is another element that uh, people around the system can customize depending on what they're interested in, and then prepares it ready for aggregation, which uh, the ED uh, aggregated uh, basically depends upon. Uh, ESA model is the key one which uh, hands all, uh, handles all of the modeling itself. Uh, and we also implement uh, several uh, additional features within it, within it. So for example, coefficient plots uh, for quick and fast plotting, uh, better occupancy plots, which is a bit of a beta feature, uh, uh, the ability to extract regression sample descriptives, regression data set regression outputs, and we also uh, include the ability to investigate economic significance. So whilst the finding might be statistically significant, uh, we uh, do want to check whether it is uh, kind of matters in the real world. 
Uh, this just covers the data flows here. Uh, so you can see this uh, box in the left-hand corner, uh, which or right-hand corner, depending how you look at it, uh, the user supplied data. Uh, basically, that uh, enables, uh, that's kind of where you can add your own additional data sets. Uh, it is a daily site level model, uh, and you do have the ability as well to uh, kind of cut it to uh, lower aggregations and national. So we have run some regional, uh, tested it in region, regions as well. Uh, just in terms of kind of the data it relies upon, uh, a bit of holiday like basically weather days or holidays, um, sit rep data from uh, NHS England, uh, including the UEC sit rep and discharge sit reps, uh, and then the FASTA SARS ECDS and um, APCE data. Uh, we also have some ethnicity data in there. Uh, that's kind of it about the projects as a whole. Uh, so many great acknowledgements to the other project team members who worked on this. Uh, so Svetlana, Sham, Katie on the avoidable attendances and for the ED crowding, uh, Stephen, Svetlana, Dimitris, Vranya uh, and Dan Bowden, who was our uh, clinical advisor on this, uh, who answered many questions. Um, yes, any questions from anyone? Thank you, that was great. Yeah, do we do we have any questions at all? It's really good to see that you, you've got the, the links up for GitHub already yeah. and you've thought so, uh, I guess, so widely about the reproducible side of it and then plugging into the data, that, that's great to see. So did I see a hand, sorry? Yes, Can we, is there a microphone there? So I was just interested to hear how you might deal with um, patients who move between areas in the emergency department. So what we deal with in our department often is having to move people out of the area they need to be treated in so you can move someone else into it. So that recess patient being treated in a cubicle while still near, needing recess level care. Uh, so we don't account for anything that we have. Well, nationally, I don't think we can see whether people move between areas within the ED. We can only see that people are in the ED and we can see when they're moved into the hospital, uh, but in terms of actual within ED uh, kind of movements, we can't account for that, unfortunately. Do you have any more questions at all? If you do, you can contact me on the LinkedIn, GitHub, Slack, if I figure out how to use it, and email as well. Fantastic, thank you so much. Let's, let's thank everybody. Can I invite our next speaker up, please? Uh, right, hello everybody. Um, now I'm very conscious that I stand between you and lunch, so I, I will try to be quick. Um, so I, my name is Robin Marlow. I'm a paediatric emergency medicine consultant, so um, I'm somewhat of an imposter here, I feel. Um, and I'm talking nothing as clever as these guys, right? All this was modelling. You'll be maybe relieved this is not modelling. This is how I've done useful things in R, and I think I might be one of those laptops. Um, so um, this is where I work. Uh, it's quite a pretty children's hospital, so it's only a children's hospital. Although actually, I think interestingly, our A and E data is aggregated with the next door horrible adult hospital, so um, which makes them look a lot better, or it used to. Um, it doesn't anymore. Um, and so my day job is looking after sick and injured children from the southwest. So we pull all the way up from Truro. So if you get hit by a, if a child gets hit by a car in Truro, they will probably be flown to look for me for looking after. Um, so that's my day job, although my happy place is actually just sitting and looking at data in R. Um, I mean, I am happy at work as well. But So um, now, as you all know, we get measured on our performance in A&E, or this is sort of probably changing, isn't it, at the moment, but the four hour wait is the sort of standard of how we have been measured up till now. And we have, been getting worse and worse at that. Um, but I'm the governance lead for our department, so I have to assess how we manage our flow within the department and how we meet our targets and what I should do to change that with our staffing, all of that. Now, our hospital does not have a massive pool of analysts. 
We don't have a departmental analyst. We don't have a divisional analyst. There is a, there are a pool of analysts, and it is difficult for us to get things done for them because they're so busy, they have to mainly look at financial targets, I think. So I have this sort of uh, dashboard which tells me how our performance is. Okay, And the problem is that it's very much a case of garbage in, garbage out. These, the, you can't see them because they're tiny, but these categories of region for breach are filled in by a nurse when she's just trying to get a patient off the screen. So she'll probably just click the first thing that comes up, and then we kind of end up with trying to figure out why this child breached based on just nonsense, really. So trying to understand what is going on in our department is quite tricky. So I did quite a lot of, during my PhD, I used R quite a lot, and I was really keen to start using it, but you would not believe how hard it is to get hold of my, my, our own data. You know, I've done loads of work with HES. I can see the whole, hosp the whole country's data, but I can't get hold of my own. So we're left somewhat in the dark trying to understand what we're doing. Because we've got this big problem. You know, we've got increasing rates. They just keep on coming. We're crowded. We're trying to understand why. And then we've got, and this is new for pediatrics, a big problem with exit block. That's been a problem in adults for years. But children generally have a carer. You know, their parent will take them home. They can go home. When they're better, they go home. So we haven't had a problem with exit block from the hospital. So I started out my journey by making one of these Sankey diagrams because um, I just wanted to know where, after the pandemic, where were our cases coming from? Were they, was NHS 111 just sending everybody to us? Um, which is all gets a bit political. Um, so I tried to make that an R, and it, I used R to do the, the munging, but actually I had to use this website, Sankeymatic, made it a lot prettier. Um, but that helped me understand where our flows were. Um, but to do that, I had to get an analyst to set up uh, a power, a, some sort of saved query, which dumped out a CSV which I imported each time, which got very, very tiresome. But then I found there was this new little magic button that gave me an atom file that then I could start manipulating the, file, the um, strings, and I could import that straight in, put some date ranges, and then it would come straight into my um, R markdown. And that then whoop, allows me to start making these nice flows of where patients are, the number of patients in my department. And this is using this patient counter package by John McIntosh. I don't know if he's here. No, it's amazing. Love it. It's great. And I think I might have even stolen the idea of doing these from his blog. So I can only thank him a lot. Um, so that allows me to see for every hour of every day, in a month, what our total number of patients in the department is. Now, um, you can see that we get up to 70 patients in our department sometimes around nine o'clock. We have a tiny waiting room, 70 patients, that's 70 children, so that's got another 70 parents, so that becomes 120 people in a tiny waiting room. Monday night was our worst night ever, we had 92, which is about the same as the adults. Um, but being able to visualize that and show it to other people and demonstrate our problem has been quite useful. And then at the same time, same effectively, I can look at the number of patients waiting for a bed. So I can see patients who've been DTA'd but are still in the department and haven't managed to get out. I can count up for every hour of the day, every day of the week for a month, what my total number of patients stuck waiting for a bed in our department is, which when it gets up to 12 to 14, we only have 12 to 14 patients to see people, and we just can't even physically see people. So uh, that's a bit of a problem for us. And then I can look at more useful things like the max time to initial assessment, which you know our standard should be, everybody should be seen within 15 minutes, um, which we don't meet, um, quite frankly, when we get absolutely overcrowded, you, can't, you just can't keep up with ourselves. So by being able to see these targets, um, I could, well, being able to see these measures, we can then set ourselves little targets. So we can start saying, well, we shouldn't have really more than 40 patients in the department. You know, we have a nine meter squared waiting room, that's too many patients. So we can start to say, right, well, how many times this month did we breach that? Oh, pretty much every day. 
Um, how many times did we have more than four patients stuck in the department waiting for red? Well, not every day, but quite often, certainly this month is going to be even higher. How many times this month did we not meet our max time to initial assessment? Well, when we know those targets, we can start to hold ourselves accountable to it. So crowding is on our risk register, and it's one of our biggest risks. It's our highest divisional risk. So when we measure that, we can then start to do things about it. Now, knowing it is great, but we need to convince people it's a problem. The way we do that, and I don't know if you, like, do you use data, incident forms and datix? Some people, okay, so what I've been now using is the power of R to do datixes for me, um, which, so the idea is I can get something called R selenium, which sort of automates a, um, a Chrome instance and at harvest to start filling in these forms for me. Um, so whoop, this is a picture of a Datix form and I've got a very, can I just start a little video? Is that all right? So here's my, oh, it doesn't project terribly well. There's my, R, there's my R Studio on it. Up pops a Chrome instance. Goes to Datix, starts filling it in for me. It's a horrible, when you start looking behind the scenes of the website, it's got all this horrible JavaScript. So I have to use R Selenium. And so the idea is now, we could stop the video now, that'd be great. So the idea is it can then pre-populate your Datix, which you can then submit but it allows to reduce the amount of admin work in reporting these problems. Now, you could argue, well, that's kind of silly because we all know that because it's on the BI report, but that's not how the system works. We're told we have to fill out datixes for all of our 12 hour breaches, which we have an awful lot of. Um, now, this is not rocket science. This is sort of like a doctor's amateur analysis, right? I'm not an analyst, but this is the best I can do. The thing is that it is very, very um, incremental. So every time I'm looking at these, da this, these data, I'm thinking of new questions that I can ask, but I can only do that if I can actually get at the data. So I guess my plea to you, in a way, is this is a nice saying, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. I'd say give a clinician a dashboard and you, you, you feed his results for that problem, but Tinkering that, finding new things out is tricky unless they can work with somebody, which would be brilliant, um, or they can do it themselves. And some clinicians are able to do that themselves. So knowing how to access that data is um, useful. So I should thank Alex, who was the man in BI who set up the little um, save search, which I think now has 95 columns of data for each attendance that I'm pulling out, but I want more because I want to look at all my movements. You know, I want to know who was in recess for more than four hours because if they stayed in recess, they shouldn't have been in recess. And if we're not recording that, we don't know how many HDU beds we need. There's so much data that we don't record and you sort of, it's just not there because it's not electronic. And Darren um, has set up a R Studio server instance um, so, which again, we're fortunate to have, so I can set cron jobs to run things uh, to tell me. And then these are the lovely packages that I found most of the stickers for outside, which is really exciting. Um, right, um, any questions or suggestions for how I can improve my access to data? That would be lovely. Um, but please don't ask me questions for five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Do we have a question or two? That's, that's a lack of hands. Lunch. Whilst, whilst I'm going to look around the room for a second, I'm just going to invite Mohammed and Tom back up for a second. Thank you very much. Um, just to uh, ask Tom, what's going on this evening for people who are here in person? Yes. Um, so, can Chris Beely just stand up and wave for a second? He's on his phone, sorry. <laughs> so, me and Chris are supposedly organising a social event tonight. If anybody is staying in Birmingham and wants to go and meet up with some of us, uh, we are going to be meeting in a place called NQ64, which is in Digbeth. 
Um, there are some details on Slack. Um, there are probably people looking to go for food beforehand, so try and find someone in the lunch break and you might find other people to go for lunch with. Um, you may have also noticed there are a large collection of books randomly um, in the area where we'll be having our food shortly. Um, Mohammed's provided those very kindly. I, f I think actually he just wants to clear out his house. Um, so please take them all. He'll be very angry if there's any left at the end of the conference. Um, and then the other part there is just behind the books, there's a, a terribly written little um, URL. There is a couple of t-shirts that we're gonna try and um, give away tomorrow. Um, if you go on there, there's a little shiny app and you can put your email address in. Um, select what size t-shirt you are because we've got various different sizes and you can be entered for a prize draw. Um, it will give you a little number, just remember it. If you go back onto the website, put your email in, it will give you the same number. That's all, go enjoy your lunch. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to start our afternoon session at 2.15, so I shall see you all after that. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker of the afternoon session. Um, I'll let Chris introduce himself in a minute. I don't think he needs much introduction, though. Um, so yeah, a round of applause for Chris. Um, um, without hesitation, deviation or repetition. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Bealey. Um, I work for Nottingham Health Healthcare NHS Trust, although, as it was mentioned this morning, I won't do so much as I love that place. Um, so today I'm going to be talking, I've forgotten to set my timer. Today I'm going to be talking about um, Shiny Endo Miner, which is uh, one of the NHSR project solutions. Um, it would be a little, as I keep saying in the tag, the technical advisory group, it would be a little bit more advanced if I hadn't had a liver transplant this year. That's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. Um, but there is quite a lot of interesting uh, work going on with it and some principles that I want to show you, although the code is not um, entirely finalized yet, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so basically I'll talk about Endominer itself, which is a text mining tool. Um, it's not, I haven't written any of the code at all. Um, it's um, uh, a friend of NHSR who um, presented, I can't remember if it was 2018 or 2019 or both, Sebastian, um, and there's a link to a GitHub in the thing, so do go and have a look. Um, the slides, incidentally, are on the conference uh, GitHub, so you can go and have a look and click links and then so on and so on. Um, so Sebastian also wrote um, a shiny implementation of um, Endominer, and it's what I've taken to call, it's hard for me to talk about this because I think shiny applications need to be better, and I've been saying this a lot, some of you probably will have heard me say this before, but I don't want to kind of rag on the shiny applications again before and I've written loads of those shiny applications myself but on the train I've come up with a new I'm going to call them version 1.0 shiny applications so Sebastian wrote a version 1.0 shiny application we've all written them um, but the idea was to make it um, better in various ways and that's what we've done um, so uh, what was my clock screen off so the first thing we do is going to refactor it to Golem. I don't really have time to tell you about Golem, except that it's completely awesome. Um, so just Google shiny Golem. The first hit will be a Pokemon, which always gives me a laugh. But this third or fourth hit will be the actual thing that I'm talking about. It's a framework basically for producing shiny applications. And it's the only thing I use now, even if I'm making a ridiculous di um, dice roller for a Dungeons and Dragons of games, I write it in Golem. So it's been refactored to Golem, and that works all complete. And then now we're looking at refactoring again, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about um, kind of next steps as well. So the Endominer package itself, it's um, text mining for um, clinical text data. It's for um, endoscopies, for, um, what do you call it, gastroenterology, which is a bit that's very close to my heart. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll probably know that I've had quite a lot of more, more gastroenterology than I care to speak about in public, frankly. Um, and it, the, the, the stuff they get out of the system is this very, very dense, difficult to read one column Excel mess, basically. So Sebastian's written loads of code that kind of um, chunks it down uh, and, and, and kind of cleans it up ready for use. So basically the things that it does is it does kind of general cleanup of text with like spelling and all this kind of stuff. Then it does data linkages, more than one data set, and it kind of brings them all together. And then it does some like particular specialist things, like it can look at like the amount of, um, the amount of drugs that was uh, administered during the procedure and all that kind of thing. So that's what Endominer does. As I mentioned, Shiny Endominer version 1.0 um, was written and there's no modularization. It's a very long server.r um, file. Um, and the business logic, 
as, um, as the people at ThinkCar, that's where the girl in packages come from. The, the ThinkCar people will call it business logic. So the business logic is in, is in the server.r code. Um, and so the problem with that is that it, it can be difficult to find it and it can be difficult to understand what's going on. Um, so the way that kind of Golem encourages you to work is taking that business logic out of the reactive part of the application and pushing it outside into functions where it can be more easily inspected and tested. And that's kind of the name of the game, really. Um, and because of the way, the, because of the problem that it's solving, the data model that sits behind the shiny application is actually quite, quite difficult. Um, I do think it's a very useful, instructive example for kind of how there's a lot of problems with this work, and I think that's, it kind of illustrates, I hope, a way of, of, of working better in the future in, in general. So this is the, um, well, it looks way better on my laptop than it does on the screen, sorry. Um, this is a diagram of the, um, of the data flow. So basically there are, there are two ho big, horrible, messy spreadsheets that come in, um, and then there's, there's some steps that the user has to take themselves. Um, to kind of merge them together so that it, you have to fill all this stuff in. I don't really have time to show you, but because, the, the, because you don't know how, what the spreadsheets look like ahead of time, it's necessary to have the application. That's the date, that's the endoscopist's name, and so on and so on and so on. And the Shiny interface gives you a way of doing that if you don't write code, basically. That's the idea of it. And there are two steps of that. One's called merge data and one's called map terms. If you have a look at the GitHub repository, you'll see why, but I'm not going to go into that now. Um, and then once you've done that, there's all this stuff that can come out. So there's something called Barrett's. I'm not a clinical person. I've got no idea what that is. I presume it's some sort of clinical condition or other. Um, and there's all these different reports and all this kind of thing. And there's, and there's a function where you can save what you've done so far. Um, so this is an absolute complete no-brainer for Golem because um, of the way that the data model is um, it's quite a complex flow. So in the original application, the version 1.0 application, it was all just done in 2,000 lines of code. So it was not clear to someone coming to the code or even you yourself coming to it six months later, what did what? Because it was all just there and there were, I think, there were a few reactive objects and they also had different bits and pieces and they were put, put together in, you know, in, in the way that whatever suited the application at the time to be put together. It makes much more sense to take every single one of these and put it in a box and control what goes in and out. And I could talk eloquently about how Golem helps you do that, but I don't have time. Um, but as I say, go and look it up. Um, so it's a no-brainer for Golem because the data model. It's also a no-brainer for, for Golem because package dependencies. I've become obsessed with package dependencies recently, and I know because Python, I've got an inferiority complex with Python because they don't make the mistakes that we do because we all just import loads of stuff. Um, like my team will know if you import, if you write library tidyverse on GitHub, then it's instant flame war on Slack. Um, so, because I, and I had this in this thing, so I, there's loads of packages, and I just chopped, I was cutting and pasting the code and put it all over the place, and I changed the order of the package loads. And the bright among you would have thought, aha, so that's going to change the masking, and it did, and the whole application completely broke, and it stopped me for a while. Um, it's just not a good way of managing, it's not a good way of managing your own dependencies, it's definitely not a good way of managing dependencies that you didn't write and don't know anything about and are just starting to work on. So, Use the double colon. I do this a lot now, so don't load the library at all. This is all encouraged by the good people at Thinkar in the um, their book that I forget the name of, um, and by Golem, it's implicitly encouraged as well. Um, so do that. Modularize the data reads um, so you can understand what's going into a module, what's coming out of a module, what the current state is, you know, in, in a clear, explicit way. Um, and also, potentially, and this is the bit we're still working on, is potentially modularizing the analytic code as well. So we modularize the data code, but there is some potential, perhaps, to modularize the analytic code too. So um, I just want to just give you a few kind of, this is a sort of a bit of a, um, a tour through Golem and, and where ways to nice to use it. And it's a nice opportunity for me to um, have some French in the presentation, which seems very cultured, but I don't really know any French. So this is called the Stratégie du Petit R. Um, and this is again from the people at Thinkar who developed Golem. And what this is basically is it's a way of passing data because, because each module is isolated. So each, the module can't read the data from the global state. It's a bit like a function, you know, it's not, it can only read what you tell it to read. And that's very useful and very powerful in this case because it means that people can't be, you know, other modules can't be messing with your data. You control what each module sees. And the way that you do that, there are a couple of ways, um, but this is the, probably the simplest is you have the pity R. So the pity R is here, and you can put what you like in it. It's a reactive object, and you can feed in uh, data frames or anything you like. And each, all the modules that you want to be able to see that will see that, but if you module you don't want to see it, it won't see it. And it's just a way of modeling and making it clear. Um, I think the thing is that a lot of this, it's not really do, it's, it, this, I suppose this whole talk is not really about 
what it does. It doesn't really do anything better at the end than it does at the beginning. However, it's much cleaner and easier to read and easier to maintain and easier to extend. That's, that's kind of the point of it. Um, yes, and it's also a no-brainer no for a Gerlam as well because it does the same thing twice. So I mentioned the two spreadsheets right at the beginning of the data model um, over here. This one and this one, it's the same task done twice. Um, and again, with a naive um, implementation of Shiny, you might possibly write that code twice, which is not a very good idea um, for obvious reasons. So you can just modularize it. And it's very simple to do that. All you do is, so I just wrote this, this is one module, it's called the Clean and Merge Server. Well, it's not called the server, it's called the Clean and Merge Module. Um, and you just pass in one argument to differentiate them, header file name. And you can see later on, um, because I'm saving them as different things. So one of them is saved uh, with this um, endo.rda, which is the endoscopy data, and the other one is called path.rda, which is the pathology data. Um, but other than that, the code is completely generic between the two modules. So again, it's a complete no-brainer. Um, right, so just to show you some of the, some of the nice ways that it works, um, so these are, this is what lives in your server.r file. So in a Golang application, actually, the server.r file is fairly sparse, usually. It's usually just calling modules and maybe just pushing a few bits of data around. Um, so you can hopefully see that I've sort of, I've, I'm controlling what data goes where. So you can see at the top, um, there's um, some data. They just get the pretty r. So they just get the, 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 the sort of data that everybody's getting. But then you can see here this polyps server, this is another module that does kind of analytic work. Um, it actually outputs something. So you can see over the end that's being assigned to something. And that is then passed on to here. And ditto the, Par the, the Barrett's one up there is also producing an object that's then passed in here. And it gets all of this stuff as well. But this only one gets the R. So it's just a way of um, you know, cleaning up and understanding um, where the data goes. And I think, you know, part of the restriction on this before was it was it was getting so complicated that it was almost difficult to add stuff because it was just too complicated. And I think working in this way is, is a lot easier to kind of um, to add stuff because you can be clear about what you're adding and where it's going and how it's working. Right. Um, so let's um oh no no I yeah actually I've cheated haven't I because I, I clicked the link but actually I've already clicked it. So let's um, Let's see it. Okay, so that's talking about the, the shiny bit. That's the, the Golem bit that I wanted to talk about. And the, this, the next thing is um, refactoring the business logic. And that's something that we're still working on. Um, so I just wanted to show you, this is a draft pull request. Um, so I just want to show you, um, now where was it? I could have, I could have gone to the exact bit, couldn't I? That would have probably helped as well. Um, what am I looking for? Um, oh yeah, seriously, no, sorry, it was right on the top. Yeah, so basically, um, if you look at the report, and as I say, the slides are online, so you do, do have a look at this if you're interested in what I'm doing exactly. Um, but this function, basically, this, this was being done twice in two different modules, um, almost, to, almost to the letter. Um, so it's very easy then for me to just to pull it out, put it into a function, then have both of those modules call those functions. Um, and again, that's powerful because you're restricting um, you're restricting what the functions can see as well. So you're making sure that you understand what's going in to the, to the function and then what's coming out, rather than you sometimes get, when you write in shiny applications, it can get a bit messy. You're not exactly sure what the state of the data is when you, when you call the thing. Um, so that's that, so that's going on. So go do go and have a look, that's, that's the idea of it. Um, right back to the slides. Um, right, so why am I saying all this? What's the point of this talk? Um, so, I think ultimately, what I would really like to do, and what Sebastian has also talked about doing, is that the endo minor package, um, it was built for a specific purpose, but actually the stuff it does is fairly generic, and it could theoretically be generalized. So it's just really just kind of crunching things. It's basically just looking for delimiters. So it looks for like things like date and you know endoscopist and all this kind of thing. Theoretically, you could write a package that does a very similar job with different data using quite a lot of the core data from that original um, thing. So, um, and this is obviously a big theme that, that we always talk about here and that I always talk about is that we've got to get better at being able to share stuff. Um, and I think this is a potential avenue for that is that actually it's a fairly generic task. 
Um, so I think we can generalize the back end. I think we can cer certainly generalize the front end. I think that's probably easier uh, to generalize in a way, as long as you make sure that the back end is producing objects that are fairly similar. Um, and I hope I've illustrated that we've started doing that, but what I'm doing, I think, would actually work um, with other backends as well reasonably easily. Um, so basically, um, what we need to do in order to do, and the other thing is, of course, all the clinical information systems are all different, aren't they? I don't think we spend enough time complaining about that, actually. Um, and it, that's the big problem, is that I think it almost would be useful to have some sort of package that actually just deals with the back-end mess. Instead of having a specific endo, like endo miner, text mining type package, have an intermediate package that just deals with a horrible chaotic mess from you know, several different databases and say, well, we can turn this mess into this, and then using this, we could then go on to that. Um, right, so um, I think I've talked about this all the way through, but I just wanted to call out some of the things that I've been talking about, kind of shiny good practice. Um, so as I say, the, you know, it's good to have functions, it's good to abstract stuff, and it's good to do things, uh, it's good to write functions that are, that are small, that do one thing well, um, and that's obviously been something that I've been doing throughout, trying to kind of factorize and kind of reduce things down. Um, write tests that test the business logic outside of React Shiny. I confess I've been very poor at doing that because I've still been kind of working on the, the front end, which I know is the wrong way around, so um, that's very bad of me. Use GitHub, I don't really have time to talk about how that's been useful in this project, but it is very useful when you're collaborating with someone, who, you know, when you've got one person who's written the clinical code and one who's written the shine, it's very useful to have that, that interface and to be able to have pull requests and all this kind of thing. Um, build outside of a reactive context, uh, I've mentioned I'm running out of time. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the vision of Shiny that I'm kind of pushing here is um, build end to end as soon as possible. So I think this project would have been better if we'd started um, with the Shiny developer working alongside the clinical developer in the first place, and I'm trying to do that in my team at the moment, building Python and, and R Shiny at the same time. Um, I do think that um, clinical data sets are a real problem, and I don't think we spend enough time kind of dealing with that problem. Um, they're very big and complicated and annoying, and it may be that we write, as we're writing functions in Shiny, in, in business logic, in, in factorized functions, it may be actually that they need to be pushed further back into some sort of data type thing and that's what I'm hoping this project can do maybe with um, if we generalize from the the end of minor to a, a more abstract version that we could then have that flow better model but this is all just kind of you know this is my ideas rather than being a concrete thing but that's it thanks very much <clears throat> Um, yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, so we'll move straight on to the next speaker. Sorry, we don't have time for questions, but Chris will be around for the rest of the conference if you have anything that you want to ask him. So I'm going to hand over now to Callum. Hello, I'm Callum Power. I'm a pharmacist, although I've already been told today I'm not a normal pharmacist. Um, I'm not entirely sure what a normal pharmacist is, so uh, there are no normal pharmacists. They're all very weird. Uh, um, I usually introduce myself at conferences when I'm talking about data by saying I'm a geek. I don't feel enough of a geek today to be able to, to do that. So uh, I want to talk to you today about um, some work we've been doing to analyse some systemic anti-cancer therapy data. That's chemotherapy data. It's got a daft name because some drugs don't officially count as chemotherapy. Um, and um, a package that we've put together to try and allow some other people to do the same thing. Um, there is some data shown, but it's all fictitious. Even though there's NHS numbers, they are false NHS numbers. Um, so let's start by talking about the SAC data set. So the SAC data set is a data set that's uploaded by every trust in England. Uh, to was Public Health England, but now NHS Digital, um, contains 43 fields of data for every line of drug given. So if you don't know much about chemotherapy, we often give multiple drugs at the same time in a, a combination. And so you'd have multiple lines for that patient for that day's treatment. And if they have multiple days of treatment, you'd have multiple lines up for that. Um, there's a, a data set with some rules as to how that data should look and of course we're the NHS so we ignore all those rules and send some data that's a bit dodgy from time to time. Um, so there are data quality issues. Um, part of that data set includes the outcomes for the patient so it includes whether or not the patient died but you upload the data within two months of having 
given the chemotherapy. And so if the patient didn't die within two months, then the data itself doesn't know what happened to the patient. You need to do something else. And there is a data lag because it's uploaded two months. And sometimes it's three months because you upload two months in arrears for the previous month. So if you gave somebody something on the 1st of September, you would be uploading that in December, I think. Uh, why might this all matter? Well, outcomes in chemotherapy are quite important and clinical trials tend not to recruit patients that match the real world. So we tend to recruit younger patients, less frail patients. Women sometimes don't get recruited as much. Uh, less ethnic populations get recruited. People with other comorbidities are often excluded. Um, and the, the order in which we give treatments, so once we've given one set of chemotherapy, we might move on to another, and then once that one's not working, move on to another. Some of that won't be the same as what happened in a clinical trial because um, clinical practice has changed. So if we wanted to go and look at some data, what are our choices? Well, we could analyze the data we submitted nationally. We could manually collect some data prospectively. That would probably be considered the, the gold standard. We could go to our electronic prescribing systems. Every hospital in England is now prescribing chemotherapy electronically. So that is a start because 10 years ago, there would have been a lot of this done on paper. Um, or we could just go and get the data that we're already submitting to the national data submissions. Um, Manual data collection is time consuming and it might not be any more accurate. None of us in clinic have any more time to, to capture extra data. So um, if we try and analyze the data submitted nationally, there is a charge for accessing that data back beyond your own trust data. Um, and if you want to link that data to other things, you run into problems with patient identifiers. And it's not an easy process. We've been going through that process for probably close to five months now. And we, we sort of send an email to NHS Digital and they take a month to reply. And then we go and try and deal with that bit. And then we come back with another problem and send them an email and they take a month to reply again. Um, extracting data from electronic prescribing systems is a nightmare. There are only four or five, but everybody sets everything up differently and, and trying to get some consistency is difficult, but we've already done it. We've already got this standard data set um, for the SACT files. So actually that's probably the easiest way to do it. There is some missing bits in the data, but we might be able to add to that. And the only other issue is that it's a pile of CSV files. So if you go to a pharmacist and say, can you give me your SACT data? They'll say, yes, here you go. Here's the folder with 420 CSV files in it. And if you say, well, do you not have it all in one file? They'll say, well, that'll take me six weeks to sit and merge them together in Excel. So no, um, but actually we can do that in minutes in R but they've never heard of R. Um, I'm probably one of about 10 or 15 pharmacists in the country that have heard of R. So uh, there is a bit of a plea here that if any of you have spare time on your hands and want to go and help people, there are probably some geeky people in pharmacy who would like to do things with their data, but don't know how to do it. So if you were wanting a project, go and have a chat with them because they've probably got a big pile of data that you could do things with. For us, it's about half a million rows of data. The data is in long format. I showed this slide recently to a group of pharmacists. So this is just a sort of example of how the data is. It doesn't actually have the name, it has their NHS number, but um, roughly how the data might be structured. So the same patient in yellow has had three different doses of chemotherapy over the, the same period of time. Um, and pharmacists instantly don't generally know what to then do with that to do any analysis because the same patient's in three times. And if you want to do any analysis, you want the patient normally on one row once. Of course, we can group that data, we can change that into wide format, and we can do that in seconds, probably in, in R with Tidyverse, but they don't know how to do it. So what we've done is we've tried to build some of the package to, to do that for them. So we've built a process to merge the data together. We've built a process to exclude patients who have asked for their data not to be used for analysis using the NHS digital process. So that requires you produce a DAP file that you submit to them, and then 40 minutes later, get a file back to merge back in. Um, so once you've got your data that you've kept, we can then update that data for outcomes um, and do some decoding. So all the data that's being submitted to NHS England um, is, is coded for ones and twos for males and females. And again, trying to undo any of that in Excel is obviously not particularly easy, but it's fairly easy to do um, in a reproducible way within R. And then we can do some analysis on it. And that's what we've tried to create with a package. We, we wrote some code to do that, that we've then been merging into the package to do that. So we published a paper, and the reason we published that paper was this set of three drugs that we use to treat pancreatic cancer. You probably can't see the color difference on the screen. Um, so the red drug is our best drug. It's um, the most effective drug, but it's also the most toxic. And there's a green and a blue drug um, running down there. Um, 
the, the green drug, which is the line that sits very slightly above the other one, is supposed to be nearly as good as the red drug. But in reality, we didn't think it was, and so we went and did our analysis. And in our population, and it is only a relatively small patient population that we treat in Teesside, um, we're not finding it's any better than the other drug, which is cheaper and less toxic. So we're not sure that we're picking the right patients. We're going to try and repeat that bit of analysis at a countrywide level, or at least with other centres. Um, how easy is it to do? Single line to merge data. So it gets all your files into one. Single, file, single line to refactor all the data to turn your ones and twos from males and females back into males and females, etc. Um, it does the diagnosis using Open Safely's uh, tables to look up the, the diagnosis from the ICD-10 code. Uh, single line to export whether the, the patient list in the format that NHS Digital wants it, and a single line to take that back in to exclude those patients. Um, if you want to up upload outcome data, we've built um, three ways to do it at the moment, but I suspect we'll need to build more for other people. So we've built it so that you can simply do it with an Excel spreadsheet. Um, we've built it so that you can access our chemotherapy prescribing system and get the, the dates of death updated from that directly from the database, and the same from our patient administration system. Um, but obviously there are how many ever patient administration systems and none of them will have the same data structure. And then the survival analysis is fairly simple. Um, the example code there is um, selecting out patients with the ICD-10 code for pancreatic cancer and a particular chemotherapy regime. And then the rest is just manipulating some dates to get some start and end dates for treatment and so forth. And then updating that um, to get the, the outcomes. So um, what we then end up with is a, an updated set of data like that with some start dates, some end dates, and dates of death, and whether the patient was still alive or not. Um, and all you really need to do to do a survival curve, which is what most oncologists, so cancer doctors, will want is the survival curve. That's the thing that they, they sort of eat, sleep, and breathe, is whether or not they're dead or alive and how many days it, it was. If you want to group them by anything else, you'll need that data. And so this will be a vignette within the package and um, there will be some specimen data within the package. I'm waiting for tomorrow's how to produce specimen data session to make sure that what I've done makes sense and then we'll get that released into the package. What else can it do? Dare I use the word dashboards? Uh, so we've, we've created some flex dashboards. They're not yet released in the package, um, but to be able to track things like activity and so forth. You can probably not worry too much about the bit on the left. That's probably as we still had some trusts using some paper data um, for prescribing. And then you come across, get COVID in the middle with a little blue dip where we cut down how much chemo we gave. But I am worried what happens next and we'll see what happens when we next rerun that data. Are we in a sudden surge? And that does feel at the moment as though we might be in a surge of chemotherapy activity. We keep approving new drugs. You always hear the headlines on the news all the time of there's another new drug being approved. Nobody comes along and takes drugs away. They're almost always either added to existing treatment or another line of treatment. And so the activity with chemotherapy goes up all the time. So we, we worry quite a lot about that. We get lots of freedom of information qu queries. My view is that we should just have that as a preferably a publicly accessible anonymous dashboard where people who want to know how much gemcitabine we gave last quarter can just go and download it. Why are we then going and running a report and then sending that off and so forth? It would be much easier to just have that as a, a dashboard that people could access. And SACT has changed its data structure just to annoy everybody. Um, so we had SACT version 2. Most trusts will have moved to SACT version 3 data structure by now. So we need to merge those two together and we'll, we'll add in that. And the final functionality that I, I'm hoping to be able to add is the ability to share anonymous survival objects. So when you create a survival object in R, you end up with that table that I showed effectively as to whether or not a patient's dead or alive and how many days they were dead or alive for, um, possibly with some other grouping factors, but no other patient identifiers. And so you could run this code individually in five trusts and then share those survival objects to merge together to do a bigger bit of analysis rather than having to share identifiable data. So you could get it really down to some aggregated data before that. Issues with the data, well, it's NHS data. It's produced from clinical systems that aren't necessarily set up for the purposes of, of doing things with the data. But my clinicians tell me that the more we do with the data, 
the more they'll care about what they put into the system. So at the moment, they will record reason for discontinuing treatment clinical decision, because it happens to be top of the menu, um, and they just automatically go to it. But the more we say to them, well, actually, if you recorded an actual reason, we could do something with that, the more likely they are to do it. Um, everybody says that the biggest problem with SAC data is the outcomes data being missing, but it's not a problem to add in. I'm sure you guys as data analysis are all sitting saying, well, of course, you just join some data. Um, but People who don't do data analytics think that's a really difficult process. They sit with Excel spreadsheets manually looking through computer systems, getting their data to death and updating them. By the time they've finished, it's like the fourth road bridge. They think they might need to go back through and update some more. If you want to know more, it's on GitLab rather than GitHub because everybody told me GitHub was going to be a really bad, evil place for open source software. So we went to GitLab. It can go wherever people want it. Um, if you want to get involved, find an oncology pharmacist. There'll be one in every acute trust um, and find out where you could get hold of the data to do things. They would need your help to do stuff in R because they won't have done R. You would need their help to understand how we use chemotherapy. So the two together could be a, a nice little symbiotic relationship. Um, but they'll need help to understand how to get R onto a computer and an NHS machine and so forth. So, so that's what we've done. Um, I don't know whether we've got time for questions or not. So, yeah, we don't have time for questions, no, but um, I'm sure you'll be around if anyone Absolutely. has anything to ask. But thank you very much. Um, next, we have um, Vivek. Um, hopefully, I pronounced that right. Uh, so, <laughs> um, we'll just get set up. Um, yeah, over here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vivek. I work in a company called CITL, and it's a contract research organization. And I work there as a research consultant in the Department of Advanced Epidemiology. A lot of what my colleagues and I do is real-world data analysis. And today, in 15 or so minutes, I intend to introduce you to the concept of real-world data analysis and how causal inference is drawn of, by using clinical registries which is used ultimately for uh, applications for US FDA or NICE. So the example that I have chosen for today is a non-small cell lung carcinoma. It's the cancer which is most pre mostly prevalent among smokers. In fact, as we can see that around 90% of the individuals suffering from this disease have some, some sort of history of smoking. Not only this, but also the outcome of conventional chemotherapy is worse in smokers compared to non-smokers when it comes to uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma. So our client, Roche that time, was planning to look at the outcome of one specific drug, which was pembrolizumab. It's a PDL one inhibitor. It's an, it's an immunotherapy for cancer management. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, they wanted to know if the smokers have different outcome to, or a different response to this treatment compared to non-smokers. Now, definitely what they wanted to look was not a simple case control study in an observational uh, fashion because they would have done that themselves, but they came to us so because they were interested in answering that whether the outcomes were causally related to the smoking status of individuals uh, taking this drug. In other words, the kind of question they wanted to answer was supposed to be ideally answered by doing a randomized clinical trial where the exposure or the drug would have been smoking and all the individuals taking this uh, specific chemotherapy, uh, immunotherapy would be uh, then monitored and seen in future pro uh, prospectively whether they develop different outcomes compared to individuals who are not smokers. But yeah, good luck getting an ethics approval for that. So. That's not possible. So the other option that we had was to link the exposure, which is smoking in this case, to the outcome, which is response to the treatment. But we have to take into consideration confounders in this situation. The beautiful thing about RCTs is their randomization, which actually uh, very strongly lets us to make, makes us the assumption that the exogeneity or unconfoundedness is present. In other words, Assignment to treatment A or treatment B is not at all influenced by any other baseline characteristics and it is completely random. We don't have such advantages in real world settings to Vina. And 
there is a workaround, a statistical workaround that we use, which is known as propensity scores, uh, which is calculated. And then uh, it's used for adjusting our treatment, uh, treatment effect to see whether the baseline characteristics are, when balanced, whether there is a treatment effect still present or not. So basically what we do is we uh, use a predictive modeling technique to come up with a prediction or the score of an individual to be assigned to a specific treatment based on or conditioned on their covariates, baseline covariates. And once we weigh them according to these probability of being assigned to the treatment, we can now ascertain that all the measured confounders are taken into consideration and whatever difference we see in the overall survival or the outcome is basically driven by the exposure, which is smoking in this case. There's a very strong assumption that we make here, and the assumption is that there are no unmeasured confounders, and it is an impossible assumption to meet. So uh, uh, some advanced analyticals, uh, analytical techniques, like for example, sensitivity analysis goes into play to make sure that the results or the outcomes that we get out of this kind of analysis are trustworthy. So how we do this, in R, uh, there are a few packages, I'll be mentioning them uh, in the end, but we can use these packages to use a regression model, for example. I have used regression model in this code, but we can use any other uh, modeling technique to calculate the scores. An important point here is that outcome is not taken into consideration when we calculate the scores. The entire intention is just to balance the two arms of this uh, pseudo R city to make sure that the uh, that there are no systematic differences between them. So a plot like this shows us that, for example, the covariates are balanced before and after an adjustment. So the way we look at balance is the standardized mean differences. So uh, usually the cutoff for standardized mean differences is 0 0.1. This is again arbitrary like p-value. But at the same time, uh, we, it gives us a good idea that how bad the imbalance was before we did the balancing and after we adjusted using these uh, propensity scores. We also look at the distribution of propensity scores to make sure that the distribution is not lopsided for one specific arm and it is more or less symmetrical before, uh, which, which is not the case in unadjusted sample, but definitely in adjusted sample. So what happens once we do these kind of adjustments? So this is a typical table one uh, that we see in any oncology trial results, which is the baseline characteristics. So if I bring your attention, we can sometimes be lucky and we have the covariates which are already balanced right from the beginning. We don't even need to balance uh, them. For example, uh, the number of sites of metastasis in this case. An important point to consider here is that sometimes when we balance other covariates, because it's a multivariable problem and it's an optimization issue, we might lose balance in, an arm, uh, in, an, in a specific covariate which was already balanced before. The second is uh, balanced post IPTW outcome, which is like, uh, for example, in age and sex, we can see that the prevalence of different groups were not balanced initially, but after uh, doing propensity score uh, weighting, we were able to achieve balance. Sometimes it is not possible, as, as I did mention, that it's a multivariate problem, and in, in a multivariate problem, it is uh, while we are trying to adjust for different variables, some variables might meet our cutoff, some might not. And we can see that two very important ones, race and ECOG, which is the performance score for the patients, uh, they both were not balanced in spite of using them in our IPTW model. Now, all the balancing aspect, because they do not take outcome into consideration, this is the study design approach. And now that we have seen that study design approach did not help in adjusting for these specific two, two covariates, we can use them to adjust our Cox model uh, in order to make sure that the conclusions we draw are trustworthy. So what was the conclusion? Well, uh, initially in an unweighted fashion when we saw it, there was no difference between smokers versus no, non-smokers when, when, when it came to the response to pembrolizumab, the, the immunotherapy in question here. But with help of balancing, we were able to, uh, we were able to 
uncover the relationship between uh, smoking and non-smoking uh, individuals. I know the p-value of 0 0.3 is not that great, and at the same time, uh, we cannot trust these results because we have made a very strong assumption. So, uh, but still we were able to publish this in JAMA Oncology because we were able to also convince the reviewers that no, we have done our thorough diligence and uh, we found that there is actually, even through sensitivity analysis, we were not able to find any problems in this uh, relationship that we found. What we also found was that uh, if we look at, there, there was an article published for RCTs uh, for immunotherapy, specifically the ones in our uh, interest, the Pembro uh, and the drugs of similar category. And what we also found that if we do the subgroup analysis of individuals who received uh, Pembro and we divide them into smokers and non-smokers, indeed the immunotherapy, the, the immunotherapy was working better in smokers compared to non-smokers. I'm no way advocating use of smoking here. I'm just trying to let know that perhaps there is mechanistically some mechanism where uh, smokers are better responders when it comes to immune therapy. And this could be concluded both by looking at real world data as well as uh, RCT data at this stage. So the two conclusions that we, uh, that I would like to share today uh, with everyone here is that, uh, real world data can indeed complement RCT findings. Now, there are, just in this smoking case, as we saw that ethically it is impossible to even conduct an RCT to uncover an answer for the question that our client was interested in. Sometimes, uh, practically, the feasibility of doing an RCT is not enough. So, uh, real world data and the data we used is coming from the community, from the academic settings, from the clinics, the clinical registries. So. The major opportunity I believe here the real world data has is the generalizability. As Colin did mention that most of the times the result of RCTs do not translate well into real world settings. But once we are having outputs from the real world data, it could be trusted. But there's a big caveat, we have to be very careful in drawing any conclusion uh, from the real world uh, setting. Just because systematically the data is not randomized, it is susceptible to so many uh, issues relating to confounding. There are another set of issues relating to missingness as well, but uh, that's a different talk altogether. But uh, the, the point being here, definitely real world data analysis will never replace RCT, but will definitely and is definitely providing us with complementary evidence to support causal inference to the stage that it is routine for us to make applications to drug approving authorities like USFDA or EMA or even uh, public bodies like NICE to support or not support claim of specific drugs for doing uh, for a specific treatment. Because there is such a heavy use of advanced analytic analytics in analyzing uh, this real world data, R has become, has become a very powerful tool to help us with this. I know my colleagues who have been using SAS for 20 years or so, but they are now learning R because the techniques we use are so advanced and so recently been discovered that it's only the open community which has picked up the, the pace of coming up with tools to analyze this data in the way it, it needs to be done according to these statisticians. So definitely the packages that I have mentioned here, a couple of them did not have official logos. So table one and server logo might look like this. So, uh, and tidyverse is definitely pretty handy when it comes to uh, cleaning up the data. I believe everyone here knows about it. And weight, it helps in calculating the weight. Cobalt helped us uh, in creating those beautiful plots where we saw how different covariates uh, gets influenced before and after weighting. Also, uh, table one was the characteristic baseline table. We were able to generate that table just by a one line command using our table one package and survival and serve minor for survival analysis as a staple. With this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and also the organizers for giving me this opportunity to come and speak here in person. And 
especially uh, if you would have noticed the way our talks are sequenced is just amazing the the way uh, kulim's talk helped me to uh, set up a stage for me to speak about this and i'm sure our markdown is coming up next which is going to be helpful a, a lot of things that we did was impossible without our markdown too so it's beautiful and we need to appreciate that uh, that's it thank you so much Thank you very much. I think we're probably going to have to move straight on to the next speaker to keep to time. So we have Jason next. Um, sorry. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I took up loads of time earlier with the tech team to try and get my talk working, and they were great. So thank you very much to them. Um, so, I'm a research nurse in the emergency department and I'm going to talk to you about how um, R is helping us to do observational studies in the emergency department. So, I've got two things to click, otherwise it's all going to go. So, oh, yeah, great. So, um, I work at Bart's Health and uh, Bart's Health is, well, part of it, the Royal London is that blue box there. And um, we look after East London. And um, our emergency departments say, see around 350,000 patients per year in, uh, in the department. And uh, we do um, clinical trials in, um, in the emergency setting. And these are trials that are either observational or interventional. And these trials are run nationally and they are run in a, in a number of centers. And uh, often always looking at kind of uh, some of the studies we've done recently are looking at smoking cessation in the emergency department, but then we might also look at uh, ways of managing chest injuries after trauma. So there's a huge variety. Everything that comes to the emergency department is, is fair game for, for, for research. Um, so observational trials and interventional trials, what's the difference? One, as you've, we've, we've just heard, you do something to someone and you, and you see what happened. And observational trials, you don't do anything to someone, and you just collect the data about them. Now, this is the data from the UK clinical trials database, and it shows that over time, all trial, all the number of all trials is increasing, but the number of observational trials in blue is also increasing. So it's becoming a more popular way of collecting information about patients, and um, and and that doesn't really tell the whole story though, because what actually is a bigger story is that the proportion of patients who go into trials, most patients are going into observational trials because they are so much larger and they collect so many more people. But observational trials typically are done in a manual fashion, which means that nurses like me identify patients, go up to them, ask for their consent to enroll them in a study, and then we collect information by going to the record looking down the, 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 the fields and recording it on our paper COF, and then going to the other computer and typing it into the database. So we're talking about potentially three hours per patient. Nurses are expensive. Probably about 40 to 60 pounds per patient goes into operational trial in terms of nurse time. And it's quite repetitive and boring. And there's lots of risk of errors because copying things between things isn't, isn't a great way of doing things. R solves a lot of those problems um, because it doesn't get bored. It's quite cheap to run once it's, once it's written. And, um, and it identifies everyone who meets the inclusion criteria. It doesn't look, it doesn't have any prejudices. If the data's there and they're the right person, they go in the study. Now, the caveat being, if, if the patient has to be consented, there's a kind of a step where that process has to happen. And then the identifiers are, are used to select the patients. But if there's a non-consenting study, then there's no need for nurses at all, apart from this one who wrote the code. So it, is, it has a lot of potential for saving lots of money and making observational studies much easier to run in the emergency department. So the big change that allows this to happen is ECDS. And ECDS is a new data set in, in the UK, and it only kind of really came on the on, on board in like 2018, 19. And the good thing about it is that it describes the who, what, where, when, why of emergency care. So it tells us who the patient is, what happens to them, so in some cases where they were when it happened to them. It doesn't tell us why, we have to figure that out, that bit out ourselves, but it is, it's coded. So it has SNOMED codes, it has um, 
codes for arrival mechanism and the department types that they, they go to. And it's mandatory, so every hospital in the UK that has an emergency department has to submit this data. Well, that's great, because that means you can standardise things and you can start to, um, you can start to approach, um, you can have, a, to, to do an observational study, you've got a place to start. You can select a population using ECDS, and I click forward too quickly. So, a worked example, we care for, uh, emergency departments care for patients who have chest pain. And one of the things we have to find out is, it does this patient, are they having a heart attack? And one of the ways we do that, well, lots of, well, the clinicians do that, is they take a history in and they'll take some blood tests, they'll do some ECGs. One of the blood tests that they do, typically at the moment, is taken when they arrive and then three hours later. There's evidence that suggests that we might be able to narrow that time down to one hour after they arrive, but we want to find out whether or not that is safe in the UK population. So we are running an observational study in, the, in the, our department to do this. Now, that's the data set that the trial team wanted. And when we showed this to the research nurse team, they cried, um, because it wasn't going to be very fun collecting 207 data points manually. So we thought, well, the only way we're going to be able to do this is by using R. And um, I've been using R, so this was my problem. And, um, and so we've had to go in it. And uh, we write our, our script in dplyr. It talks to our database, pulls the data, returns it, we process it, we build out our observational data set for them, and then it's uploaded into their REDCap database. Brilliant. Great. The nurses are all happy, and uh, so is the PI, and so is the study centre, because that means that we are um, delivering a quite a challenging study that we wouldn't have actually taken on otherwise. So how did we do it? This is uh, using ECDS, so we have to, there's two things that we have to make sure happen, that we get the right patients, so they all have to have chest pain, so we're looking at the ECDS table and we're pulling in the chief complaint for chest pain, and then we're making sure that the patient's the right age and that they're the right hospital and that we're not getting the um, same day emergency care patients, and then that becomes one kind of patient cohort. And then we also need to make sure that they're the right patients that have had the blood test, because that's what we're really interested in. Um, so they need to have the blood tests and they need to have an ECG, so we pull those in, except blood tests aren't, just because you do a blood test doesn't mean you get a result. And so if you do a blood test and that comes back as a, if the sample was, collect, uh, was, um, was, was corrupted in some way, then uh, we can't include those patients unless they've had another result. So we had to build some logic in to check that the blood test was happening, but it happened in the emergency department while the patient was there. So that's what we were doing here. So clinical event, uh, troponing, and then down here, making sure that it happened while the patient was still in the emergency department. Cool. Now, you've already talked about how hellish the data is. Um, emergency care data has become more complicated because we don't just have emergency departments, we have emergency departments and urgent care centres and same day emergency care and um, walk-in centres. And then also some of our patients go from the emergency department to the hyperacute cardiac centre, then come back to the tertiary hospital and then go back to somewhere else. And that means that they might have five or six rows in their clinical data set that I have to flatten into one. And so that was quite a big learning process for me because one, I didn't know some of these things existed um, because it wasn't how I saw the patient's journey, but then bringing it all together is bringing encounters, well, we have encounters for each visit and it all didn't line up very well. So we had to do some work on that. And that was, that was a bit of a trick, tricky. Um, the part of the uh, data set is they want a very um, descriptive past medical history and risk factors. Even though our centre is fully electronic for um, healthcare recording for emergency departments, so our, our drugs and our documentation is all there, we don't like putting coded variables into boxes. And so past medical history is free text. And it's also, if you've ever seen how clinicians write um, at all, uh, but especially about past medical history, we all have lots of abbreviations, we, we, we kind of shorten things, we, we, and some, it's completely variable. So we've looked at 
the past medical history for patients who've had previous admissions within the hospital, patients who are admitted, and pulled the, the coding in, which is always excellent because it's done by a professional coder, and we were able to use that to, to decide, well, this was a diagnosis that was pre-existing, this is a diagnosis that was made at the time, and this is something that happened in the future, which gives us a past medical history, what happened on the day, and what were, what were future outcomes for our population. Things that we couldn't do, so ECGs, ECGs are currently electronic, but the values that we need out of them are stored in an image file, which I can't do with anything with at the moment, um, just for want of time, and I don't want to go near it. Um, coronary catheterization reports are, are, are free text. I didn't have time to write an NLP, an NLP model, and I thought it was better not to do it. So still, if a patient has a, catheter, a, a coronary catheterization, our nurses do go and look at that, and I build a work list for them to focus in and just look at the, 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 those reports. Smoking status, no one records that very well in the, in the coded formula, so we weren't able to report that consistently and any blood tests that we didn't do that they, that they didn't in Europe. So, of the 200 and so fields, we get 87% in an automated fashion. We also get follow-up at 28 days and a year, and uh, we're putting about 500 patients in every month into this study, which is quite, it's a significant proportion of other patients. So, it was quite painful to write that first bit, and then someone said, oh, well, we've got another trial. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not, not, not interested. I don't want to do another trial the way I've done it. So I thought, well, what if we made it, instead of writing it per trial, what if we wrote it per data set that's needed? And we described, or we had a way of describing a data set that was needed for a clinical trial. So if you want men with chest pain who are over the age of 64, then what if you just told R that, and then it use that logic model that you've built and knew what to pull out. And so we started to think about that and develop it a bit more. Some of the code I'd obviously already written and I could bring it through and try to build a logic model around describing data sets first and then are interpreting that description of a data set to pull out the, requ the required data. So that's what I've done and we define a population, and you can, you've got all the different variables in ECDS that you can pull out, the admission status. Um, clinical events can be used as filters, so you can kind of add them together with an and or or. So people with ECGs and troponins, or PCG, ECGs and troponins, or X-rays, you know, it wouldn't be something you choose, but you can choose populations based on combining clinical events. And then you can also decide what other information you want. So do you want their ECG results? Do you want their um, chest X-ray um, free text reports? And those can all be pulled in automatically. And then uh, what medications were they given? Do you want to pull that out as well? So that can be drawn in. Do you want, and, and ultimately what you get is a, a large data set, but it's the starting point for building the final data set. So you haven't got to do all of the uh, repetitive designing of the data set you just have to do the processing afterwards, which is the kind of the bit that you do have to do each time for any project. So that's good. Um, and I think that's potentially quite powerful. This is a project which I think probably is, is something that could be pretty useful for other centers to do. There's nothing here that's unique to us. What is unique is the bit where my code interfaces with the servers uh, or the data warehouse. And I think there's probably some work there which uh, another team could localize to their own data warehouse and they could just build out off the, um, the, the, specific the data specification to pull from their data warehouse. And then I could give that other team my data specification and they could run it and they could get back the same data that I got back in the same way, in the same format. So the data spe specification looks like this. I can't click on this link because it won't work. But there is a, um, there's an Airtable form, and if you know Airtable, it's a database that you can create nice fancy forms with. Um, and that, I thought, was, well, that's a good way of a clinician who isn't our um, literate, they could go in and they can describe their data set using a, a standard form, and they can use that. Oh, thank you, yeah, great. I'm not on the internet. No. <laughs> um, don't worry, it's okay. They believe me, that's, that's enough. Um, <laughs> 
and they can just you can describe your data set. I've put the libraries of clinical events in there just so they can be selected, and um, ultimately then my code interfaces using the Airtable API and put and extracts the data down. So what you've probably got is a way of kind of creating a recipe for an observational clinical trial that can be run anywhere, which I think is really exciting because that's what I want to do is run observational trials everywhere because we can answer loads of questions and, and do some good. Um, so, you know, I think there's great potential for other people to use it and I'd love to hear from anyone who did want to use it. Um, it massively would reduce the costs of running observational trials and allow our research nurses who, who love working in A&E departments to focus on the, the, the interface with patients and getting them to be involved in research and all that, that sort of thing. But maybe we could do more research with the same resource. And the accuracy is so much improved because there's no copying and pasting, there's no transcription or anything. Um, and um, that's me, I'm Jason Pot everywhere. Um, and uh, if you'd like to talk to me about this, I'd love to hear from you. Um, it's um, been a bit of a kind of a labour of love, needs a little bit more attention. I think it could probably do some interesting things. And uh, kind of, I probably only got here because of the R community supporting and saying, oh, no, just do it this way, or don't, just do it that way, every time I ask a question on Slack. So thank you to everyone who's given me a hint or a tip about anything. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jason. That's a great talk. I like your quote about um, R never getting bored. I, I find R just goes straight to angry with me. Um, but our final talk of this session is Richard. So um, over to you. Excellent. Afternoon. Um, right. I think the slides will come up. Oh, gone too far. So this is one of those opportunities to get your phones out because everyone's bored with my thing. He says R doesn't get bored. And, um, the QR code will link to the report I'm going to be talking about. So if you want to follow and see how it all functions, follow the QR code. I'll give you a second or two to do that. Um, just what so it'd be easier in trying to show you some HTML as I went along. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about a piece of work which has been sponsored by the NHSR community, looking at creating a sort of reproducible analytical pipeline for reports. And I'm just going to use a shimmy. It's not going to be a talk about the shimmy, so you don't need to understand the shimmy. I should get out of the way of the QR code. It's on the TV screens around you if you want to try and get a bit closer. Um, so the idea was, R may not get bored, but analysts get bored. I mean, I don't know about you, but 20 years of cutting and pasting Excel reports into PowerPoints does get a bit monotonous after a while. And I thought, well, there must be a better way of doing it in R. And so what I tried to do was take a piece of work I've been doing for years, about 10 years working on shimmy, is actually try and convert it into a report which doesn't take me 10, takes me 10 minutes to run on a weekly basis. Now, invariably, we're doing these reports on a monthly basis. So think about a performance report you have to do on a monthly basis. And is there an easier way to do it? Now, most of us will say, let's build a dashboard. Now, we always build very expensive Tableau dashboards or even shiny dashboards or flex, dashboard, flex dashboards. And they don't get used because no one wants to press any buttons. They just want to be able to read a report. So to do a, um, a dashboard is going to change data literacy. We need to get our decision makers, as Peter was talking about this morning, more engaged with data. Well, to get more engaged with data, let's take them halfway. Let's show them the report they can play with in a meeting. Well, that's clever. So that's the QR code. Everyone got our count to five and we'll take it down again. One. All right. Everybody got it? OK, we jump back to the slides again. So. Is there a halfway house where we can build this sort of report which looks like a PDF, looks like a normal report, but actually it's HTML and built with R. So, and this can be sent out and be used and be more reproducible. So let's see how we got on. So the data set we're going to use is a shimmy. Now I could talk about a shimmy, but it'll take two days and I've only got 15 minutes. So it's the national mortality ratio for hospitals and non-specialist hospitals. It's been published since March 21. It's probably the longest running machine learning algorithm in the world, but no one really knows it, no one really uses it, which is probably an argument about why machine learning and algorithms is gonna be a hard battle to win. It is a mandatory indicator, which means that people have to report in their quality account. So boards are interested in this, they can't ignore it. And also the press love it. If it wasn't as such thing as COVID, this gets you on the front page of the Sunday, get on the front page of the Sun every, every month if it comes out and you're the worst in the country. 
The quality of the output is determined by the quality of the data, as we've just been hearing about, it's NHS data. And it's public, publicly, publicly available through NHS Digital. They publish every month for a 12 month period. Um, they publish all the indicator values, a load of contextual data, the model predictors, so you can build something, I'll show you what we've done later and talk about that later, but the, quality, the data quality reports and the methodology. So it's all there. And what we've done is just taken the publicly available data to build this report, because that's what the boards had to take a view on, is the publicly available data. So why are? I've come to an R conference, I'm going to talk about why are. Well, this costs trusts upwards of £40,000 a year to buy a product from HED, Dr. Foster's, CHKS, to sell them the hospital standardized mortality ratio of a shimmy. And a lot of your performance teams will be using this. And most of them will get they will go to Dr. Foster's and they'll say, can you produce a, a trust report? And back will come 20 pages of cut and paste from the tool. And we can do better than that with the shimmy, the data nationally published. So I've taken the data and tried to build an R markdown tool, which of course will be open source, free, and take yours and use it. It, it will be on the GitHub. It's private just now on NHSR, but it will be public this weekend, hopefully. So it takes one solution from the data being published by NHS Digital all the way through to forecasting the future shimmy for your trust. Um, Markdown produces obviously an interactive HTML way of using the document. Hopefully you're playing on your phones. And of course it doesn't need a server unlike shimmy. So it allows you just to send that HTML file. We haven't run into any security issues so far with sending HTML files around, but I know that might cause issues around HTML files, but you could also stick it on the intranet. Um, and also we're using a lot of automation of inline R so that it would do things like trends, which provides a basic narrative, because I don't know about you, but most of my decision makers just want to know, is it going up or going down, and is it higher than low over the last month? So the build looks like this. The data is published in the NHS Digital website. Just now we've got a problem because it's published in zip archives, and there's no way to actually open a zip archive on the internet to import into R. Tried a few ways, can't do it. So you've got to download the zip archive, a bit of work. But then you just go into the data load, press change the data of the data load, and it will run, basically it will add to um, union onto the data set, longitudinal constitution um, data set. So it goes all the way back to March 2011. So you can run the whole data set through. It just unions on the latest data file. It records the archive copy because sometimes mistakes happen. So you don't lose it. It records an archive copy so you can always roll back. There is an automation script. If you're producing more than one trust report, you go into automation script, select the trust you want, and go and make a cup of tea, and you come back, it's done. The big work, the big load is done by this big box here. Um, it's a modularized parent markdown, so there's a big module file, which is calling in a load of child scripts, which are defined by a load of parameters, and so Joanna mentioned those this morning. So we've got a load of those, just set them to true or false, if you want to include or exclude a chapter. So if you don't need to do a quality account, because it's not that time of year, you just set that to false, and you bring it back in months later. There's a few other, um, function and format files, it exports to HTML file. You can just print that as you would from um, Explorer or, or Chrome straight to a PDF. The only thing you lose is the interactivity, but because you've got slash new page everywhere, it's all properly formatted. So you don't have issues of charts going halfway across the page and things. In terms of the chapters and children, uh, as I say, the chapterization is just run by YAML. At the top, they just send true or false. The TOC, is automatically generated by the YAML, so there's no need to go in and change all the, the um, chapter numbers, they all automatically reset. You just nip the children. Um, I learned all that from last year's R conference with that talk about Marvel. Um, and basically in the header for the R markdown, you just do eval equals prams include, and that's it, set out to true or false, chapter comes in and out. It's as easy as that. And you're basically, your child, child files are basically just another RMD, so it's, there's no complicated factors in that. In terms of inline text, notice where it gets really complicated. I've, you know that thing where um, Chris was mentioning version 1.1? This is version 1.0 in the top half, the second half is like version 2. So I started creating the, the um, inline text in the um, tables and things and bringing it in as completed paste functions, rather than having long convoluted if statements because you tend to do that thing where if X is bigger than Y, do X, otherwise Y, and then you start getting a whole load of um, 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 inline text, which gets a little bit difficult to debug. But things like the asterisk works to adding a new bullet, 
um, use the, and I saw this in Joanne's talk, if the table uses the if statement with n row is nothing, to zero true or false, to drop in and out text, depending on what's in your table. So that's your basic inline. And it all looks like this lovely, nice formatted text. Um, yeah, one of the bottoms not been done yet, because that's the bit I didn't quite get done. But you can see that new page, just to point out, there's a slash new page. That does nothing to the HTML, but does everything to the PDF. So you just put slash new pages in, in front of all your child documents, and they'll all be on new pages. Interactivity, we all like a bit of interactivity. If you look at this report on your phones, this one allows you to pinch in, pinch out. So it zooms in, zooms out, using graphy. I like graphy because it's really easy to write. It's a lot easier than plotty, because it's just ggplot, and all you do, your geo, is you do underscore interactive, and you stick tooltip equals tooltip, you create a tooltip in paste, and that's it, job done. And you've got an interactive document. Um, the purple and blue triangles point out two change points in the data set, and it adds the arrows. Um, there should be a little gray box behind the um, two data points were elevated, where it shows a data quality issue. I wanted ribbon charts. ggplot doesn't do ribbon charts, so these are built in Plotty. Uh, there's a function which you can then borrow and do your own thing with, but it basically does three different color options based on deciles. So these are all deciles going across. It does an orange dot for the trust you're interested in, and it just allows you to use a, a ribbon plot. But again, it just passes the data frame and the, tool, tool, the um, trust name to give you the ribbon plot. You could have done that with anything, any of your functions. So they're a part of a tool which has been built and they can use it elsewhere. In terms of another NHSR project, obviously Chris's lovely funnel plot R to address the um, over dispersion in the funnel plot. Um, if you've used funnel plots before, you'll know that has limits. They don't show very well in here, but I'm sure on the screens on the side you can see them. So funnel plot R allows us to create a uh, lovely funnel plot. It's throwing up a few errors just now because it's built on a ver previous version. So I've got to sort out a few of the, um, uh, sorry, just of some warnings. The size of the dots is based on the excess deaths. The color coded is basically a standard RAG. I think I'm the first person to mention RAG today, which is an achievement for an NHS conference. Um, we all love the fact that R always requires you to do two different things two different ways. So interactivity with plotting. If you look at this table in your report, if you zoom in, it then expands out. So this very complex bubble chart allows you to zip in so you can actually show people. And the chart size is varied by using um, a floor condition. So the actual fact we use in the chunk set, the actual size of a chunk is determined by a number of rows in your table, um, rows in the chart. So it just makes it a little bit less because otherwise you get like really big ones for some trusts. Other elements in the repository, which are also coming. So the data load, I've talked about it earlier, that addresses all the issues about the trust mergers, which happen, and the site mergers, and creates a few new measures which aren't created by NHSD. There's a directory dashboard, which does do flex dashboard, but this uses a different version of the shimmy data. There's a thing called the shimmy extract service, and they provide a CSV file to every trust of all their data, which has been used to calculate the shimmy. And you, that takes that data set schema and builds a directorate level dashboard. So you can do like a specialized view. If you want to look at your orthopedics and see what their mortality is like for fracture cathema, you can then just see that gives you a trust level report. That also includes VLAD and QSUM visualizations as well, which are often used for mortality. But also there's another tool which actually is called a shimmy predictor, which takes model predictors and says, predicts the expected deaths based on the data set today, because the data set is usually five months out of date. We talked about a three month lag before, we got a five month lag with this, which of course is very not so great for boards because they don't really want to know what deaths were like in June and July, they want to know what deaths are like in November. So it allows you to get an estimate of what that's going to be. In terms of lessons learned, this has actually gone down really well. We've used it for about a month, a year and a half now, showing it through to users, which are a mixed group of nurses, doctors, clinicians, and mortality leads, and they have no issue with using the HTML report. And it's really good for these remote meetings because you can just go through it really easily, zip up, zip down, zoom in, zoom out. Um, the child files mean nothing is ever lost. So someone will say, I want the position analysis on looking at crude versus shimmy. You go, right, I'll put it in for you. And they know that next month we don't need to do it. So we just drop it out. And next month they'll say, where's that piece of report? I'll stick it back in again for them. Um, so you can always bring it back in and it's really easy just to rerun the file. Um, R, of course, is incredibly flexible. 
but also it does mean we're challenging. I wrote it all twice or three times, changing the interactivity depending on what I thought was the easiest way of getting the right colors and formats. Creating a night text is easy. Um, this was an errant return. But because you're using inline text and actually trying to do this report, the biggest challenge you face is making it legible to users. Because we've got things like, you know, a bit of snake case or a bit of camel case going on, depending on how good you are remembering what your variable names are. You can't put not plain English with underscores into a table because it doesn't look very good going to board and public. You need to change it to plain English. So there's lots of backslashes for column names. So you want to do that last minute before you do that piece of work, because otherwise you could lose your column names just get crazy. Um, this, somebody asked me how long did this take? I don't like to say because I'll be doing it on Saturday afternoon in front of a TV watching a football. It does become all consuming, but it's a great way of improving your R skills because you start playing with data, you get to know the data, you keep going, oh, I could just do that. And I've made some notes today about doing L lappy with lists and going, all right, maybe that's how I should do that function, which I use five times. I could just do a list and make it L lappy and make it easier. So it has taken hours and it never stops because it's like the fourth road bridge. Um, so next steps, this is my last slide before T. It will be going on GitHub with a long list of potential enhancements because there always is, because people will be, oh, could you just do this? Could you just do that? Why is there not a map? Um, so it's going to go on our NHSR GitHub because it's been sponsored by them. There's a future list of web developments and also anything else you want to put as a pull request, please let us know. It'd be good to road test it over trust. We have tested it with the Northeast. They thought it was fantastic. Um, I should say that, it's bad to say that. No one's going to say it's, oh, it was really badly received. Um, but it is about, also, by the way, it's still relevant to ICSs because of the 30-day post-discharge mortality. So this is very much a system-level mortality measure. Um, and I'm up for doing sort of sessions on how to do the, how to do this bit and that bit and how to do trends. But please don't mention Quattro. This is done in Markdown. I haven't, even thought about should I move it to Quattro and I'm sure there's people from Posit who will be happy to tell me oh it's really easy to change over but the wife would probably like us to do something else on Saturday afternoons so 3.30 bang on time thank you very much Richard round of applause please thank you. so so you've all learned to really uh, uh, well and break uh, but just before the break I have just one announcement so we are very keen to hear the voices of people who've come for the first time to the conference. So when you do go to the break, you'll see Rachel wearing a big hat, bigger than mine. Um, and just go and give your name to her if you're happy to talk to her for a few minutes. And the, that, that would be tomorrow. The, you, you'll give your time tomorrow, but you'll register today. So in your break time, any, anybody who's new to the conference and happy to share their views, we'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, we'll see you very shortly after the break. Thank you very much. Thanks. So then the next session is going to be a number of lightning talks. So um, the clues in the name, they're, they're very, very fast. Uh, so for the benefit of the speakers, I'm going to sit here at the front and I'm going to raise my hand when you've got a minute left, just so you, you've got an idea of your timings. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll introduce Victor Yu. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Victor and I work for Hertfordshire County Council's uh, Public Health Evidence and uh, Intelligence team. Um, the topic I'm going to be talking about today is about a local uh, analysis we've done on the National Childhood Measurement Programme in Hertfordshire, uh, where we're predicting uh, childhood obesity through uh, classification uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, this analysis is still sort of a work in progress and it's not uh, exhaustive or completive by any means. Um, and the talk is going to be more about the analysis itself rather than how it's uh, specifically done in R, but I will go over uh, parts about how I did do the analysis uh, within R. So just a bit of background uh, about the NCMP. It measures the height and weight of children uh, aged at reception, so those aged four and five, and 
uh, children at year six, uh, so those aged between 10 and 11, uh, across all schools in England as part of uh, government, government uh, initiatives to assess uh, childhood obesity, but also a host of other related objectives as well. Uh, so for example, it helps uh, inform local planning and delivery of services for children. It supports analysis of trends in growth patterns and obesity. It helps uh, increase public and professional understanding of weight issues in children, and it helps uh, support engagement uh, for families around healthy lifestyles and uh, weight issues. Uh, so the program is delivered nationally uh, by local authorities, uh, including those within Hertfordshire, and the IT system is uh, hosted and maintained by NHS uh, Digital. So just going over briefly about childhood obesity more specifically in Hertfordshire, there's a number of long-term health uh, consequences about why we might want to study childhood obesity, for example. Um, it, of course, it increases your risk uh, for developing uh, numerous chronic diseases, for example. Um, there's uh, also some aspects uh, around emotional uh, and also uh, mental uh, development as well. And also, um, national results from the program um, from 2020 to 2021 uh, reveal uh, significant differences in terms of prevalence nationally uh, for obesity, potentially as an impact uh, of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So as you can see here, for reception uh, figures, it increased uh, by around 4.5%, uh, and for uh, year six um, numbers, it increased by roughly the same figure as well. Although it has uh, dropped uh, within the next school cohort, um, and within Hobbitshire as well, there have been a number of strategies uh, which have been uh, put in place to try and tackle this, for example, a whole systems approach. And whilst uh, Hobbitshire figures are lower than national figures, it remains uh, quite high and it's growing uh, in terms of its secular increase. So just going over some uh, very basic tables and line graphs about uh, prevalence of Hertfordshire compared to England, uh, which is represented by the black line here, you can see that uh, whilst Hertfordshire is uh, lower uh, in terms of uh, prevalence uh, for overweight and obesity combined, so it's statistically significant, as you can see with the green dots here, um, there remains a significant uh, inter-district uh, variation within Hertfordshire. So there is some elements of health inequalities here. Again, same goes for uh, year six as well. Whilst Hertfordshire performs better than England, uh, again, a significant inter-district variation remains. So uh, in terms of the analysis which we've done, we wanted to build upon a previous uh, briefing note which we did last year um, which mainly examined local trends at a descriptive level. Um, but what we wanted to do was to build upon this where we now had the potential to link students from reception uh, to their measurements in year six for the first time. So there was some data linkage possibilities. Uh, and we wanted to implement some machine learning uh, classification algorithms uh, to predict whether a pupil will have changed BMI categories from uh, reception to year six. Um, so as you can see, these are just some of the outcomes which we uh, decided to uh, try and predict uh, throughout the study. Um, so there's four BMI categories, uh, underweight, healthy weight, overweight, and very overweight. The first outcome uh, treats each category separately. Outcome B treats underweight and healthy weight separately, whilst it groups, aggregates overweight and very overweight or obese together. Outcome C uh, groups underweight and healthy weight together and overweight and very overweight together whilst outcome D groups everything except for obese uh, together. And for the algorithms, uh, we did a uh, classic tenfold cross-validation, um, again, to predict whether people will have changed category year six, sorry, uh, will have changed category from reception uh, at year six. Uh, these are just some of the variables uh, which we decided to um, include in the study. Uh, not all of these were included in the actual analysis, but. These were included in the enhanced NCP data set. So we had their uh, height and respective Z score, their weight, their BMI, what status um, the particular row was at, their personal details, IMD decile and ON, ONS geo segmentation based on their home address, LSOA, the equivalent for their school address, uh, their ethnicity, rural urban status, BMI category, of course, and also their distance from the school postcode to the uh, students' uh, home postcode. In addition, we decided to uh, join um, a metric called the Access to Healthy Assets and uh, Hazards 
Um, we used an aggregate war domain. So what this is, is, is a, yeah, so it's a multi-dimensional index, uh, which was developed by the CDRC, and it's just a general rough measurement of how healthy a uh, neighborhood is. Uh, this is just a very simple flowchart of um, <coughs> a, the initial extraction we got from the N NCMP, just some exclusions based on impossible data entries or miss missing measurements. So overall, we had a, a total, uh, some size of roughly around uh, 10,000 students after, after linkage from reception in year six. So there's, there's a whole lot of EDA which I wanted to include initially, but this scatterplot just basically shows um, the BMI central at reception compared to year six. So the gold standard really is this large blue section here, which captures the students who are healthy weight at reception um, and who are also healthy weight at year six as well. Um, Uh, this is just a Sankey plot, which sort of shows uh, previous slide as well. And these were just uh, some of the basic algorithms we used. Um, these are very standard algorithms which were used in classification. Um, in terms of model evaluation, we, in terms of accuracy metrics, we were getting roughly around 75 to 80 percent, uh, around 80 percent for outcome B, and pretty similar figures for outcome C and D as well. Um, as well, we decided to incorporate an ensemble um, collection of the uh, four algorithms we used, and it was roughly around the same as around 78 to 80 percent accuracy. But of course, accuracy isn't everything. Uh, we can also look at uh, additional metrics as well, specifically sensitivity and specificity. Um, for me, uh, for me, in this analysis, specificity refers to uh, the. Um, <coughs> correct predictions for excess weight, and it was uh, not as, <clears throat> uh, I didn't get as good figures as I would have hoped uh, in, co in comparison to predicting uh, those who were considered non-excess weight. So uh, this is only looking at outcome C, um, and you, you can see the imbalance between sensitivity and specificity for all of the algorithms. Um, as well, I incorporated a dummy um, sort of uh, prediction as well, where we sort of just uh, considered uh, the weight class at reception, to be, where the, it would be exactly the same as if it would be at year six. Uh, I want to time to go through this. Um, so, in terms of possible extensions which we could consider, uh, we definitely want to consider reformatting the code uh, in the tidy models framework. I initially used Carol package, which was developed by Max Kuhn, although he's now um, shifted focus uh, towards the tidy models framework of packages. I want to consider the inclusion of clinical and non-clinical data sets held by our community NHS Trust. Um, there's a lot of antenatal and maternal data, which we're trying to get, which will definitely uh, enrich uh, the data set we're using. Some additional hyperparameter tuning as well would definitely be helpful as I only use standard um, grid search um, in Carrot. As well, there's also the chance of possibly approaching the target variables, treating it as a raw BMI rather than uh, a categorical as well. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you. Could I uh, invite our next speaker up, please, Anne? Hi everyone, so I'm Anne, I'm from the Data Analytics team at the Health Foundation, and I'm here to share our learnings from using R to explore why ambulance waiting times have been getting worse. Just for a bit of context, earlier this year at Data Analytics, we wanted to do more reactive pieces of analysis on topics that are relevant to health and social care. During our scoping phase, NHS performance, including ambulance response times and emergency care, was under a lot of scrutiny from the media and beyond. I'm sure you guys don't need me to tell you. So our task was to explore current trends in ambulance response times and identify factors that could be contributing to this using publicly available data in a timely manner. But what was the challenge? We had to explore various different open data sets with various different formats and date ranges under time constraints 
and be prepared for regular updates. By exploring, I mean processing the data and analyzing it. The solution, oh, sorry. The solution was to build a reproducible workflow in R, publish it on GitHub so that others in my team and beyond can access and use it. I'm here to share some of the learnings that we um, gathered to build this workflow to make it easier and hopefully identify some things that you might want to consider when building your own workflow. Um, I should say that this is using publicly available data that doesn't have API. So the first thing is, how do I download all these data sets and how can I be open or how can I be robust for updates? So thanks to code that already exists out there, I follow these sequence of steps to download all my data sets. So first I get the link of the code and then I specify the file path and file name that I want it to be saved us using the here function. And I think Helen mentioned earlier why that's um, useful to have because it adapts to your local storage structure. And then finally, I download that data set based on the link and save it based on the file path using curl download function from the curl library. Following this sequence of step means that if there's new data, I just have to change the link if it's a full time series and my workflow should continue as it is. If it's a new month's data, then I just follow the same sequence of steps to download that new month and then append it to my already existing time series, making it easy to be updated. The next thing is, how do I deal with formatted Excel sheets? I'm sure for anyone who's worked with open data, formatted Excel sheets is sort of a pain. <laughs> so how do, I do load, how do I read this into R without hard coding the range? Hard coding the range isn't really ideal because it means that with every update, I'll have to keep changing it and then it's prone to errors. So instead, I load the data as it is and then I use the slice function from the dplyr package to subset my rows based on specified location. But instead of hard coding again that location, I use the function which, which is from the base R package, um, to find the row that I'm interested in. Interested in. So here I'm asking um, the which to find which row has month in it, and then the slice will then subset my data frame based on that row number until the end of my data frame, giving me the data frame in yellow, which again isn't really that ideal yet, because what I want is for the first row to be my column names, because that's the one that's informative. So then I use the row to names function from the janitor package to do that, and I'm left with the data frame in green, which is the one I need for my plotting and for my analysis. Again, working with various different data sets, there are ways to standardize my workflow to make it easier at later stages of the data manipulation process. One of the things is whenever I load new data in, I always use the clean names function from the janitor package. This turns column names into snake case, which basically means turning it into lowercase and adding, adding an underscore instead of a space, making it easier to index at later stages of the data manipulation process. And then secondly, I filter out observations that are not needed in all my time series. So um, I exclude dates that I just don't need. I do this by negating the in operator to create a not in. Excluding dates at the start is much better than specifying the range that you want to be included, because then again, you'll have to keep updating it and it might be prone to errors. Then finally, how do I deal with dates? Again, working with multiple time series, updates again, it can be a pain. So the thing that I find that's um, useful to do is to have a long format, which is my most granular level. So for example, here it's year, month, and day, and a short format, which is the one above my most granular level. So here it's year and month. Having the long format means I have the accurate date for my calculations and my plotting, but my short format should then ideally be consistent across all my data sets, making it easier to link across them and compare the relationships or analyze them. Then finally, I find that the scale underscore x underscore year month function from the civil package makes it easy for me to set breaks and how my plots is displayed. Um, so here I've asked for a six months break with a date level of year and month. So what did we find? <laughs> As you all know, response times are increasing and this is happening across all categories that ambulance service responds to. So from category one, which is life threatening and critical, to category four, which is less urgent and tends to just require transportation. But we didn't see a change in the overall demand for the ambulance service. So the total volume of incidents hasn't changed much over time. What has changed is the nature of incidents. We're seeing more incidents that are being resolved through the phone, known as here and treat, which is the red area here. 
but majority of the incidents are still being resolved through face-to-face -face response, so all the other colors. Among those that are resolved through face-to-face -face response, we're seeing a higher proportion that are life-threatening, which is category one, and emergency, which is category two, so the red and the blue areas. These are the ones that require the most resources. We also saw an increase in the number of paramedics over time, but this is coupled by increasing staff sickness absence rates. Ambulance staffs are also waiting longer outside of hospitals with patients. How the system is designed means that even a small increase in handover delays leads to a greater increase in response times. So our analysis found that handover delays is the main contributor for increasing response times. So what can be done about it? There isn't one solution, but some things that might help include to improve handover delays, we need to increase hospital bed capacity and improve patient flow through the hospitals. We also, we also need to expand and support the ambulance workforce and look at the workforce that indirectly impacts the ambulance response times, such as social care workforce. And finally, we need to reduce the demand for ambulances by improving access to other services, such as community, community services. You can read more about our analysis um, by following that QR code. The red QR code has our GitHub analysis uh, repository, sorry, and the black one has our um, full analysis. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anne. Really good example of like real world working with the data that is difficult and uncomfortable there. Thanks. Uh, I'll just introduce Paul, our next speaker. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Carroll and I'm a senior data scientist on the digital analytics and research team at NHS England. It's my first time at the conference. Today I'd like to talk to you about structured topic modelling, a project that took place between February and April this year. The work being presented today was mainly carried out by one of our PhD interns, Anna Grace Linton, with myself helping direct and manage Anna, but full credit must go to Anna for the work here within. Her full code and the repo can be viewed at github.com NHSX which will be formerly known as stm-survey-text. Please feel free to clone this resource. All our code is in the open once published, um, and as is the paper and the data are freely available, as it was in this case. So what is structured topic modeling? Structured topic modeling is a form of topic modeling specifically designed with social science research in mind. This quote's from the brick. I think this quote sums up STM perfectly. What makes STM different and why should we use it? Well, STM allows us to incorporate metadata into our model and uncover how different documents may talk to about the same topic using different word choices. The real difference of STM, say with latent Dirichlet allocation, another popular topic modeling tool, is it allows us to explore the importance of metadata and the covariates contained within the data. Metadata here can include the author, the date published, the publication, the location, so numerous categorical or numerical variables about a document. In this way, a topic the topic content becomes non-stationary and not just grouped by one topic using identical or similar words to another. It is an unsupervised text classification technique, but it does incorporate these metadata covariates and topic preference. Another quote, currently the majority of survey analyses are closed-ended questions, and this is a quote from Structured Topic Models for Open-Ended Survey Responses. As you can imagine, the NHS sits on a huge amount of data, both closed-ended and open-ended. If you consider free text in NHS survey data, which often provides context to the responses to closed questions within a survey, this can be invaluable in providing information that could otherwise be missing from the rest of the survey. So the project scope. A request came from CTAS, the Contact Tracing Advisory Service, asking us, could we extract value from their open-ended survey data? Unfortunately, due to IG issues, we were unable to go ahead with this. Um, we couldn't get access to their data within the time frame that we had Anna working with us. So instead, we substituted this data set with the Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Friends and Family Feedback Survey. It's a data set of just over 10,000 responses with the associated metadata. The metadata here contained criticality, organization, and question. There are some other variables that we chose not to include within these experiments. The approach, the STM package in R, we incorporated this alongside other um, NLP libraries such as TidyText and TOLDA Viz. Pre-processing was done that included medical libraries alongside added to stop words. We did use some n-gram analysis as well as sentiment analysis and kind of narrowed this down to the Vaden dictionary for additional insight. We found n-gram analysis did not improve the semantic coherence here in the STM scores, but lemmatization did. 
STM was run on search K, but limited to between five and 65 topics, given the size of the, of the document set. Once we found out what the optimal K was, somewhere between 20, 25, and 30, semantic coherence, exclusivity score, held out log likelihood, and lower bounds were used to determine those number of topics. And I'll show you a slide for those results shortly. The STM Insights package is a dashboard that runs on the back of the STM modeling, and this was used for visualization and the user model feedback. So we're thinking of the user case at the end of this. Could it be an analyst in an NHS trust? And how could we actually build an additional utility to this product? We used the SV Dialogues library in our markdown, and this generated a pop-up box, which I'll show you a little later, prompted the user for a list of terms to search. Additionally, the WordNet library was super useful here, and this allowed, us, this allowed the search to be widened to include synonyms. The outcome from this is a filtered data frame containing these search terms, and that allows all sorts of manipulation to, your, to the user end. Is it slide seven? Slide seven. Uh, these are results from uh, us running Search K. As you can see, the held out log likelihood and residuals both show elbows around the 20, 25, 30 mark. Semantics coherence and lower bound slows grouping or clusterings. And this really helps you get to uh, where you want the topics to be rerun. I think I've jumped forward on one, one slide to do, excuse me. No, I haven't. Visualizations, perfect. This slide shows the results from running the TO LDA viz um, package on model 25. The size of the circles relate to the topic prevalence. The highlighted red circle on, on your left here, that's topic one. And the terms from topic one on the right hand side, you can see the red terms which occur most frequently within that topic, but also they're overlaid on the ter that, that term prevalence within all of the topics in blue. Of interest to me, particularly in this diagram, are topics 24 and 19. You can barely see them towards the bottom left of the screen, but they tend to be what we would interpret through diagrams as being negatively correlated. Are these negatively correlated? Was it to do with the criticality? We'll explore that a little bit later. Running STM Insights package on model 25, this gives the user a huge amount of flexibility. You can see the terms occurring with their probability scores. You can actually turn on far more um, functionality than I've just shown you here on the front page. You can see the STM document number, the row index. It can tell you exactly where the rows and where the feedback is occurring within the document. A second tab within this is something I'm sure you're very familiar with, which is quite useful to the end user, word clouds. But again, I've run this on topic 24 just to see if it was a little bit negative, if there were negative feedback comments coming out. And we are alluding to some other areas of cleanliness, bathroom, is it worth exploring? Is it something that's really negative and we need to look into furthermore? Perspective plots is another function within a dashboard. Again, this allows you to analyze two topics and see how, how correlated they were. Here we have terms such as improved, which occur both in both of them, but is there any polarization between some of the, some of the topic feedback responses and some of the prevalence? The higher the size, of the, the larger the size of the, uh, the words within this is or how frequently they're occurring, their prevalence, but is there any crossover? And again, you can control this on the left, selecting whichever topic you wish and the number of words, and, uh, and also use the text scaling to, to translate this to a non-technical audience. Lastly, going back to something I alluded to before, once you have run your topic modeling and a topic analysis, this text search box could prove really useful, and I'll show you why. Here we've just put in two terms, doctor and nurse, just to see where they're occurring. Do you, the next prompt within this package is, do you want to look for similar terms? So I've selected yes here. Data frame, probably a little small just for the screen here, but this gives you per topic the percentage of each of these words occurring within those topics and tells you which document numbers that they're occurring in. So you can further isolate your analysis and drill down into those. Lastly, going back to topics 19 and 24, there are two functions that really help kind of drill down and take you back to the original data. One is stage labels. This brings up the, for topics 19 and 24 here, it brings up the words that occur with all these, with the four different types of score, the highest probability, the FREX, the lift, and the, and the marginal score. Lastly, if you use um, find thoughts on this package and you run it, you can, I've only selected one response here. You can select any number of them, but I, probably five, 10, 100 if you needed to. Topic 19 on further analysis here doesn't seem to be too negative from this uh, one response. But being able to extract that full feedback response and not just the terms does allow the user additional insight. Topic 24, food, nasty, tasted frozen, lack of taste and sometimes cold. So whilst I'm, I think there's quite a lot of functionality in STM and it's extremely useful, I don't think there's much it can do to help with hospital food. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I'll welcome our next speaker, Martina. Thank you. 
Uh, hi there, I'm Martina Fonseca and I'm a senior analyst in the digital analytics research team like uh, Paul and I'm here to talk about the use of discrete uh, event simulation, SIMR, which we've heard about um, as a decision aid in tackling um, ambulance response times and handover breaches. Um, so as Anne already uh, 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 so nicely, so ambulance performance has deteriorated considerably. So for instance, what we are showing here is the category two emergency calls in England, which should have a median target of 80 minutes. And actually what we currently see is that this is um, actually more than doubled in many of the last few months. So a very important part of this puzzle has to do actually with the handover delays. So that's from the point that the ambulance arrives at the hospital site to the point of clinical handover. This should take no more than 30 minutes, so that's gray. But you can see that last winter there was a number of them that were uh, taking place between 30 and 60 or over 60 minutes. Um, so what is happening? So when a call is made, uh, and this is just considering those that need conveying to the hospital, so you need a certain, um, you need available ambulances in that shift to attend that call, you need available workforce uh, to be able to populate those, but very importantly, you need that instantaneous availability of a certain ambulance to get to that patient. And that depends on the clearance time uh, of that ambulance from the previous job. But as we've said, there's a lot of issues with queuing at the hospital site where they can't hand over. So you start seeing how that starts affecting that response to the patient. Now, much isn't in the direct gift of the ambulance service. We've mentioned before that a lot of this is about patient flow going all the way from A&E occupancy, bed availability, even things of um, discharges into home or social care. But we we're trying to understand within the ambulance setting, what are some of the trade-offs between handover delays, response times, and potentially what are some of the impacts of resourcing models or aspects of the job cycle time of the ambulance or of demand. So um, this is based on an idea from a colleague in NHS England. So we just formulated this as a queue for the response time. So we have a call that is made and connects. So that starts a clock for that response time. You then have calls being queued and you'd have a certain number of ambulances that are on duty and that could potentially be assigned to that call. When it gets assigned, you then uh, have a mobilization and travel to the scene. So that will do the clock stop for the response time, but obviously you still have a certain number of actions with that patient or in that job. So on the scene, travel to a hospital site, handover and clearance. And that is the job cycle time. Now, the longer that is, the lower the instantaneous availability you have and the more the queues might uh, accumulate for calls. And also, if you have less ambulances on duty, that will also affect that. Um, so you might think, for instance, is it better to have more resource helping with reducing that handover time? Um, and it would it be worth doing that, for instance, at the expense of some of the on-duty ambulances instead of having them just wait on the site? Um, so we decided to just do a proof of concept, the screen event simulation to help understand um, how interventions or factors like demand, job cycle time components and vehicle capacity could affect mainly three KPIs, so ambulances queuing at the site, calls being queued and the call response times. Um, so we use our simmer. This was the first time I used this. I was using SimPy for another project. Um, so this is, um, as mentioned, it's uh, uh, one of the main blocks is setting trajectories. So there's an example here uh, and it uses pipes. So the first one is setting the name of the trajectory. Um, you might want to store a clock start, that is the time now in the simulation. Then you might want to seize one ambulance resource. When that is done, you might time out for the time that it might take to mobilize and get to the scene. Again, you might want to store the clock stop and then a series of other events in this, in this snippet at the end where you would release that ambulance resource so that it could help the, the next patient. Um, so yeah, this is just a visual uh, with Bupar um, of the simplified uh, flow just for uh, intuition. 
Um, so yeah, now just as an example, so here we just had an example of how this could be used for some scenario modeling. So we had the baseline case of a trust with uh, 180 calls on average a day with a Poisson distribution, some realistic job cycle time components, mainly constant, but with some log normal for the handover time and a certain number in this case, 23 vehicles. And then we consider a hypothetical intervention where you could redeploy some resource uh, from ambulances onto the site to help with handovers in certain bays. Here we set kind of a ratio of one ambulance to six bays. And then what we have is some dynamic triggers within the simmer simulation that says, well, if there starts to be for a given KPI too many ambulances queuing at the site, let's redeploy some of that resource onto the um, hospital site to help with handover. And then we have the reverse that if that isn't triggered or if those bays are being underutilized or you start having a lot of calls being queued, you actually revert back and put more ambulances on the road. Um, so what does that look like? Um, so the dashed blue line on top is those 23 ambulances and then the different blue traces you see is different replications. So you can see that the ambulances are pretty much all being used with some margin because of instantaneous availability. Um, and then what you see in the traces in red is actually the, the queuing, uh, uh, the number of calls being queued for those ambulances in the baseline scenario. Uh, so this is the intervention. So you might notice, and I'm, apologies for the saturation, that you have two vignettes now because we have two types of resources. We have the ambulance and we have the base. So you can see, for instance, that that trace in blue, now it starts at 23 and then it starts dynamically shifting downwards and it, that is directly related to a shift upwards in these uh, bays. So you see different ones because of the different replications. But a curious thing that you see is, so this is triggered because there's too many ambulances queuing, is that even though you're reducing the number of ambulances, actually their utilization goes down because each one is taking less time to uh, potentially hand over that patient. Yeah, and this is just uh, one of the KPIs. So on the left, it's over the nine days of the simulation for the baseline. So you have on average 10 ambulances always queuing at the site. Whilst in this hypothetical, in the warm up period, it gets to up 10. But when you start allowing this intervention to trigger, it actually brings it down to two, three. Again, more variability because of the different um, um, replications uh, that might trigger at different times. Um, so to summarize in this proof of concept, we just wanted to show that we could use our simmer to answer some of the questions from policy colleagues on some trade-offs that existed in the ambulance setting. Um, and one of the, uh, this continues being a key operational priority. So for instance, there's a lot of opportunities to use event-based data in computer uh, aided dispatch systems from ambulances or ambulance data set, which is quite event log based uh, to for instance, do um, in situ uh, what if modeling of uh, policy interventions or operational um, interventions. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll just welcome our final uh, Lightning Talk speaker for this session. Cara, I'll hand over to you. Oh, thank you. Okay, um, hello everybody. Um, I'm Cara and it's a real privilege to be here. And um, this is my first in-person conference in a very long time and I'm truly humbled by the amount of expertise that's sitting here in this room um, and amazed by all the ways that you're using R to try and improve um, life within the NHS. So well done to all of you. Um, my um, background is from academia and then into the world of post-medical exams and um, <laughs> postgraduate medical exams. And I'm now a freelance data consultant specializing in data viz and what I'd like to call enhanced reproducible outputs. We've seen a few reproducible outputs already this afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit more um, about that. And what drives me really is helping others uh, maximize the impact of their expertise by saving some time, but also by helping you present things in a way that is really intuitive to the end users so that they can use um, all the research that you've done to make the right actions. 
Over the course of the next five, six minutes, we're going to be building a custom ggplot theme um, and applying it to some plots while I give you three reasons why I, th I think you should consider using them um, for your own plots. So here are my three reasons. Add some text to our hierarchy to help orient your readers. Number two, give everything some space to breathe. And number three, effortlessly create aesthetic consistency throughout your data project. That is a lot harder to say than it is to read. And I realized that as I was working through this last night in preparation. So let's add a bit of text hierarchy to help orient the readers. Text hierarchy is one of those things that it's so much easier to, um, to demonstrate than it is to explain. So take a look at this image. Um, what this is illustrating is that the way that you format your text guides the reader as to what's most important, what they need to go to first, and what it doesn't really matter if they skip over. Now, those of us creating data visualizations, we need to harness this so that we're in control of what the main message is and that we are in control of what we don't mind people skipping over. And so we're gonna do a bit of that as we create our plot. When I ran my Level Up Your Plots workshop a couple of weeks ago, I asked participants what their favorite plot is. Mine is the bee swarm plot. Uh, so I'm gonna use a basic bee swarm plot and we're gonna iterate on that. I'm using the Palmer Penguins data set and I'm using the color blinder package for the color palette that we've got here. So here is what I'm gonna call our basic plot. Um, and the first tweak that I think pretty much everybody here has already done is to use theme minimal to get rid of that gray background. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with it, but it just makes it a less obvious ggplot uh, outcome. Um, and the next thing we want to do is create some different text colors so that we can add some of that text hierarchy. Here what I'm doing is I'm starting with a dark text color, which is just the text color that I'm using actually for the rest of my text in my slides. And I'm gonna feed it into a package called Monochroma that I used, that I created to do these kind of gradients of color. And this gives us a palette that's all based on the same um, starting color. From this, we're gonna use the second one here, this column, as our mid text color. Uh, but you can use as many text colors as you want to, so you might wanna use an even lighter one for some light text color for the stuff that it really doesn't matter if people skip over. Don't go too light though, because people won't be able to read it. So just make sure that you're picking sensible colors for that. And then we're gonna go back and apply this to our plot. So this is where we were. Um, this is probably gonna be quite subtle, but I've just made all of the plot by default have that slightly lighter gray color. <coughs> Um, I'm gonna override it in the title so that the title is a bit darker um, and do the same thing for the axis label. So if you keep your eye on the axis labels, you'll see that they go a bit fader, a bit more faded um, when we do this. Next thing I want to do is bring in my own fonts. Fonts can be really fiddly, so I put a link at the bottom of the slide there for all your troubleshooting needs. It's an absolutely brilliant resource that I recommend to everybody. Um, and then I'm gonna change the size and the relative size of the elements within that. So you can do that using um, the relative size command, um, or you can do it setting absolute sizes for which the default, I believe, is points. And um, we'll come back later to why the relative size can be quite a useful thing to have done. But even just in this text hierarchy, text hierarchy step, you can see that we've gone from a plot in which there was all the information that we needed, but it was just a little bit all in your face and you weren't quite sure which bit to start with, to a plot where there's a main story that stands out, some text, and it breathes a little bit better. I think we can make it breathe a little bit more. So let's move on to point number two, give everything some space to breathe. Um, here is our starting point again. Um, and the first thing we're gonna do is just fade those grid lines. We don't need to, them to be quite as dark as they were. We're going to get rid of an unnecessary axis label because we didn't need that one this time around. We're gonna move our legend to reduce unnecessary eye movement. So rather than looking from the side to the plot to the dots, let's just put it all at there, but then let's just move it out of the way a little bit. It doesn't really need to be quite as prominent as it was. Um, then we're gonna change the default line height throughout our text. Again, just giving everything a little bit more space. And finally, we can add up some margins around some of our text elements just to move your title away from the subtitle, the subtitle away from the plot, and so on and so forth. Um, I quite like to remember the word trouble to remember where everything goes in terms of the order when you're putting in these numbers. Uh, you're going top, right, bottom, left, or you can just remember that it goes clockwise from the top. Um, but I find trouble a little bit easier because I'm not very good at left and right. Um, so we've added that. Then we can add a bit of margin around the plot itself. Um, and if you were eagle-eyed earlier when I had the dark background, you'll notice that the text was getting quite close to the edge. So I'm gonna just go and change the size of the base size of the text, move it down from 12 to 11. Um, and this is where you thank your past self for having used relative sizes for all the other elements in the plot. So you don't have to go and change all of those manually. 
And here's where we are. So we've given everything a bit more space to breathe, same plot, same data, same pieces of information, but it just stands out in a way that your readers find it much easier to engage with. The final thing is that aesthetic consistency that we talked about earlier. What we're gonna do is apply that don't repeat yourself principle that we've been talking about throughout today. Instead of just copy pasting this after every plot, we're gonna turn this into a function. So all you do is you wrap it in your curly brackets, make it into a function. You can give it a base size to start with, which means that you can then alter that every time you use it. Um, and then you call it inside the function. We also need to give it a dark text color to start from. I realized that when I was putting these slides together, wondering why it wasn't bringing in the, the text color. And so make sure you put your text color there and then you can create your mid text and your light text within the function. And for those of you wondering, should I use the plus sign or the replace um, function when you're modifying um, theme minimal plus? I use the plus so that I can build on the elements that are inside theme minimal. Um, but if you use replace, it just wipes out the entire element. You can read more about that again at the link at the bottom. And now what we can do is go and apply that to any data set that we want. So here is one using MT cars. I don't understand enough about cars for this data set to be useful for me, but I know a lot of people quite like using it. Here's one with the orange data set. Again, just one line of code and we've made it look exactly like the other ones. Here, we, what we can do is still modify things if we want to. So actually it turns out that the X axis label is quite useful in this plot. So we can go and put that back in. And that's the beauty of using the plus um, operator. Change the sizes. Here's one with the tooth growth plot, where we might want to go and um, format the way that the, the strips are labeled. And this is all in the interest of consistency. So here is a, uh, some examples of some plots for a project I've just finished wrapping up with R for the rest, um, where we used um, the theming of the International Vaccine Access Center, created a theme package for them so that they could apply that to their plots. And you can see the consistency that comes from doing that. Now, you might argue that some of that consistency comes from the colors. Let's just check. Here are the plots that we've created today in which I've made no effort whatsoever to reconcile the colors. And having that theme does give it a little bit more unity. So there we go. We made it to the end. Uh, we've added some text hierarchy. We've given everything some space to breathe. And we've created some consistency throughout the project. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cara. Uh, I'm shamelessly stealing all those tips immediately when I get back to work. Um, so just ask you once again to show your appreciation for our lightning talk speakers uh, it's a tough job lightning talks there's a lot to fit into a very short space of time and everyone's done a fantastic job uh, and now in fact that's our appreciation i said that and i didn't actually let you do it did i so yeah thank you and i'm going to hand over to my colleagues chris craig and mary Oh, sorry, we have not rehearsed this. I've <laughs> never even met Mary until today. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to take up very much time because we're a bit over and I want the Python to talk, people to talk really. I just wanted to quickly say um, that Python is a really, really useful tool and I use it in my toolbox. I've done loads of talks about it in the past. Um, and I also want to say, thanks, Greg, um, that the Python community um, is a very firm friend of the NHSR community and they really share our values. So I think it's really important that we... Um, just acknowledge um, that it's a really useful tool and it's really useful in terms of the, our matching of our culture. And that's what the Python track's all about and that's what this talk's all about. Um, so now I'm gonna shut up. Great, thank you, Chris. So um, I'm Mary Emanuel. I work at ESA, which is Economics and Strategic Analysis. And I'm one of the co-founders of the NHS Python community. Hiya, Craig Shenton. I'm a senior data engineer and the medical director of NHS England, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Python community. Um, the question we get asked all the time is why Python, right? Why should we invest time in learning this language? Why should we invest in something called Python? And we can't do justice to this question right now. We've only got a couple minutes, but we've thought of three great reasons why you might want to learn Python. The first great reason is it's relatively easy to learn. So I think there's a perception that Python and, and programming languages in general are very, very complicated, very, very difficult. And I see it amongst my NHS colleagues that they're very intimidated to actually get started with Python. And this was definitely my experience. I remember when I was a junior analyst in the analytics unit now called Dart, I put off learning Python for such a long time because I didn't think I needed it and it was kind of too complicated. I didn't know where to start. And because Python is such a multi-purpose language, one of the things with Python is knowing what not to learn and actually knowing what to focus on. 
But actually, once I got started with Python um, in a project where I had to learn Python, I found that actually it's not that hard and actually it can be very, very, very fun. And one of the things that makes Python a beginner-friendly language is this idea of readability count. So Python is written in a way that's more like what an English person would speak like, and it's written in a manner that's supposed to be much more accessible. So this image is basically three different languages. You've got Java, you've got C++, and you've got Python. All of these um, different programming languages giving you the same output. But as you can see, the input is very, very different. And it's much easier in Python. And as this quote says, Python is the most, pro Python is the most powerful language you can still read. And another thing I love about Python is that it's got a wonderful set of standard libraries for data science. So you've got pandas and numpy, they'll handle your challenges to do with manipulating data frames and data sets. You've got Seaborn and matplotlib that help you do quite lovely and beautiful visualizations. And you've got like TensorFlow and scikit-learn that can help you do quite advanced machine learning. And this is why I think Python is the programming of language of choice for most sort of uh, machine learning tasks. And once you build up a kind of a core competency of Python in your team, you're able to create something, use like very simple things, but start to create very sort of sophisticated tools. So I remember when we were in the analytics unit, everyone started to build up a small base of Python knowledge. We were able to produce some fantastic, I think very cool projects from geospatial to health inequalities work to time, time series analysis, right? You don't need that much Python to be good at these things. You just need to get started. And the last thing I'll talk through on this is that one of the projects we created was something called Open Health Statistics. Open Health Statistics is the first kind of project to track how many open source repositories there are in the NHS and across the NHS. And as you can see, even in this, Python is a very, very popular programming language amongst the open source NHS community, probably because it's so versatile, so flexible and quite easy to get started with. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, so the other reason why Python is that it's in a very high in-demand skill. Just from a purely personal point of view, it's a skill that you can learn and it will stand you in good stead for your whole career. As you can see, um, outside of web development and some SQL, Python is one of the most used languages. It's also one of the languages that we are uh, people are learning in development. And there's a whole other world outside of the NHS of software development that I think we need to pay attention to. We can't just work in complete isolation. Um, so yes, yeah, so purely from a career point of view, learning Python is a really good step because it is the, the language that is up and coming. Uh, as you can see, R is on the list and it is growing, uh, but it's still relatively a niche in the kind of wider uh, software development uh, world. Um, just to touch on this, a lot of what's been happening over the last kind of 15 years uh, outside of the NHS is that software is essentially taking over the world. A lot of uh, you know, brick and mortar companies are now run by software development companies like Amazon is a software development company, Netflix, no longer blockbusters, you can get it online. I'm sure you can try and pick which the other ones are. Uh, just another example, uh, fracking uh, with shale gas. Shale gas has clearly been around for millions of years. Fracking is a hundred year old technology, but what the thing that unlocked a lot of the value and completely changed uh, the US kind of energy market is software modeling. So that is the tool that unlocks the value in the global economy. Uh, so it's something that we need to really pay attention to because the, I'm not sure the NHS necessarily takes software development quite as seriously as it could do. Uh, and ironically, I think a lot of the reason why you know, you might be you know, crinkling your nose at these kind of companies, but the reason why we're dependent on them is because we don't have our own software developers to do that uh, kind of work. Uh, so the final reason is that we think it will transform the NHS. So my kind of entire thesis is we need to move from an NHS that sees itself as an organization that buys software to an organization that makes software. And Python is the tool that will enable us to do that. Um, over the last 15 years, you know, all of those companies that I've just shown you have created billions of dollars of value in the global economy. Uh, they've done it through developing better and better software, not so much making dashboards and that kind of thing. So this is kind of like the way we want to go. Uh, and that's why we created the Python Community for Healthcare. 
Thank you, Craig. So, as you can see, the NHS Python community was created to support people to learn Python and to just champion open code in a very similar way that the NHSR community is doing. And we realised like it's not enough to understand the Python. Python is useful and to learn it. You kind of need to make sure that people have the right infrastructure, the right support, and there's enough kind of um, support from leadership as well and to enable people to use these technologies in a transformational way. So these are the kind of things we do. We try to make coding accessible for all. Uh, we try to make it as decent unintimidating as possible. We try to celebrate contributions through talks like this. Uh, we actually create products as well. So we have the, uh, this idea of code first and open source by default. We promote collaboration, for example, this conference with NHSR. Uh, we have actual dedicated people who help to support the community as well to make it sustainable. And we contribute to best practice standards for open source in the NHS. And the last thing I would say is for the first time ever, we're going to have a Python track at the NHSR conference. It's going to be tomorrow. It's going to be in the members lounge. You can see the agenda once you go on here. I really, really encourage you to go and just be inspired by the kind of amazing stuff that's going on in the NHS with Python. And yeah, I hope to see you there. Thank you very much for listening. And yeah, welcome any questions you have to. See you guys tomorrow. <laughs>